Welcome to Sammy J's Audiobooks channel. Your go-to plug for all genres of Sammy J novels audio narrations that will keep you yearning for more. Please subscribe and turn on post notification to get alerts on all new audiobooks upload. Owned by the Billionaire A billionaire romance novel by Sammy J, narrated by Olivia Cope and John Harper. Chapter 1 Derek Hovering on the cusp of dream and wakefulness, I drifted on a haze far softer than the goose-down mattress on which I slumbered. I was back with her, the one that got away, Ella Ashmore. Yeah, I'm that guy. The one who got hung up on a chick he knew for a few years in high school. In my case, though, it was prep school. Exeter Preparatory Academy, where I met Ella Ashmore. The tragic, distant beauty with aspirations of being a prima ballerina. My family name is usually enough to make panties drop on command, but not with Ella. She resisted my considerable charms and didn't seem to care about my father. I eventually learned she didn't know because she wasn't one of us, not one of those born into wealth and status. Her father had been of meager means until playing the stock market like a fine instrument earned him a tidy sum, more than enough to put his dear daughter through the finest school. I made a mistake, then. I hid who I was from her. I bribed people in her environment to maintain their silence on who my family were and what they did. The means have a certain reputation, one richly deserved if I'm being honest. Our firm may be called Main Brothers LLC, but it's better known in certain circles by another more sinister title, Mayhem Brothers. Of course, Ella, being a damn smart woman, figured it out on her own. After that, she refused to see me and disappeared after graduation. Now I only see her in my dreams. On this morning, I was engrossed in a particularly fulfilling nighttime reverie, where Ella had returned and we were getting to know one another again. Unfortunately, an insistent knock on my condo's front door stirred me from the pleasant fantasy. I cracked open an eyelid with molasses-like speed, which was like a bolt of lightning compared to how my thoughts moved. It was as if my head were wrapped in cotton, muffling not only sight and sound, but my very thoughts, a consequence of my extracurricular activities the night before. For a moment, I wondered if it was a dream. After all, a warm body lay nestled up beside my own. Yet, as I stared harder, I realized it was not the honey-blonde hair of Ella, but the black and red tresses of some floozy I'd picked up. I didn't remember where I picked her up, let alone her name. If we had sex before passing out in a belladonna-infused haze, I didn't recall that either. Not that it mattered. I struggled to my feet, grabbing my boxers off the floor after several failed attempts. Then I headed out the bedroom door, down the corridor, and into the living space of my penthouse corner condo. The front door featured a security camera, but my vision was too blurry to make out who appeared on the monitor. It was a man and a woman, and by the way the man stood, I recognized him as my cousin Peter. What the hell did he want? Wasn't he busy being the hoity-toity manager of Club Lost? I considered leaving him to stew in the hallway and returning to bed. I was all out of sorts. But he pounded the door again with his knuckle and bellowed, I know you're in there, Derek. Open the hell up. Lucian sent me. He meant my father, but I never referred to him as such unless he was right there in front of me. I always called him by name rather than saying dad, or the more formal, father. Lucian had always been kind of distant. He preferred to sit back and let the scars of learning happen to his children. He taught Peter how to swim by throwing him into the deep end at an early age. He taught me to swim by throwing me in to save Peter when my cousin started to drown. A hard man, but in my opinion, he was a fair one. He never exploited anyone without letting them know that's what he was going to do ahead of time. It might seem like a fine distinction, 
but it mattered on a profound scale. I couldn't blow Peter off, knowing he was there to visit me at Lucien's behest. Sighing, I opened the door and gestured for him to come inside. All right, come on, I growled. Just stop the damn pounding. My head hurts. Jesus Christ, Derek. Peter shielded his gaze with his hand. Put on some clothes. I've got a lady present. I looked down to see that I was naked. I'd picked up the boxers, but not donned them. As I said, I was really out of sorts that morning. Or afternoon, early evening, whatever. For her part, the aforementioned lady didn't seem like a blushing virgin. Her gaze dropped to my package, and she seemed to nod as if to say, not bad. I wanted to tell her I was a grower and not a shower, but I thought it more prudent and healthier to simply don my shorts. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm kind of out of it. No, really? Peter sighed. Have you been hitting the Kremlin swamp gas again? What's it to you? I growled. This is Bell, Peter said, gesturing to his companion. Peter and Bell came inside, their noses wrinkling at the pungent smell. When's the last time you had this place cleaned? Peter exclaimed, disgust filling his tone. How have your neighbors not complained? They did. I bought the other two apartments on this floor and solved that problem. You would. Peter shook his head. What a waste. Not really. I rented them out to friends of mine for twice the going rate with the understanding I'm a noisy, inconsiderate neighbor. But I also don't ask questions. What's up? I can't imagine you're here to talk real estate. Peter chuckled and looked for a clean place to sit on the sofa. Failing, he crossed his arms over his chest and sighed, deciding to stand. Look, Derek, we all like to party, but you can't keep doing this stuff. He picked up a bag of fragrant, oily herbs and shook it in the air in my direction. This shit Ivanovich has been importing isn't just opium. He cuts it with all kinds of weird shit. All I know is it takes the edge off. I rubbed my nose and groaned at the stabbing pain in my head. About the only thing that does anymore. You need to pull your head out of your ass. Peter tossed my stash to Belle. She took it to the kitchen sink and turned it on. What the hell are you doing? I blurted, moving to follow her, but Peter stood in my way. Stop. It's for your own good, Derek, Peter murmured. To my horror, Bell dumped my entire stash and turned on the garbage disposal, grinding it to oblivion. <sighs> Damn it. That was about two grand's worth of the good stuff, man. I shook my head at him. I hope you're happy. Can't you just smoke weed like everyone else? Peter sighed and ran a hand through his hair. Get yourself cleaned up and meet Lucien at the downtown office. I froze, sobering up considerably. If Lucien wanted to meet at his office, it meant one of two things. Either he was very, very upset with me and wanted to utilize the soundproof, wiretap-proof office to vent his fury, or he wanted to see me in an official capacity for firm business. It could also have been both, but I was still hung up on the idea I had done something wrong. Because of course I had. I was supposed to be the golden boy, the one who graduated top of his class and would set the world on fire. Instead, I've moped around, gotten tattoos, and worked my way through all the debutantes in the tri-state area. Lucien probably wanted me to take more responsibility at the firm. That was what I hoped, anyway. All right, I'll go see him right away. I stood and gestured toward the front door. I hope you know the way out. Of course. Peter tipped his head and held his hand out for Bell. I decided I needed a shower and left my cousin, intent on returning to my room and the bathroom it contained. On my way to the shower, I slipped out of my boxers and continued the journey across the apartment naked. Bell giggled and Peter sighed. Don't encourage him, babe. I headed into the bathroom suite and showered using my waterproof razor to shave while I was in there. 
My most recent ink, a tattoo of barbed wire around my shoulder, had healed enough I no longer had to protect it from the water. The steam of the shower helped clear my head, and I felt somewhat better when I exited the stall. I dressed in my business casual best, and then kicked the floozy out of my condo. I didn't trust her enough to leave her to her own devices. Still couldn't remember her name. Lucian insisted I have a dedicated car and driver. Always has. I'm a high-value target to kidnappers and rival businessmen. But my driver's used to me sleeping until the sun goes down. So on this day, I caught him with his pants down, so to speak. He was all the way in Atlantic City playing the slots. Disgustedly, I told him to go to hell and used one of those app things to get a ride to the office. A chatty soccer mom named Dallas treated me to the best way to ensure your pumpkin muffins don't turn out to be too dry on the ride over to the firm. Actually, it wasn't that bad. I preferred her company to that of Peter's smug sense of superiority. I was still pretty steamed at him for destroying my stash. I hadn't been kidding about swamp gas being the only thing that really took the edge off. I could have pretty much anything I wanted, but I was so depressed I needed drugs to cope. From the outside, I guess I must have looked pretty damn pathetic. Scion to the main empire moping around like an angsty teen. Building security was pretty lax when it came to partners in the firm. We got waved around the metal detectors, so I didn't have to shed my 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Lucian insisted me and the Sibs pack heat at all times. Again, we're engaged in a dangerous line of work, and there'd been some... fireworks recently. I rode the elevator to the top floor, growing more anxious with each passing moment. Lucian had a way of boring right into your soul with those cold eyes of his. My being his son wouldn't provide the least protection. In fact, it made me more vulnerable. Still, I tried not to show my fear when I strode into his office. Lucian had his back to me, standing beside his ornate desk and staring out the window at the city stretched out before him. The sun was near its zenith, reflecting brilliance off the towers of steel and glass. His posture seemed stiff, but it was hard to tell. Lucian played his cards close to his chest. Derek, he murmured in a low, melodic voice. Are you well? He didn't bother to turn around, so he didn't see me shrug. Sure, Pops, I'm fine. I lied through my teeth. What can I do for you in the firm? Fine. Lucian spun on his heel and glared at me. I couldn't suppress a shiver. If you were fine, you wouldn't be huffing your lungs full of swamp gas. The Russian Brotherhood has a grudge against us, if you haven't forgotten. You can't trust them. I'll be careful. You'll be dead. From this point on, you're not going to touch that shit. Clear? Clear. I didn't let a trace of petulance enter my voice. When Lucian said something, you obeyed. Simple. Good. Now, I've got a job for you. There's an auction across town later tonight. Big ticket items, exclusive clientele. You get the drift? Yes. Am I to be your bidding proxy? No, of course not. I would never be so gauche as to attend one of those tawdry affairs. No, you're going to show up, have some drinks, make our presence known, and then take our cut from the auctioneer. I can handle that. I agreed. Having angered Lucian, I wanted to redeem myself in his eyes. He had that kind of effect on people, including, or even especially, me. Good. Don't disappoint me. Can I bring a date? Lucian's lips twitched with what may have been the inkling of a smile. I wouldn't. He drawled smugly as if he had knowledge I lacked. I figured the auction house was probably filthy or otherwise filled with undesirables. But I didn't consider saying no. Not for a moment. Chapter 2 Ella
The crimson pattern spattered across the white tiled ceiling of the surgery room might have seemed almost beautiful to someone born with the soul of a poet. Sort of a juxtaposition between the purity of the white canvas and the visceral nature of lifeblood. But one thing was clear to me as I stood tottering upon a metal stepladder, squinting and sweating behind a plastic PPE visor. I was no poet, not by a long shot. To me, the post-surgery gore of the hospital room was just disgusting. But I was being paid $15 an hour to clean it for 32 hours a week, just shy of the 34 mandated as full-time by the State Employment Board. I mean, of course they didn't give me full-time. Wouldn't want to give little Ella Ashmore any benefits like sick leave or vacation, would we? In fact, I was racing the clock. I had to finish the scrub down in time to clock out at precisely 10 a.m. or I'd get in trouble with my payroll officer. Working over the time allotted was strictly forbidden. Bean counters rules. But my supervisor demanded I finish my tasks before going home for the day. So I was damned if I did, and damned if I didn't. A lot of my colleagues responded to this challenge by clocking out and then finishing their work for free. I got the impression this was the solution they wanted us to pursue, but I refused. I got paid, and I deserve to be paid. So I tried to beat them at their own game, even though they'd stacked the deck against me. In the end... I managed to finish the chore with a minute to spare. Unfortunately, I had hoped on that day to finish work a little early. I had to get across town to my other job, waitressing at the Palace Cafe. I could still make it to work on time, but only if I skipped my usual post-shift shower. I stripped out of my scrubs and put on skinny jeans and a tank top before rushing down to the parking lot where my scooter awaited. Traffic was tough, and I wound up being ten minutes late to work at the cafe. But my boss, Harold, was really understanding. Sense the sarcasm? The next time you waltz in here ten minutes late smelling like a nursing home in Calcutta, I'm canning your ass. Harold reamed me out as I ran in the door and thrust my head through the straps of a stained apron with the cafe logo embroidered on the front. I'm sorry, Harry. It won't happen again. Traffic was a real nightmare. You should leave early enough to account for the traffic. This is New York. The fuck you expect? He lowered his bushy caterpillar eyebrows over his pitiless eyes and put his arms akimbo against wide, pudgy hips. Now get your ass out on the floor. The lunch rush will be starting soon and Jenny needs a break. I headed out onto the floor and took over for Jenny. Sorry I'm late, Jenny. I apologized sheepishly. She glared at me and then went off without saying a word. I took a few orders, bust her tables, and ran around like a chicken with its head cut off for a while until I got caught up. Jenny had a bad habit of not keeping up with making fresh coffee, so I got stuck scrubbing out the pots and making new batches. Our ice machine was leaking pretty badly, so I had to mop up the area and set up wet floor signs. Make sure people can see those hazard signs from every entrance, Harold snapped. I know, I know, I murmured. Don't get smart with me, Missy, Harold glowered. I'll can your ass. Walsing in here late and then telling me she knows what she damn sure don't know, I swear... I tried my best to ignore Harold's prattle and then went back to work. If he had paid to fix the ice machine, it wouldn't leak all the time. But of course, that would require Harold to not be a massive cheapskate. Jenny got off her break just as the lunch rush started. Between the two of us, we were hard-pressed to keep up with the influx of customers. Harold flitted between kitchen, floor, and register berating all of us when we failed to move fast enough to please him. Where's your sense of urgency, Ella? Harry snapped. Come on, come on. 
Those tater skins are gonna be cold by the time you get them to the guest. Sorry, Harry. I sidled past him and tried to smile as he glowered. Jenny smirked at me, glad for some reason I was getting yelled at by our boss. Oh, that's right. She was a total bitch. You're slower than molasses today, Ella, Harold complained when I ducked back into the kitchen for a long sip of sweet iced tea. The cool liquid soothed my throat, even if it did little for my nerves. Why is that? I'm sorry, Harry. I'm a little tired is all. I worked at the hospital this morning. It's not my fault you don't do a better job managing your money and have to work two jobs, Harry said. I only care about this one. Three jobs, I corrected. Whatever. You need to act like this job is your priority when you're here. You feel me? Yes, Harry. I shook the ice in my cup to settle it so I might garner another swallow or two. Then I returned to the floor and worked the remainder of the lunch rush. My feet aching, I gratefully cleared the last table of our lunch crowd, glancing over at a man who had entered some time ago and only ordered a coffee. He was well-dressed, not our usual clientele at all. Middle-aged, maybe even elderly, but in very good shape. The diamond pendant necklace he wore spoke to his wealth, as well as the Brunos on his feet. I thought in jest, what, is this guy a spy or something? But I didn't give him too much thought. After all, he was a low-maintenance restaurant guest, and that's rare as rain in the desert. When I had a spare moment, I passed by to freshen up his coffee. He held the cup out for me and offered a warm smile. Busy day? He inquired politely. Yeah, it gets that way sometimes, but what can you do? You're a hard worker, miss. What drives you so hard? Oh, I don't want to give you a sob story. I pasted on a smile. I'm sure dressed like you are, you've heard plenty of those. Maybe I like sob stories, he offered, shaking his head when I offered cream. Please, indulge me. Okay, it's your cup of joe. I sighed and looked out the window at the traffic slowly crawling past. My dad is in bad shape. He, uh, he's in a persistent vegetative state. I wiped tears away from my eyes, not even realizing they'd appeared, and he patted my forearm. That's awful. Yeah, what's really awful are the assisted living expenses. So, I guess that's what drives me. Crippling medical debt. I understand your financial burdens are considerable. The man laid down a business card with a bill folded neatly below it. If you ever get tired of working three jobs and seek a more elegant solution to your financial burdens, please give me a call. Uh, sure. I automatically agreed, just wanting the tip. He got up to leave, and I waited until he sauntered off before unfolding the bill. One hundred dollars. Benjamin Franklin's kisser staring up at me. I swiftly stuffed it into my pocket and went back to work with a lighter step. I didn't give the business card or the man who'd left it a second thought for some time, busying myself with dinner prep work. As the first supper guests began to filter in, I got a phone call on the work line which earned me another tongue lashing from Harold. Is this Ella Ashmore? This is she, I replied. What can I do for you? This is the Shady Pines Assisted Living Center. I'm afraid your bill is in arrears and needs to be settled, or we'll be forced to evict Martin Ashmore from our premises. What? My heart skipped a beat and then settled into a rapid tattoo. Sweat broke out on my body, and it took me several seconds to speak. Impossible. I make sure that bill gets paid every month. According to our records, the account is three months in arrears. Three months? Hold on, I'll have to get back to you. How long do I have to pay? 
48 hours, as mandated by law. Two days? I sputtered. Okay, fine. Just don't kick my dad out, please. Thank you for your attention to this matter, sir or madam. The woman said with stiff formality. Have a nice day. I hung up the phone and doffed my apron. What the fuck are you doing? Harold blurted. I'm sorry, Harry, but I have to leave. There's a family emergency. No dice. Get back to work. Hey! Harold followed me out onto the sidewalk and continued to shout when I got aboard my Vespa. You start that engine, you're fired! And I'm not taking you back this time! I didn't have any choice. I started the scooter and rode away, blinking away bitter tears. When I returned home, my stepsisters were passed out on the sofa, ugly faces slack with alcohol-induced slumber. My stepmother wasn't home, and I called her cell phone several times before she finally answered with an annoyed arrogance. What is so all-fired important that you must interrupt my weekly threading? This is a little more important than your eyebrows, Agatha. Why haven't you paid the nursing home bill in three months? What? She scoffed. Ridiculous. That's been paid, I'm sure of it. It hasn't. They called me at work and said that you haven't paid it in three months. Oh, well, I told Reagan to pay that. She passed off as if it were no big deal. Gave her the money and the account information. She was supposed to be taking care of it. I stared at my taller stepsister and noted her diamond bracelet. A new dye job. And wasn't that a new iPhone? Thanks for nothing, I snapped, ending the call and storming out onto the porch. I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't have the roughly $20,000 it would take to settle the bill. There were no options. Two days were not enough time to beg, borrow, or steal such funds. I'd burned all my rich friend bridges years ago when I broke up with Derek Maine. He was popular, so my friends shunned me after graduation. I had no network and no relatives I could trust other than my father, who was in a coma. I thrust my hand in my pocket for my last cigarette and found the card. The conversation came flooding back to me, and I stared at the tiny rectangle of paper for some time as the sun set. At last, I fished my phone out of my pocket and punched in the number. What harm could there be in finding out what the man had to offer? It's not like I had any other options. I would have done anything to save my father. Anything. Chapter 3 Derek the sun squatted fat, red, and blurry over the New York skyline as I rode from my father's office back to my condo. I stared out the side window the entire trip, seeing the people going about their lives on the sidewalks, in the shops and boutiques, and in other vehicles. Funny how many of them smiled. You'd think I'd have more reason than most to smile, but their happiness only seemed to underscore my own despondency. I remember thinking that, perhaps, my thoughts dwelled on Ellis so often because she represented one of the few times in my life I'd been rejected. The word no wasn't uttered to me very often, which was to be expected considering my father's identity. But what people didn't understand was that having a powerful and influential family opened some doors while it closed others. I got the urge to hit the swamp gas again. Growling in frustration, I tamped the desire down and tried to focus on my task at hand. Lucien wanted me to pick up our cut from an underground high-stakes auction. I wasn't going to disappoint him by getting high instead. Sure, Peter and Bell ran my stash down the garbage disposal, but I could always pick up more from my contact. The car let me off in front of my building. I was so lost in thought... I didn't notice until the driver spoke. 
I tipped him well and ventured inside, absent-mindedly waving my key fob at the control panel to open the way. As I moved toward the elevator, a man fell in step beside me. I turned toward him, arching an eyebrow, as I beheld Jimmy the Bull Castiglione, all five feet two inches of him. His pencil-thin mustache, pudgy build, and tailored pinstripe navy suit belied the fact that he was one of the most violent men on the firm's payroll. But the bull wasn't obvious. He was subtle and skilled at blending into the background or making someone take him less seriously than they should have because he was such a talkative and charming guy. But when the shit hit the fan, he'd bust heads and slit throats with the best of them. Derek, he greeted me politely as we entered the elevator together. Bull, how you been? I asked. Uh, is there a reason for this visit? I just left the office. Sure there's a reason, kid. I'm here to help you out, keep you on the straight and narrow. You feel what I'm saying? I frowned, striking the top floor button with more force than necessary. You mean Lucian thinks I need a babysitter? Ah, oh, come on, kid. Bull shrugged. Don't think of it like that. I'm here to protect you from all threats. Those of the outside persuasion, and the other kind, capiche? You're an important guy. People might want to make things hard for you, but they gotta go through the bull first. I knew better than to argue. Bull was Lucian's creature through and through. If Lucian told him to go staple his tongue to a telephone pole, Bull would ask what size fastening he should use. Fine. You know anything about this auction I'm supposed to attend tonight? Bull shrugged. I got the feeling he told the truth, which, quite frankly, made sense. Low-level muscle like Jimmy didn't get kept in the loop of things above their pay grade. I know there's a car coming for us in a couple hours, but that's it. The elevator reached the top floor, and we stepped out onto the thickly padded, carpeted hallway. Bull whistled at the opulence gaping at a Tiffany chandelier with pink glass catching and reflecting the light in an almost magical way. Nice place, he said. Guess your pappy wouldn't put you up in a Motel 6, though. Right, kid? I guess. I opened the door to my condo, and Bull took a moment to be impressed before the smell hit his wide nostrils. Ah, gross, kid. First thing tomorrow, I'm calling a maid service up here. He headed over to my bong and sniffed the bowl. Tell me you weren't on that Kremlin swamp gas crud. Not anymore, I said. Peter and his new squeeze put the kibosh on my habit. Well, good for them. Just smoke pot like everyone else. Or if you must, real opium and not this crap that the crocodile is trying to foist off on an unsuspecting urban populace. You're well spoken for a thug, bull. I moved to the bar and picked up a half-empty bottle of scotch. Drink? Hell yeah. Bull settled into a chair. What can I say? I like to read. Mostly on the toilet. Too much information, Bull. I poured him two fingers before handing over the glass. We clinked our glasses together. To a nice, boring, and uneventful evening. That's a weird toast, kid. Bull murmured. Yes, but we're going to pick up protection money from an underground auction. Boring is good. Boring is them handing over our cut without a peep. No muss, no fuss. Interesting means there's trouble. Bull arched his eyebrows. Well, in that case, I can drink to that. We drained our glasses. I offered him another, but he turned me down. I drank alone for the second round and then went to prepare for my visit at the auction house. One could roll into such a situation in several ways. One, which Lucy intended to frown on, was showing up in force with a couple of well-known thugs or hitmen, maybe a button man or two, in a show of strength. That could backfire, though, and people tended to take offense at having an entire entourage shuffle into their living room or wherever. The advantage was, if something did in fact go down, we had plenty of backup. The second method, which Lucian liked to the point of overusing it, was to show up with an entirely different type of entourage. 
Showing up ready to party, dressed to the nines, and hanging with supermodels is a sort of display of strength without having to display strength. You're sending a message of self-assured security to the entire room, saying you can afford to goof off a little and not have to worry about someone taking a shot. The third method was the one I decided to use, the understated entrance. Instead of rolling up like big business, I'd hang back and observe coolly. This could make your client, the person paying for the protection, sweat a lot more than the show of strength. You let them wonder, and their imagination did the dirty work for you. Method number four was called hit the mattresses, which had nothing to do with sex, despite the name. Or perhaps it did. You went in guns blazing and fucked shit up. I had only used method four but once, and believe me, it was justified. Since we were going for subtlety, I dressed in a conservative charcoal gray blazer over a pair of ivory silk trousers with no pleats, of course. Straight legs looked better unless you were a high school teacher. The one bit of ostentatiousness I allowed myself that night was my ostrich hide loafers. If you've never worn ostrich, you wouldn't understand. Aren't you going to change? I questioned Bull as I entered the living area. He looked down at himself and frowned. What's wrong with how I'm dressed now? Nothing, if you don't mind being mistaken for an aging swinger who invests in Chuck E. Cheese. Ouch. I'm supposed to blend in like a great white until I'm needed, and then bam, I strike. Yes, you're going to blend all right. I drawled. Because you're staying in the car. Well, Lucian said, I'm not going to huff on swamp gas on the clock, all right? I sighed. Besides, if things go south, you can either come get me out or go for backup. All right, fine, but if you fall off the wagon, just kiss your Uncle Jimmy goodbye. I rolled my eyes. We're not related, and I'm not falling off the wagon. The car wound up being one of those gigantic luxury SUVs, all gunmetal gray with black trim. I chuckled at the way Jimmy struggled to climb in. Our driver was a guy named Vic. Good guy, but not much of a talker, which is fortuitous indeed, considering his chronic halitosis. He did answer me when I asked where we were going, blasting me with a mix of garlic and tuna. The Jolly Roger. The Roger? Really? I shook my head. Didn't old man Hook used to run that joint? Yeah, used to, Bull said cryptically. Relax, kid. I don't think they're going to play hardball. We rolled along in silence. I spent the ride pondering what I would say upon picking up the take. Sometimes there was a coded message, but Lucian hadn't given me one. I settled upon, Hello, I'm Derek Maine from the firm. I understand you have something for me? I rehearsed it in my head several times because I was still foggy from my recent bender and didn't want to screw things up. Like I said, impressing Lucian was always a secondary objective to any task I received. The Jolly Roger was right on the water, a former sailor's dive which kept its old school name when it transitioned to a modern nightclub. Last time I was there, the crowd had been a bit older. You know, jazz, Frank Sinatra, that sort of deal. But tonight, the clientele was significantly younger. We were met at the front door by Starkey a button man who used to work for Hook. Apparently, he came along with the club, reporting to the new management. Gentlemen, he said easily in his lilting voice. Come with me, please. No need for our honored guests to wait in line. Actually, Jimmy will wait in the car, I informed him. But please, lead on. I followed Starkey into the club. The ground floor was all pulsing lights and pounding music. But as we ascended a narrow staircase, the noise subsided into a dull roar. The second floor was a VIP lounge, but we passed that up as well. Finally, we reached the top floor where the auction was to be held. Apparently, I was a little late. I heard someone speaking as I parted the curtain and entered the darkened gallery of seats, forming a half circle around the stage. A familiar voice, as it turned out. Bell, Peter's squeeze, stood up there playing auction master and apparently doing a damn fine job. 
I settled into a seat for a long wait. These auctions were boring as all get out. Usually, the stuff people bid on was taboo or illegal. Like the faded ass broken piece of pottery that sells for one and a half million. Protected artifact that could never be purchased on the legal market? More like a worthless piece of junk. I chuckled when they auctioned off the scream. It had been bouncing around the underworld for a few years, ever since it was stolen from a museum in broad daylight. I think Lucian owned it at one point. It went for seven million, a lot of money for a status symbol that you could only display to a certain subset of humanity. When the last of the items was carried off the stage, I sat up and rubbed my eyes. I'd nearly dozed off during the long auction, but I soon found out my eagerness to leave was premature. Ladies and gentlemen, Belle said, her eyes suddenly intense. The official auction is now ended. However, if it pleases you, we invite you to remain for one final special item. A one-of-a-kind, rare delight, which can only be purchased here and nowhere else. Oh, what is it this time? Asked a man with a handlebar mustache and a check turban. Some broken bit of crap dug up from the bowels of Europe like last time? That was a third-century scythe handle, and no, this item is far more... ripe. I sat up straighter. What was she getting at? How about if I just bring out our next item? Bell gestured toward Starkey, who disappeared behind a curtain, and reappeared a moment later, holding an elegantly gloved hand. Gently, he coaxed the hand's owner out onto stage. The elegance extended to her garment, a body-hugging strapless white dress, which seemed a hair too short in the skirt and revealed an expanse of creamy cleavage. But my eyes did not feast upon those charms. Oh no, because they lingered upon her pained, somewhat frightened face. I knew the face well, one that haunted me in both my dreams and the waking world. Ella Ashmore, the one that got away. Now there, available for purchase. I remember thinking it was a dream, but I had no intention of waking. I only knew one thing for certain. I had to have her. Chapter 4 Ella As soon as I stumbled out onto that stage, teetering on ivory heels, I felt as if I'd made a terrible, terrible mistake. My mind raced back to the phone call with Mr. Starkey. He'd taken me out to dinner at a restaurant whose name I couldn't pronounce, ordering off a menu available only in French. I knew I was being cajoled towards something, probably something unconventional, i.e. illegal. At the time, my thoughts kept dwelling on some form of prostitution. I mean, what else could he have been getting at? I had no education beyond prep school, Few useful skills that could be of use in the higher-paying managerial jobs. I'd hit a glass ceiling some time ago. I could get and hold down low-paying Mick jobs, but was forever denied access to the upper echelons of management. Not that 30000 a year was a godly sum, but compared to the one-third of that I made at two of my jobs combined, it seemed like the promised land itself. So... I knew Starsky wasn't going to offer me a waitressing gig, but I'd showed up anyway, and even dressed myself up a little, like wrapping a present. I'd already decided I would do whatever it took to keep my father from being evicted, because I sure couldn't take care of him myself. He required someone with medical training 24 hours a day. An eviction would be a death sentence for him and it would condemn me to watching him die piece by piece, hour by hour. So yes, I went out to dinner with Mr. Starkey, fully expecting that I might wind up on the menu. And I did, but not the way I expected. How was your souffle? Starkey had asked, spearing a bit of cheesecake with his tiny dessert fork 
and deliberately placing it in his mouth without besmirching one single whisker of his impeccably trimmed beard. It's fine, I said with a heavy sigh. Look, Mr. Starkey, can you just end the torture, please? Torture? Starkey chuckled. My dear, if you object to souffle so much, simply order a different dessert. I'm not talking about the damn dessert, I snapped. He arched an eyebrow, and I held up a hand to forestall any coming recrimination for my outburst. I'm sorry, but wouldn't you be suspicious if you were in my shoes? What's your pitch? Starkey had settled back in his seat like a wolf on its haunches. His gaze locked with my own, and he nodded subtly. I can, in fact, respect your position, Miss Ashmore. Starkey's index finger traced a path through the condensation fogging his glass of ice water. Very well. My pitch is that you will offer companionship to a member of the cultural elite in exchange for a five million dollar slush fund intended solely for your father's medical and living expenses. A slush fund which your stepmother will be unable to touch. Five million? I gaped at him. My hands clutched my water glass, and I drained it in one go out of a desire to slow down my racing mind. For companionship? What kind of companionship? Really, Miss Ashmore, Starkey had said, arching a gray eyebrow. We're both adults here. For this kind of money, what kind of companionship do you imagine? I froze like a rabbit in a trap. Pimping myself out had been something I was prepared to do. To Gentleman Starkey. And only for enough funds to keep my father off the street. Now, however, he was talking about a major life change. We've all seen the Julia Roberts garbage, where the rich, handsome John falls in love with her prostitute character. But I lived in the real world, not a fairy tale. My mind flashed through a number of scenarios, none of them pleasant. What kind of a woman do you think I am? I asked weakly. Five million for my entire life seems a bit lowball. No offense. Whoever said your entire life? Starkey leaned back in his seat and steepled his fingers. Miss Ashmore, I have no intention of pressuring you. The contract is for five years of your service as a live-in companion. You can walk away at any time with an equivalent exchange of funds deducted from the slush fund. But, but what? I blurted a bit loudly for that fancy restaurant. Wincing, I repeated my query at a more acceptably polite volume. What? So long as you adhere to the contract, you will obey your owner in all things. All things without question. Do you understand? What if he tells me to put a gun to my head and pull the trigger? I snapped. You had better hope it is loaded with blanks, Starkey said. I'm not offering a golden ticket or a free ride, Miss Ashmore. I'm only offering a way out of your current predicament, which might be more agreeable than some other options. I hung my head in shame, unable to look him in the eye. I stared at my own lap, wondering how much I'd screwed up in a past life to have ended up in this situation. Miss Ashmore, we really are pressed for time. You must decide now. I'm sorry, but this offer expires in one minute. One minute? I glanced up at him, mouth dropping open in shock. What could I do? Starkey dug into his pocket and extracted a smartphone, one of those fancy ones that cost a couple of grand. He tapped it to life and set it on the table before me. This mobile device contains the account information related to the proposed slush fund. Right now, it's an escrow. But with a single press of your thumbprint, you can claim it and register it in your name. Your father need not worry about his care ever again. And you needn't worry either. He pushed it toward me, 
bulldozing soiled and crumpled napkins out of the way. I remember staring at the screen for a long moment, the thumbprint scanner insistently blinking. Just one press, and my father would be taken care of for the rest of his life. Ten seconds, Miss Ashmore, Starkey had said. Nine. Eight. I pressed my thumb to the scanner, and his face split in a wide grin. Excellent. Be outside your home at eight o'clock sharp. You may bring one bag with you. I'd tidy up your affairs as if you were going on a long trip. Tidy up my affairs, I chuckled. I have no boyfriend. I got fired from my two jobs and I can't stand the sight of my stepfamily. There's no one you want to say goodbye to, Starkey asked. Truly, you may not get another chance to speak to anyone here for some time. I thought for a moment of visiting my father, but dismissed the idea. I didn't want to face him, given what I was doing to pay for his care. No, I just need to ask for a leave of absence at the hospital. A job that pays 15 an hour. I can't afford to give it up. Starkey had grinned for some reason, and I plied him with a few more questions. What about food? Should I pack some groceries? Are there restaurants within walking distance? I mean... I need money to live. Your room and board will be taken care of, I assure you, Starkey had said. As far as where you will be allowed to go, that will not be up to you. Who will it be up to? Your master, of course, Starkey said. Or mistress. Sometimes it goes that way. My eyes widened with shock, and Starkey nodded. Now you finally begin to understand your position, Miss Ashmore. Eight o'clock. Be ready. Be prompt. Now that I was put up on stage, I was about to be auctioned off to the highest bidder while dressed as a debutante slut Barbie. I was having second thoughts. Maybe I should have left that phone sitting there and walked right out of that fancy restaurant. But I didn't and it hit me right at that moment that I was going to have to pay for my decision. The lights were so bright. I really couldn't make out who was in the audience. I heard some gasps of surprise at my presence. Was it because I was that striking in this dress? Or because they weren't expecting a human being to be auctioned off tonight? I was leaning toward the ladder because I hadn't noticed any other 20-somethings with hard luck stories lingering backstage. Come over here, honey the auctioneer said, covering the mic with her gloved hand so she wouldn't be transmitted over the speakers. Don't be afraid. You look ravishing. I feel like a piece of meat at the market, I said standing near her. Well, it is what it is. Just remember that you're worth something, no matter what. You hear me? I nodded, and she patted me on the shoulder before gesturing grandly toward me. Here we have Ella, age 22, certified fertile and disease-free. Bidding starts at one million U.S. dollars. I gaped in humiliated anger at her. How could she say such things about me? To my horror, the auction began with a half-dozen men trying to bid on me at once. The one million was eclipsed by twice that sum in less than five minutes. The clever auctioneer stopped moving up by six figures and began in increments of half a million. When the bids reached ten million, I nearly passed out. Soon it became obvious that all but two men had been outbid. One was an elderly white man in a wheelchair. The other was a rotund Middle Eastern man with a thick accent. The mysterious sheik bid thirteen and a half million, and the old man looked dejectedly away. My heart leaped up in my throat. I really didn't want to serve such a man. Thirteen and a half million, the auctioneer called. Going once? Are there no other bids? No other bids for this beauty? Going twice? And so, fourteen million. The whole room, me included, looked back to see a tall, slender young man cut through the crowd. His dark hair was impeccably styled, 
With devilish eyebrows trimmed to perfection above piercing eyes bluer than a spring sky. Even if I couldn't see his handsome face, I'd know his rich, melodious baritone anywhere. Derek Maine. My ex-boyfriend. The one I left because his family had ties to organized crime. I froze, disbelieving my eyes and ears. It couldn't be him. In my hysteria, I was hallucinating his features over some stranger. Fourteen million, the auctioneer said. Very well. I have fourteen million going once. The sheik went to open his mouth, but Derek spoke again, and I knew I wasn't dreaming. Fifteen million. He cut the sheik off and glared at him with cold eyes. But you just outbid yourself, the auctioneer stated, clearly flustered. I am leaving this place, Derek jabbed his finger at the floor. With that woman. Period. End of story. The sheik went to open his mouth again, and the auctioneer shook her head. The sheik got a pained expression on his face, but then sighed and hung his head in defeat. Very well, the auctioneer said. Fifteen million. Going once, going twice. She looked up at Derek and frowned. Are you sure about this, Derek? Do I look like I'm not sure, Belle? Just because you have peeped by the short and curlies doesn't mean I'm impressed with a skirt. Do your fucking job. Belle sneered at him, but banged her gavel nonetheless. Sold to the snot-nosed punk for fifteen million. Belle looked at me and sighed. You might have been better off with the sheik. As Derek's eyes bore into me, a shiver ran through my body. I feared then and there that Belle was right. Derek didn't save me, so much as capture me for himself. Chapter 5 Derek Ella Ashmore. I wanted to walk up right on that stage and claim her then and there, but there were protocols to follow. Or so I was told as a pair of very polite but also very large and insistent security guards in tailored suits escorted me off the auction floor to one of the VIP lounge suites. Old Man Hook had had a real naval and sailing fetish. The VIP suite was thus decked out with rich blue carpet and lighter blue abstract curving designs, which made it seem like the ocean, I supposed. I was far from an interior decorator. All I knew was that I found the shipwheel theme of the cocktail tables to be a bit on the nose, and the overhead lighting seemed far from adequate. In short, it was a dark and dismal space struggling to be relevant while clinging to an outdated oceanic theme. I helped myself to the top-shelf liquor behind the bar. I mean, I'd just dropped 15 million on one auction item. They could damn sure spot me a drink or two, right? Ella Ashmore. What were the odds she would just happen to be at the same auction I was attending so soon after my conversation with Lucian? Not very good, as in struck by lightning. Twice, on the same day you win the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes and the Mega Millions lottery, while the Tigers clinch the series. Damn near fucking impossible. I smelled a rat. I'd been set up. I was next to certain... It had all fallen too neatly into place. The take on the auction would include a percentage of the 15 million I just chipped in, so it was like having a steep discount. So the take would be a little light, okay, a lot light, when I took it back to Lucian. I bet he wouldn't say a damn word, because that would mean acknowledging it had happened. No, Lucian was going to play it cool. He'd never admit to any involvement in this affair because that was his way. My only question wasn't whether or not this was a setup. Clearly, it was. My only question was how deeply Ella was involved in the deception. Was she a willing partner ready to play me for a stooge? Or was she being blackmailed somehow, working against her will? It was hard to imagine she would be willingly involved considering the circumstances of our breakup. 
The door opened, and my heart skipped a beat. I turned toward the exit, but instead of Ella, I was greeted by Peter's squeeze, the auction master herself, Belle. Oh, it's you. I poured myself another shot of whiskey. Drink? I'm good, thanks. She strolled across the room. I just wanted to inform you that your prize will be here shortly. If you break her, it had better not come back on this house. Oh, please, I said, chuckling. You and I both know you're in on this shit. All I know is Peter said it came down from up above there was going to be an extra special item on the block tonight. I didn't find out it was a person until about ten minutes before you did. I cocked my head to the side. I believed her, though I was willing to bet that her flunky Starkey knew more than he was telling. Fine, I said. It doesn't matter anyway. I understand you have something for me. I do. Bell handed me a printed receipt. This is the amount which has been deposited in the appropriate offshore accounts as directed. Minus a $15 million fee, of course. Of course. I glanced at the slip of paper. $70 million in profit? Damn. No wonder Lucian liked these kinds of affairs. <laughs> you were almost slick hiding your surprise, Bell snickered. Listen, Derek, what I'm about to say next, I'm not saying as an auctioneer or as someone engaged to your cousin. I'm saying it all of my own volition. <sighs> Spit it out. I barked. You want to make sure I don't break the little glass princess. This is serious, Derek, Belle said with a sigh. Please, she's a human being. Try not to forget that. She's my property, I said flatly. Don't forget that. If you weren't comfortable with this arrangement, you shouldn't have played along. Belle's lips became a thin, tight line, and she gave me a stiff nod. Have it your way, Mr. Maine, she murmured stiffly. I'll send her in shortly. Do you give my regards to your father. In matters of firm business, he's my boss, not kin, I said. But I'll pass along your sentiments all the same. Belle arched her eyebrow, her features softening. I suppose it must be hard for you, bearing the burden of your family name. Don't pity me, pixie girl, I snapped. I don't need it or want it. If you must pity someone, save it for little Miss Ashmore. The one that got away, Belle sneered with an icy, mocking tone. If you like, I shrugged as if it didn't matter. She stared at me for a long moment, nose twitching, and then left in a huff. I chuckled to myself and poured another drink. Poor Peter. What a harpy, I thought. I was on my third refill when a knock came at the door. A moment later, it opened, and Ella minced her way inside, her gaze cast at the floor and hands ringing in front of her body. Up close, I could see past the glaze of cosmetics and the changes of time to the young girl I fell in love with. Ella was still undeniably beautiful, with large blue eyes and silken straight hair the color of sunlight filtered through honey. Her elegance and poise were not so much in evidence, given her slumped shoulders and trembling fear. I wondered if I was too late, and she'd been broken already. I set the bottle down, having forgotten I even held it. The resounding chunk of glass on marble echoed in the room, easily drowning out the dull thud of bass shivering the floor beneath our feet. She started a bit at the sound, azure gaze flashing my way for the briefest of moments. I walked over to her with slow, deliberate strides. She did not react as I walked a complete circle around her trembling body, admiring her curves, so evident in the slip of a blue dress which shrouded her form. At last, I came to a halt right before her, my face inches from her own. Blonde bangs tickled my forehead as she kept her head bowed. Look at me, Ella. I was surprised that my voice came out as a dry-throated croak. Still, she obeyed, lifting her gaze to meet my own. 
My breath caught because I'd ached for so long to gaze into those eyes again. How often had I fantasized about this moment? A chance meeting in a cafe, a stage production, or a garden party. But not like this. This should have been better. After all, she was utterly at my mercy. Without knowing why, it wasn't better, and I felt myself growing angry. It's been a long time, Ella, I murmured. Yes, she replied, her tone and manner stiff as a board. I guess you own me now. She cast her gaze to the side and let out a nervous laugh. It was something I recalled her doing when we were young and carefree and in love, a gesture hiding the fact that she really wanted to sob. Ella wanted to cry because the idea of being owned by me was so terrible. Yes, I hissed. I do. You belong to me now, Ella. I grabbed her by the throat and squeezed. Her blood pulsed a fraction of an inch beneath my thumb and fingers, invoking a heady rush of power. Ella was mine. Mine to do with whatever I wanted. It may not have been the romantic reunion I'd hoped for or dreamed of, but it would have to do. I guess you get the last laugh, she replied bitterly, her voice raspy from my grip. I'm not laughing, I countered. Do I look amused? No. She relaxed in my grip, her eyes glistening in the low light. You look angry. Are you going to hurt me, Derek? In response, I loosened my grip a bit, unable to speak. I considered her for a long moment, during which she broke the ensuing silence. I would have thought your first order of business would be to punish me for leaving you. You think you deserve punishment? I tightened my hand again. I drew her lithe body against my own, savoring its familiar yet novel feel. What I think is irrelevant, she gasped. You own me, remember? It's up to you, not me, if I deserve to suffer or not. Don't be stupid, I snapped, shoving her away from me. Ella's eyes narrowed to slits, and she crossed her arms over her chest and glared. Isn't that what you wanted? Why you arranged this stupid auction as an excuse to get back into my life? I had no idea you were going to be here until the second you walked out of that door, I informed her. Bullshit, Ella snapped. No, it's the truth, I said. Look into my eyes, Ella. You know I've never been able to lie to you. For a moment, Ella relaxed, a hint of a smile forming at the familiar curves of her lips. Yeah, it's always been one of your more endearing traits. For a mobster, you sure are a terrible liar. I'm not a mobster, and I don't know anyone who is, I said robotically, as if I'd been conditioned to say the words. Because I had. Oh, please. You see, you're lying, I can tell. You know I can tell, but you do it anyway. This is why I left. Well, you won't be leaving now, will you? I snapped. Do you believe me or not? I believe you didn't know I would be here, sure, Ella replied. But do I believe that you and your firm aren't organized criminals? Nope. Not for a second. Have it your way. I turned away from her my hands clenching into fists. No, have it your way, she taunted me from behind. I belong to you, remember? But you're just standing around hemming and hawing like you did at prep school. Shut up, Ella, I snapped, still not facing her. The great Derek Maine, scion of the Mayhem Brothers, pissing his pants, stuttering out bad 19th century poetry, also he can try and get into my panties. You were pathetic then, and you're pathetic now. Her words stung me deeply, and I curled in on myself, shoulders slumping as she laughed mercilessly. All those years you've carried a torch for me, but you could never have me. Shut up, Ella, I said in a guttural tone. Well, now you've got me, she said, as if I had not spoken at all. 
the only way you possibly could have, buying me when I'm at my lowest, weakest moment, taking advantage of my rotten fortune. But now that you've got me, all you can do is stand there and stare or choke me. You can't do what you really have wanted to do all this time. How do you know what I want? I blurted, moving closer to her. Oh, honey, she said with a mocking grin. I always knew what you wanted. But you never got it, did you? Some other man got my virginity and you missed out. Shut the fuck up, I growled, looming over her. You're too late, Derek. For once, the main family lost to some drunk guy on Padre Island whose face and name I don't even remember. So, go ahead. If you want damaged goods, take what you want from me. The pathos of her confession struck me deeply, taking the strength from my legs and the wind from my lungs. All I could do was stand there in confusion. I didn't know if I should be or was angry with her or not. I only knew I wanted her madly, truly, desperately. I grabbed her around the waist and drew her in tightly to me. She tried to struggle, but I clenched my hand more tightly, my fingers digging into her supple flesh. Hold still, I growled. You belong to me. I have a right to inspect my merchandise. You're a bastard, she snapped. I clamped a hand over her mouth, pressing her soft lips under my palm, and stared her right in the eye. You'll speak when spoken to, understand? You're mine, and I'm going to train you to obey. Now hold still. Thus began my inspection of Ella Ashmore the one that got away, now helpless in the palm of my hand. Chapter 6 Ella Derek moved in close, hemming me in with his body. His presence loomed over me, the stench of his potent, hauntingly familiar cologne stinging my nostrils. I took a reflexive step back, and his stoic face wrinkled into a sneer. Hold still, he snapped, his hand going to my throat again. His palm slipped up and around, caressing my jaw and cheek with a gentleness that surprised me. But then his fingers slid behind my head and knotted my hair into a tight grip. I gasped at the pain in my scalp as he tugged hard on my mane. What are you doing? I blurted, the mark of fear heavy in my words. Derek's steely gaze darted to my face for a moment before it dropped to my chest. Inspecting my property, he growled in a voice barely above a whisper. I shuddered, but otherwise held still as his fingers swept down the curve of my shoulders to the blue satin dress. He gently rolled it down, exposing me by inches. I whimpered at his tight grip and the humiliation of his slow undressing, which he accomplished with both his hands and gaze. The fabric tugged down a bit farther, just enough to make out the pink swollen edges of my nipples. Derek paused, moving his lips in to brush my neck. I arched my head back, my body clasping to him with sudden urgency. My mind couldn't decide how it felt but clearly my body missed Derek terribly. I moved to kiss his lips, but his firm grip on my hair wouldn't allow the change. He growled in my face, biting his lower lip before returning to his earlier task. I shuddered as he ran a finger between my cleavage, then hooked it on the already precariously balanced dress. A moan forced its way out of my throat, as he yanked the dress down and exposed my breasts. Instinctively, my arms moved up to cover my nakedness, but Derek grasped my wrists tightly and then firmly moved my arms back to my sides. If you can't hold still, I'm going to tie you. My eyes closed most of the way, and the soft gasp that escaped my lips had nothing to do with fear. 
Derek gave me one last hard glare before releasing my wrists. His hands moved up with slow, deliberate purpose to cup my breasts. I groaned as he roughly fondled me, moving my pliant breasts about to suit his whims. Derek's fingertips were like iron spikes as they dug into my soft flesh, but I did my best not to move, whether his touches elicited pain or sublime pleasure. You're enjoying this, aren't you? He trapped my hardening nipple between thumb and forefinger. Answer me. He reached up and tugged on my hair a bit harder than before. So I answered him, tears forming at the corners of my eyes from the strain on my scalp. No, I lied. Really? He asked, stretching my nipple out like well-chewed bubblegum. Your mouth says no, but your body tells me a different story. Now that you're my property, you're going to have to learn not to fear your own responses so much. I flinched a bit when he used the words, my property, something which did not go unnoticed by Derek. You don't like hearing that, do you? He taunted. You don't like hearing me say you belong to me. Please don't, I gasped. Don't what? He released my hair and my nipple, taking a step back from my half-dressed form. Don't say things like that. I mumbled, unable to meet his gaze. I stared downward, which forced me to look at my bare breasts and recall the way he had touched me. Why not? He asked softly, moving in and tugging at the half-removed dress. It makes me feel... I gasped as he moved the dress down over the slope of my hips. My navel was then exposed with only a few inches to go before my most taboo place of all would be open to his gaze. Makes you feel what? He taunted. Dirty. I finished in a whisper as he pulled the dress all the way down, dropping to one knee to finish the job of tugging it off. I stepped out of the flexible tube at his behest, my hands turning traitor. I told myself to hold still, but my hands crossed in front of my now-exposed bonds, as if to their own accord. Move your hands, he said firmly. No part of your body is off-limits to me. When I failed to move, he sighed and rose swiftly to his feet. I stood there shivering, though the whole room was not cold. My hands clenched into fists in front of my body. I couldn't do it. I couldn't expose myself to him. I heard his footsteps receding behind me, and then the opening of a drawer. He came up behind me, close enough his warm breath fell on my bare shoulder. I groaned when he reached around my body as if to embrace me, pull me into his warmth, but he took my wrists and insistently pulled. Give me your hands, Ella, he commanded. You were told what the consequences would be. You called the tune. Now pay the piper. Reluctantly, I allowed him to pull my hands away from covering my groin. The fact that he was behind me, unable to see between my legs, probably helped a little. Derek tugged my hands fully behind my back and then crossed my wrists. My heart beat faster when the first silken coil slid around my skin. If you can't keep your hands out of trouble, I have ways of helping you. He said as he tied off the bonds. I tugged in a furtive experiment, but found no give in the fibrous strands. Derek moved back around my front, eliciting a moment of sheer panic when I realized he would now be able to see everything, with me unable to guard my body from his gaze. My body acted to protect itself. I squeezed my thighs together tightly and bent at the waist in an effort to avoid his gaze. Derek took my hair again and roughly pulled me backward in stumbling wild steps until the backs of my knees hit the hard wooden edge of a chair. I plopped down heavily into the seat, staring up at Derek with a mixture of fear and anticipation. Stop fighting me, Ella, he released in a low growl. His hands gripped the tops of my knees and I knew what was coming. 
I turned my head to the side as he forcibly jerked my knees apart, exposing my pussy to him at last. I felt his hot breath blow over my skin as he moved in for a very close inspection. Look at me, Ella, he demanded, voice firm. I turned my head back and then forced my eyes open. I looked down at him crouching before the chair with a half-lidded gaze, hating the way my nether lips throbbed and swelled under his scrutiny. Our eyes met, and then his gaze dropped down to my wide-open snatch. The sight of him nearly overcome by lust as he stared boldly at my exposed body stirred something in me. Something primal and deep. I enjoyed the way he drank in the sight of me and relaxed in my bonds, my throne of degradation. After all, it was out of my hands, quite literally. Nothing that happened now was my fault. I was hoping to finally discover whether the carpet matched the drapes, Derek said with a chuckle. But it looks like hardwood floors in here. My naked skin purpled with shame, but I forced my trembling legs to remain apart. If this was a test, I intended to pass. I look forward to taming you, he said, rising to his feet. He took my chin in his hand, lifting my gaze to meet his. It's time for us to go. Go? I asked as he extracted a cell phone from his pocket. Go where? To my palace, he answered cryptically. Then his eyes grew distant as someone answered on the other end of his call. Hey, Jimmy, I'm going to be caught up here for a minute. Can you run down the block and get us some of those Philly cheesesteaks for a snack? Oh, those are your favorite. I had no idea. He ended the call and then made another immediately, ignoring my requests for an answer. Bring the car around back and take the long way. Yes, we're ditching the bull. I know. I'll take the heat. Okay. See you soon. Who's the bull and why are we ditching him? I asked matter-of-factly, trying to pretend I wasn't naked with my hands tied behind my back at the mercy of the man who just bought me. It was a vengeful, jilted ex to boot. Couldn't have called this one when I graduated prep school. None of your business. He snapped his fingers. Up. With difficulty, I rose from the chair and stood on unsteady legs. Derek took his gray Armani overcoat off the bar and strode over to me, holding the garment out. I arched my brows at him in surprise when he draped it over my bare shoulders, hiding my bound hands. What are you doing? I asked as he tugged the two halves of the coat closed and began to button it shut. The smooth, silky fabric felt good against my bare skin, but I was a little trepidatious about his intentions. You can't walk through the club into the car naked, he said simply. But, but, I said, lifting my bound hands enough that the coat rose up in the back. Just walk slowly, and if you start to lose your balance, lean into me. He slipped an arm around my shoulder and led me out of the VIP lounge and carefully down the stairs. All around us, patrons swirled and danced and drank and laughed, oblivious to my plight. We were halfway across the dance floor before I realized that all of my clothing, not to mention my carry-on bag, were upstairs. I forgot my things, I said. I'll have them brought to us, he answered smoothly. Don't worry about things like that any longer. You only need to worry about how to please me. Is that so, Derek? I asked bitterly as we stepped onto the sidewalk in front of his stretched SUV limousine. His hand snapped up and grabbed my neck tightly. Derek dragged me in close as I struggled to keep my balance with my hands tied behind me. First lesson. Don't call me Derek. Call me Sir. Understand? I glared at him and remained silent. He tightened his grip enough that I could feel my blood labor to pass through the compressed arteries. Understand? He prompted again. Yes, sir. I gasped. Derek released my neck and opened the rear door of the limo. 
get in. He assisted me in keeping my balance as I entered the rear of the limo and slid onto the soft leather seat. Derek came in behind me, closing the door in his wake. The woodland retreat, Vic, Derek said. Very good, sir, the elderly driver said. Derek rolled up the metal privacy barrier, sealing us into our private abode, or tomb. Derek moved to unbutton the jacket, exposing me once again. Where are we going? I asked. What's the woodland retreat? I can't sleep in a tent. I've tried. I told you not to worry. Derek reached into his pocket. He withdrew a red silk handkerchief and folded it over twice the long way. Hold still. My heart beat faster as he used the cloth to blindfold me, tying it snugly behind my head. A few hairs got trapped in the knot and they tugged painfully with every move I made. We drove for some time, and while I couldn't see, it was easy to tell when we passed out of the city and onto the highway by the lack of stopping and going. We cruised along for a while, my anxiety growing worse with each passing moment. I shifted on the seat, tugging weakly at my bonds. The knots weren't cruelly tight. I wasn't even that uncomfortable, but it was a reminder of how much I truly was at Derek's mercy. I bet you've been waiting a long time for this, I said suddenly, when the silence grew unbearable. A long time for what, exactly? He said softly. I shivered, not realizing he was sitting so very close. Goosebumps rose on my exposed skin as his hot breath blew over me. To trust me up like one of the girls in your dirty internet pictures? I finished. He chuckled, the seat buckling under us as he moved. I always suspected you were on to me, he said. Is that why you left? No, I said. What happens between consenting adults doesn't bother me and never did. The fact that your family is the mob was the deal breaker for me. No one I know of or am related to is involved in organized crime, Derek said robotically. Lies, I snapped. Just admit it. Your family are a bunch of scary bastards. His hand clamped over my lips, sealing them shut. He put his mouth next to my ear and whispered fiercely. Second lesson, never ever say anything to the effect of what you just did. Not ever. For your own good. Please, Ella. Don't. His voice had shifted from stern to pleading in a heartbeat. For the first time since our reunion, I realized how deeply his feelings for me really went. He wasn't afraid for his own well-being. He was afraid for mine. He released my mouth and I licked my suddenly dry lips. Understand? He prompted softly. Yes, sir. I said. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. He relaxed, leaning back in the seat. The sheer enormity of what I'd done. The decision I'd made for my life settled upon my shoulders like a ton of bricks. I was tied to this family of mobsters now. Figuratively and literally. Tears rolled out from under my blindfold, and soft sobs shook my body. It's all right, Ella, Derek said in a low, soothing voice. He put his arm around my shoulders and pulled my unresisting form over against him. His hand stroked my hair, and I leaned my face against his chest like old times. Except I was weeping into his chest and not sighing. The limo continued on, a grand coach taking me to the palace. And my fate. Chapter 7 Derek Gravel ground and rolled beneath the limo's thick rubber tires as we turned off the highway onto the private drive leading to my woodland retreat. While it wasn't my exclusive property, but a safe house open to any in the firm who might need one, I'd been the only one to use it for years. There were perks to being the favorite son, however much I might resent Lucian at times. 
Ella sensed we'd passed off of a paved road onto a more rustic one and lifted her blindfolded head in a vain attempt to gaze about. She sniffled, a legacy of her recent crying fit. I can't wipe my nose, she said in a rough voice, sniffling again. I took her by the back of the neck and firmly pushed her forward in the seat, exposing her bound arms. My fingers picked at the knots until she was loose. I pressed a handkerchief into her open palm. Ella wiped her nose and then blew wetly into the hanky. She seemed unsure of what to do with it and wadded it up into a ball and kept it on her lap. Ella made no move to take off her blindfold, which proved she was capable of being obedient. The limo rolled on, passing beneath the boughs of trees arching gracefully across the one-lane gravel road. Thick weeds clumped up between the twin trails of crushed rock, brushing the bottom of the limo's undercarriage with a sound far more ominous than it had any right to be. At length, what Lucian laughingly referred to as a cottage appeared at the end of the gravel road. I've never seen a cottage with four separate stories before or one where the living room had three walls made of thick, tempered glass. Privacy was hardly a concern with its remote location. The lights were off because we didn't bother staffing an empty cottage. We rolled up just as the golden sun began to kiss the horizon. I reached and untied the blindfold from Ella's head. She blinked in the bright but fading sunlight, staring around until her gaze settled on the cottage. Her mouth gaped open as I put the overcoat around her bare shoulders. I can see why you call it a palace, she said in a low murmur. You can have pretty much anything you want. Can't you, Derek? I mean, sir... She pronounced the final word in a mocking way, her sneer making her contempt even more overt. I glanced at her while fighting a smile twitching at the corners of my mouth. Not anything. I referred to when she dumped me in prep school. Yes, anything, she sneered bitterly, drawing the coat around her naked body. You have me now? Yes, I do. We exited the limo and made for the front door. Ella arched an eyebrow as I strained to lift a heavy plywood panel with screws driven into it, sharp sides up. Shouldn't she put some dead leaves or something over that spike trap? She asked sullenly. It's not a spike trap, it's a caltrop board to prevent bears from forcing their way in the front door. Once the board was out of our path, I unlocked the door and punched in the security code. Ella stared inside the darkened interior, unmoving, until I reached up and grabbed her hair near the root. Get inside, I commanded, forcing her to walk ahead of me. Ella grimaced from the pain of her pulled hair, but offered no other protest. I'll give you the grand tour later, but... I pointed about as I ticked off the adjacent rooms. Living room, den, half bath, jacuzzi, kitchen, I said. Bedroom and full bath are upstairs. Sun deck at the very top. You're not taking me to the bedroom first? Ella's expression was mocking, but her tone seemed... Uh, disappointed? It was hard to tell. No, I replied. The limo crunched over gravel as it pulled away. Ella turned her gaze toward it anxiously, as if watching her one avenue of escape vanish. There's somewhere else you need to visit first. I glanced at her coat-clad form and gestured dismissively at it. Get out of that coat. Clothing is not permitted unless I deem it necessary. I would have thought you'd seen everything back at the Roger. She unbuttoned the coat while icy venom dripped from her words. You thought wrong. I boldly stared at every inch of her curvaceous, lovely form. She held her arms at her sides clenching into fists as she fought the urge to hide herself from my gaze. I took hold of her hair again and dragged her against me. She grunted like a pig when I shoved my crotch with an ever-expanding bump into her naked form. Let's go. I walked her like that down a set of curving, elegant stairs. We reached an ornate door at the bottom, carved with a demonic face and with the words, 
Abandon all hope, all ye who enter here. Is this supposed to scare me? She blurted through clenched teeth, one hand grabbing my own in an attempt to keep tension off her scalp. No, I answered simply. This is. I pushed the door open with a resounding creak and flipped the lights on. Ella's eyes went wide and her body trembled against my own. The walls were done in red velvet, not a window in sight. A tilted rack with accompanying restraints sat near the far wall, which itself contained a multitude of implements for both pain and pleasure. Ella's gaze traveled around the room before settling on my face. If she was scared, she showed little sign. It's hardly a surprise, she said. I saw your browser history. Remember? You're not the least bit afraid. No, she said. I'm a little bored standing here while you pull my hair like an eighth grade delinquent. I belong to you, remember? Are you going to do something with that or what? Her taunt seemed born of more than mere mockery this time. My gaze narrowed as I regarded her, naked but defiant, in my grasp yet completely out of my control in so many ways. I shoved her into the room, pushing her until she stood before the rack. Roughly, I forced her to lie on it. Her naked body shivered, but she made no move to escape. In fact, she stretched her arms out over her head and stared at me pointedly, waiting to be restrained. The leather cuffs creaked as I tightened them around her wrists and shoved a metal pin through the stretched hole. I did the same to her legs, spreading them widely apart. I'm going to teach you the rules. I said, lifting a black, soft-bladed five-tail flogger from its hook on the wall. After I explain a rule, I'm going to strike you with the whip, and you're going to say, Yes, sir. I understand, sir. Ella pouted as she examined the whip in my hands. Muscles played on her exposed and stretched limbs as she tugged in futility at her bonds. I sent the whip darting out, catching her across the belly just above the navel, I didn't lean into it. It probably hardly even hurt at all. But the sound of the impact made her cry out. What are you supposed to say? I demanded. Yes, sir. I understand, sir. She sneered. A little less attitude next time, I said, unable to stifle a grin. Unless you want to make things hard for yourself. Now... First rule, from sunrise to midnight every day, you belong to me. I snapped the flogger out, catching her on a pink nipple. Ella's mouth flew open, a shocked gasp forcing its way out of her throat. Her skin reddened under the impact of the lash, but her voice was steady when she spoke. Yes, sir. I understand, sir. That time her tone was a great deal more respectful, though there was still some underlying resentment. Good. After the clock strikes midnight, you're free to do as you please so long as you don't leave the house. Next rule. At times, I'm going to hurt you. Ella glanced at me sharply, chest heaving with her heavy pants. Was that light in her eyes fear or eager anticipation? I didn't know, but I was on a roll. I'm going to hurt you because I like it, I said in a low growl. If the pain ever gets to be too much, you're going to say glass slipper. Her eyes narrowed to slits, hands clenching into fists as she strained against the leather cuffs. Glass slipper? Really? It seemed appropriate given your Cinderella status. Ha ha, she glared managing to look fierce even while naked and strapped to a table. I've worked two, three, sometimes four jobs since graduation. I've watched my father degenerate from a proud, strong man to a near-mindless husk of his former self. I'm not fragile. Your safe word is glass slipper. I continued as if she had not spoken. The whip lashed out, popping against the opposite nipple. Ella squealed, but quickly tamped down on it, remembering she was trying to act tough. 
I arched my brows at her silence and raised the whip again before she blurted, Yes, sir. I understand, sir. Good. Now, if you got something in your mouth... I noticed her gaze drop to my crotch, which I found most pleasing. Grunt three times in succession. Yes, sir. I understand, sir, Ella said. She shivered as I laid the whip across her sweating belly and placed my palm on top of her thigh. Her warmth was intoxicating, but not so much as her scent. I stared pointedly between her legs, which brought a blush to her cheeks. It looks like you're enjoying what's happening to you, I said. You're dripping wet and wide open for me. Ella turned her gaze to the side, face darkening ever more with shame. Her face whipped around toward me as I crawled onto the rack between her legs. What are you doing? She gasped in a whisper. Anything I want, I replied, my hands gliding over her toned thighs. I lowered my face to her groin, inhaling deeply of the musky wetness I found there. Her labia were so swollen, they parted slightly, revealing the quivering pink nub of her clitoris. A line of glistening moisture oozed out onto the wooden planks, stirring my desire even more. I'm frigid, she said as I pressed my nose into the warmth of her body. I can't orgasm. Don't be mad. Please. I didn't respond other than to extend my tongue out and lick a circle around her clitoral hood. Ella groaned, her body shivering like a captured mouse as I continued my ministrations. Tilting my head to the side, I encompassed her swollen nether lips with my mouth, suckling gently at first and then more firmly as she moaned and panted. You don't seem frigid. I murmured into her inner thigh before returning to my meal. I inserted my tongue into her pungent hole, dragging my upper lip over her clitoris hood and all. While massaging her hot button with my mouth, I probed and lashed with my tongue, bringing my fingers into play as well. Oh, God. Ella groaned. I lifted my head from her snatch, face glistening with her juices. Ella glared down at me through half-lidded, furious eyes. Don't stop. You can't stop now. Grinning, I dove back in, burying my mouth between her sweet, soft folds. Ella thrashed as much as her restraints would allow, her jaw falling open to let out a piercing scream, which echoed in the chamber and rang in my ears for several seconds afterward. Her body trembled as I pulled my face out of her crotch once more. I was painfully erect, my cock straining at my trousers so hard I feared the skin would rub right off my crown. Ella's eyes fluttered open as I picked the whip up off her naked belly. Next rule, I said. No coming without permission. I sent the lash across her breasts, and she hissed through clenched teeth. Ella lifted her gaze to me, eyes filled with intensity. Yes, sir, she said between pants. I understand, sir. Not yet, I said, unzipping my fly. But you will soon enough. Chapter 8 Ella Derek's nails raked across my sweat-glazed skin, tracing a path from my belly toward my face. His big hand, gnarled with muscle and large veins, moved to cut my breast roughly. I felt the strength of that hand, compressing my body to his whims. My sweating form still trembled with my recent climax, the last I would be allowed without permission, it would seem. I hadn't been lying when I told Derek his proclivities had not driven me from his side, but his family's criminal enterprise had. The mains hid in plain sight, ostensibly a premier criminal law firm, but everyone knew what lay beneath the surface. After I'd discovered the true source of Derek's money, I had been utterly repelled. In the years since, 
I'd occasionally heard someone mention the mains, always in hushed tones. The consensus was that they acted like aggressive bacteria in the colon, destroying things even worse than themselves. At the time, I didn't know what to believe, other than that the mains, all of them, Derek included, were dangerous. And here I was, owned by one of those dangerous men. The scion of the family, the youngest, most favored son, Derek Main. I could have been his princess once, if only I'd turned a blind eye to his ill-gotten gains. Instead, I'd become his slave. Oddly, what I felt most that fateful day, strapped naked to a rack in a sex dungeon, was relief. I couldn't bring myself to accept his dubious family background, no matter how much I wanted to. No matter how much I wanted him. But now... That choice had been taken from me. I was free to do things that Ella Ashmore had never permitted. And more importantly, I was free to feel things for Derek as well. On some ignorant schoolgirl level, I'd always fantasized about Derek sweeping back into my life after our breakup. Not when you would expect, like when I was mucking out a toilet or cleaning up after a surgery. Then, I'd stubbornly shoved any thoughts of the leisure I would enjoy as Mrs. Derek Maine out of my mind, proud in my fetid labors. No, the fantasies came when I was at my weakest, right before bedtime when I knew I only had five hours to rest before my next shift. Then I thought of waking up on satin sheets next to Derek's lithely, muscled form. You're not scared, Derek stated plainly. It wasn't an accusation, or a resentment-filled invective. It was simply a statement of fact. I couldn't tell if he was disappointed or not. Should I be? The question hung in the air as he reached up to remove my wrist restraints. I remained in place, unmoving as he freed my ankles as well. After all, he hadn't told me to move. On your feet, he snapped. I rose off the table onto legs still weak and watery from my recent explosive climax. The giddy warmth running through me lent the entire scene a dreamlike quality. We're going to teach you a lesson about self-control. My self-control is impeccable, I countered immediately. Derek's hand darted out like a striking snake and encircled my throat. He squeezed a bit tighter and arched an eyebrow. My self-control is impeccable, sir, I rasped. He released me, and I resisted the urge to reach up and clutch at my throat. Derek moved over to the wall of goodies. I had to stifle a laugh at my self-applied nickname for his rack of sex toys, restraints, and floggers, and took a black velvet box off of a small shelf perfectly custom-sized to hold the container. Derek brought the box back to me, and my curiosity was piqued. With all of those various goodies on the wall, so many of them frightening and baroque, why select a nondescript box? He flipped open the box for my inspection. Part of me laughingly thought it might be an engagement ring. This entire auction and slavery affair all part of an elaborate proposal charade but I was surprised to find a chrome oval device reflecting my own distorted image back at me. Derek dragged a three-legged, leather-padded stool over and sat down, dropping his level so his eyes were about even with my navel. He extended a curled finger and then jabbed at the floor before him curtly. I knew what he wanted, but I paused for the briefest of moments due to a flash of pride. How dare he order me around like a dog? But I recovered quickly. I was supposed to be proving to him that I was no fragile porcelain doll, not acting petulant. Maybe my motivations were to show him I was okay with all of it, all of his interests and eccentricities, but I didn't think so. I was no reluctant innocent coaxed into doing something against her will. I was Alice plunging headlong into the rabbit hole without a second thought. 
I came and stood before him, licking my lips nervously as I recalled his face buried between my thighs. I'd never had a man go down on me before, though they'd all expected me to do so for them. Derek did it without hesitation, as if overcome and consumed by his lusty desire. It was quite a heady feeling, when a man locked gazes with you while his mouth was busy with your lady parts. Derek reached down, and I felt his fingers encircle my ankle. He drew it up and up, my arms pinwheeling to keep my balance. He threw my knee over his shoulder, stabilizing my stance, but also forcing me to expose myself lewdly, completely, to his gaze. He lifted the chrome egg out of its box, and I discovered it had a black wire emanating from the bottom. After about six inches of length, the wire terminated in a loop. A sleek chrome remote control lay under the egg in a recess. Derek left that where it lay and gripped the chrome egg in his tapered fingers. I knew where it was going, my cheeks burning with a red flush. Derek glanced up at my face, and I saw a bold eagerness burning within his gaze. He's wanted to do these things to me for a long time, I thought in a sudden realization. Now he was like a kid on Christmas morning, unsure of which present to unwrap first. His hand trembled slightly as he moved the egg inexorably closer. My mouth flew open in a gasp as he slid the metal egg deep within the quivering walls of my pussy. He left a few inches of the loop exposed and then withdrew his fingers from inside me. While locking gazes with me again, he thrust the glistening fingers in his mouth and sucked wetly. Your pussy tastes so good, Ella. He growled. Derek set my foot back on the floor and reached into the box for the remote. He depressed a button with a click, setting a blue light pulsing on the chrome console. Looking me dead in the eye, he hit another button, and the device inside of me rumbled to vigorous, surprisingly powerful life. I gasped bending at the waist and teetering on unsteady legs as he turned the intensity up several notches. It was bad, but when he switched it to a series of heavy pulses, followed by one long, slow throb, I collapsed to my knees. Remembering I wasn't supposed to come, I squeezed my eyes shut and groaned. Is it on? Derek asked teasingly. Here's your task. Endure the vibe while you service me. I'd regained some measure of self-control at that point and was able to lift my gaze to meet his. Derek spread his arms out and sneered down at me. Undress me. I struggled to my feet, the vibe shifting inside of me. When I was just barely stable, Derek flipped the intensity up with a notch and my teeth clamped down on a groan. I unbuttoned his black silk shirt with trembling fingers, enticed by his nearness and scent to leap right off the edge of climax. But I wanted to prove myself to him, and I stubbornly denied my body the release it so desperately craved. What it was being encouraged toward by Derek's manner and device. I got his shirt fully unbuttoned, revealing the smooth knots of muscle on his belly and the firm, sculpted perfection of his chest. A dragon tattoo snaked along his corded arm, over his shoulder, and onto his upper chest. I couldn't resist placing my fingers on the design and marveling at its artistry as much as the sublime softness of Derek's skin. It had been so long since I'd touched him. Derek's hand closed around my wrist, a grin flickering across his face. Did I say you could touch me like that? N no sir I gasped. Continue with your duty. He ordered, and I went back to removing his shirt. I tugged it off of his arms and then carefully folded it over the back of the seat. I moved up to unbuckle his pants, and Derek shook his head. On your knees first. I froze for a moment 
a smart mouth comment on the tip of my tongue. But I let it pass. Petulantly, I sank to my knees, grimacing as the vibe pressed into different regions. Then I went to work on his belt, pulling it free. I rolled his trousers down over the arched, rippling contours of his thighs, down to his ankles, and he stepped out. I looked back up to find his erect member practically touching my nose. Instead of starting as he'd possibly intended, I reached up with my hand and gripped his shaft firmly. Derek's stony composure melted almost instantly, his eyes squeezing shut at the same time as my fingers wrapped around his length. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I not supposed to touch you yet? I teased sweetly. Derek's eyes snapped open, and he glared down at me while struggling to maintain his ire in the face of my ministrations. There we were, each trying not to climax while being stimulated by the other. I wondered if he recognized the inherent dichotomy of our position. Yes, I was on my knees, naked and subservient. And yet I held the most delicate portion of his anatomy in my hands, and he was utterly at my mercy. Derek had always been a closed-off young man when we dated, and it was impossible to be truly close to him. But in that moment, I was as close to him as someone could possibly conceive, privy to his secret, the most desperately held desires. In a way, he was as much my captive as I was his. Your smart mouth needs something to occupy it, Derek said roughly. His hands went to the back of my head, pushing insistently. I opened my mouth and accepted his warm, throbbing cock. Derek took control, forcing me to accept his full length, and I struggled not to resist, gagging and choking as his dick nudged my throat. He finally allowed me to come off of him, a line of stringy seed dribbling off my lips and spattering on the floor. I gasped in heavy pants, and Derek let me recover a bit before pushing me back onto him. Gradually, Derek stopped guiding my motions, letting me control the rhythm. I surprised him, not to mention myself, by taking more of him in my own volition than by his control. Suddenly, I was seized by lust, desperately giving in to my wanton side and making embarrassing loud moans with abandon. Derek teetered on his feet, head flying back as I pumped furiously on his member. He pushed a button in his throes of passion, which set the vibe into its most intense throbbing yet. I screamed out my orgasm around his cock as he released into my mouth. Derek stumbled back, his member slipping out of my lips as he collapsed onto the stool. He sat there panting, an almost frightened expression on his face. Sorry, sir, I said sweetly between pants, not bothering to wipe the excess of his climax off my smiling face. I came without your permission again. Are you going to punish me? With a growl, Derek came off that stool like a bolt of lightning. He bowled me over, pinning me beneath his body and shoved my thighs apart. Derek removed the vibrating egg with a quick jerk on the attached loop, clearing the way for something bigger. He manhandled his erect cock against my wide-open, eager pussy. I cried out as he thrust himself in deeply, until his hand slapped over my mouth and cut it off into a whimper. Derek pounded me, slapping his pelvis into mine with a rapid tattoo that mingled with his grunts and animalistic groans. His eyes were intense as they bored into mine, and I could see he had finally, completely, given in to his lust for me. At the moment, I exulted in being used to satisfy this suddenly savage beast. I lost track of how many times I came. It wasn't like I could ask permission with his hand over my mouth. And maybe that was the point. But at length, Derek collapsed on top of me, 
panting and sighing as our sweat mingled and cooled. We lay there, his cock slowly growing flaccid inside of me, and I reached up to stroke his sweat-damped hair. My old life felt a million miles away, and I feared I might be dreaming again. If so, I hoped to never wake up. Chapter 9 Derek For a long time, I lay across Ella, our sweat mingling as it cooled. Her heartbeat thumped against my chest until it dwindled into so slow a rhythm I could no longer feel it. I lifted my head, rearing up on my arms to look down upon her. Ella's eyes remained closed, her lips slightly parted as she puddled on the floor. She seemed to notice my scrutiny, her eyes opening to meet my gaze. We stared at each other for who knows how long. Nothing was said. Neither of us had regained the ability to speak, and yet volumes were communicated with a gaze. Ella's blue eyes held no trace of fear or shame at her debasement. They were clear and filled with... What? Contentment? Boredom? It had been so long since I'd been close to her. So very long. I'd forgotten much, and what I did remember had been entangled in the webs of fantasy. Eventually, I couldn't take that stoic azure gaze for another moment. Leaping up off of her, I quickly moved to dress, turning my back on Ella. Did I do something wrong? Her voice held a note of disquiet, as well as inquiry. Yes, I murmured, and then added, it was a long time ago, though. Ella sat up on the floor and gathered her knees up to her chin. She looked at me over their rounded humps as I finished tugging on my shirt. The sweat made it a bit tricky, and the fabric kept rolling. Do you need help? She inquired. I glared down at her. I can manage. And you will address me as sir. Yes, sir, she said, arching her eyebrows. Are you putting your clothes back on so I can take them off again, sir? Because that was fun the last time. I can manage. I growled again, shoving the stubborn silk over my gleaming arm. Get dressed. We're going to eat. Get dressed? Ella laughed a musical sound that stirred memories of a much happier, simpler time in my life. How am I supposed to do that, sir? You left the only clothes I had back at the Jolly Roger. I started, having forgotten the circumstances of her being here. It was as if I had entered a new world whose origin lay in the moment I took her into my playroom. I glanced about and found a black silk lady's bathrobe with a dragon embroidered on the back. I couldn't recall where it came from. I was pretty sure I accidentally stole it from a hotel in Beijing. At any rate, I handed the robe to her and she stood to dress, her breasts swaying with the motion and distracting my gaze. Ella knew I was looking at her. Her eyes fairly screamed, but she played it coy, folding the robe about herself and tying it closed. The robe terminated about four inches beneath her waist, which meant every step would make her indecent. Next lesson, I said firmly. Ella glanced up at me, standing a bit straighter as if at attention. When we move around the house, you will walk three steps behind me, hands clasped behind your back, eyes on my waist. Yes, sir, she said, putting an arrogant, mocking emphasis on the honorific. Again. I glared at her, and then slapped the leather-topped stool with my palm with a loud pop. Get your hands on here, I snapped. Ella looked a bit confused, but did as she was bade, bending at the waist and placing her hands on the stool. The robe rode up, exposing her backside, which was perfect for my purposes. I could have grabbed one of the many floggers from off the wall, but I was incensed enough to reach for something much closer. My belt. I whipped it off in a flash and doubled it over in my hand. From now on, 
When you call me sir, it will be in a humble and obedient tone, I said roughly. Then I brought the doubled over belt across her left cheek with a resounding smack that set her flesh dancing. Ella cried out, flinching under the lash, but not breaking position. Is that clear? Yes, sir, she said in a little girl voice, her hips rocking as if of their own accord. She looked over her shoulder at me, biting her lower lip. I had to resist the urge to unzip my fly and take her again right there. But she would not escape her discipline so easily. Now I'm going to strike you ten times for your insolence, I said. After each time, you're going to thank me. Understood? Yes, sir, Ella said quickly, adopting a more neutral facial expression. I brought the belt down across her right cheek for the second time, and she yelped at the impact. My nails raked across her reddening flesh as she thanked me. Thank you, sir. Good, I said, adding a slightly less impactful smack on her left cheek. Thank you, sir, she said in a throaty voice. Her hips rocked almost non-stop now, and rather than ceasing when I struck her with my belt, they only seemed to increase their gyrations. By the time I finished giving her all ten lashes, Ella was a quivering, eager lump of female flesh, and I was hard as a rock. I could have, and should have, given in to what we both wanted then and there, but I was still annoyed with her. For some reason, I felt as if she was not taking me seriously, and it grated my nerves. Get up, I snapped. Ella stood up and adopted a precise posture, not bothering to tug her robe down the inch it would have taken to make herself decent. Follow me. I sped out of the room with her hastily catching up to my longer stride. We moved through the hallway toward the stairs leading up to the main room, her bare feet slapping on the floor. I imagined her shapely legs thrust out from the bottom of the robe and soon found myself regretting my decision to make her walk behind me. Stop, I said, holding up a palm. I have changed my mind. You will precede me up the stairs. Ella's brow arched and a ghost of a grin played at her lips. Yes, sir, she said meekly, preceding me up the stairs. Meekly, yes, but there's no way she needed to put that much shake in her hips with each careful step. I was treated to a vu of her most taboo skin, the robe no impediment whatsoever to my vision. She paused at the top of the steps, her eyes filled with query. I pointed to the left. Into the kitchen. Yes, sir, Ella replied. I followed her into the kitchen, pausing for the passage of one of the robotic vacuum cleaners as it whirred along. I was wondering why this place was so clean, even though there aren't any servants. It doesn't get used much, I replied. The kitchen? Never. Then how are we going to eat? Open a cabinet. I gestured at the expansive kitchen. Which one? Any of them. She moved to obey, a distrustful expression on her face. So what, I open it and snakes pop out? The door opened and revealed silvery plastic packages stacked neatly on the shelves inside. The hell is this? MREs, I replied. Meals ready to eat. Cousin Will makes sure we have plenty on hand. You know these things aren't healthy, right? Ella removed one of the packages and wrinkled her nose in disgust. Spaghetti and meatballs? Somehow I doubt it. Would you rather starve? I snapped, my face contorting into a grimace. No. I'm sure it will be fine, sir. She flashed a smile that was one part meekness, four parts teasing lust. Do you have a preference? No. She riffled through several of the packages, setting those that didn't pass muster on the counter, before finally selecting a meal that didn't terribly offend her. Her selection wound up being Swedish meatballs, though she eschewed the warm-up pack and heated the dinner on the stovetop instead. I watched her cook from the counter, separating the kitchen from the living space. She chuckled suddenly, turning her golden-tressed head my way. 
Remember when I tried to make you blueberry muffins? My lips curled up into a smile, and my heart felt lighter as I recalled the memory. <laughs> yes, I said, laughing as well. You overfilled the cups, and they exploded all over the top of the pan. And the oven, Ella said. Man, my dad was pissed. Her face fell as she thought of her father, all but a vegetable now. My heart panged with sympathy and something else. I could recall that day, with the muffins and the huge mess, and her father hollering at me. I'd taken the diatribe with good grace, and Ella had been so happy that I hadn't resorted to toxic masculinity. What's wrong? She asked as I glowered. Nothing. Lost my appetite. I stood quickly. You should eat. Derek? Ella followed me as I headed for the front door. What's wrong? Did I say something, or... You didn't do a damn thing. I snapped, not looking at her. I just need... I need to take a walk. Clear my head. Do you want me to go with you? She followed me out the door. No. Stay. I snapped, glowering at her. Ella stiffened, a hurt expression clawing its way onto her face. Yes, sir. She murmured sadly, closing the door and disappearing inside the house. The sun had just set, casting red-gold light over the treetops. I picked one of my favorite hiking trails and started off, not bothering to care what the trail would do to my ostrich-skin shoes. My mind swirled with confusion. The old me, the one who loved Ella more than life itself, clashed with my new apathetic persona. I didn't want to care about her again because it had hurt so much to lose her the last time. I was afraid to consider if I even loved her any longer. Not because I was afraid to find I did not, but rather the opposite. I tried to remind myself that she was property now, all mine, and both of our feelings were irrelevant. How many times had I fantasized about strapping her down and giving her the punishment that her abandonment so richly deserved? Too many to count. But I had given in and gone down on her almost immediately, as if I'd been under a compulsion with no way to resist. Despite my conviction to not sleep with her for at least the first week of her training, I'd collapsed and caved into my own lusty desire. And my own emotions. There was no way to deny I was still twisted up over Ella. Now, with her in my grasp, I found myself running away from her and everything she represented. It would have been easier if she'd been defiant, petulant even, sobbing and crying. But that hadn't been the case. If anything, Ella had turned quite eager almost as soon as I'd shown her the playroom. And her mockery, saying sir like it was a name for a cur, had been calculated as well. She was testing me, not just in the ways I'd expected. I had thought I would be breaking a delicate flower, but it seemed I had a slab of iron ore in my forge instead. The leaves crunching under my heels offered no advice or assistance. So much for taking a walk to clear my head. If anything, at that point I felt more confused than ever. That's when I heard it, the tiniest crack as a twig was fractured. Someone was in the woods with me. Ella? No, couldn't be. I set a hard pace and she'd have had to run to have caught up by now. That meant it might be an enemy. My family had many, myriad enemies, some more determined than others. It came with having power and influence, a never-ending game of chess we played with those who sought to take it away from us. I ducked around the remnants of an old oak tree and waited. A moment later, a man sauntered past, cursing. I drew my pistol and placed it on the back of his head. The fuck are you doing following me? I asked in a voice trembling with, to my chagrin, more than a little fear. Take it easy, kid. Jimmy the Bull raised his hands. If you hadn't ditched me at the club, I wouldn't have had to traipse after you in Sherwood fucking forest. I sighed and tucked my pistol away. It seemed there was no getting away from my babysitter.
Chapter 10 Ella As soon as I closed the door, I leaned back against it and slid down into a seated position. What in the world had I done or said to evoke such a reaction from Derek? I thought back to what happened right before he grew upset and fled out the door. All I'd done was reminisce a little about the time I exploded blueberry muffins all over the oven. That was all. Yes, my dad had yelled at Derek. I remember being afraid it would get out of hand, but it seemed to blow over smoothly. Derek hadn't even seemed upset by the whole experience, taking his tongue lashing with good humor. So if it wasn't some hidden trauma, then why? Why leave when we were finally talking to each other as semi-equals? Maybe that was it. He wanted a mute sex doll who only said, Yes, sir, when spoken to. I rejected that notion quickly, remembering the smile on Derek's face. He had seemed just fine with the conversation, and then his brow had furrowed in deep thought. Perhaps those old memories, the happiness of them, hurt him now. Now that he was all angst and moodiness. Actually, I thought while sitting with my bare bottom on the polished wooden floor, he'd been pretty angst-ridden and moody in prep school, too. At first, I hadn't known what to make of his interest. He'd slipped a poem into my backpack when I hadn't been watching, but I immediately knew it was from him. His handwriting had a certain calligraphic quality to it, as if he saw the note not just as a message, but a work of art. I wish I'd kept that poem. After we broke up, I'd torn it to shreds. I wondered if he had a copy of it somewhere. It would be nice to read it again after so long. I was certain I'd forgotten at least some of the lines. But I remembered one in particular. Your smile is torment's release. After a time, my legs grew tingly and I forced myself to stand. I ate some of the prefab Swedish meatballs, but they turned my stomach. I wondered if I could talk Derek into a grocery store run. I left the rest for him and set about sulking in the living room. There was a television, a flat screen mounted on the wall, but I couldn't figure out which of the four separate remotes operated the device. So I left it black and settled in for what I feared would be a long wait. To my surprise, the door opened shortly after, and Derek thrust his head inside. Ella, he called. I'm here, sir. I sprang to my feet and went to the door like a dog healing its master. The metaphor was not lost on me. He looked at me for a long moment and then sighed. We're going to have a visitor temporarily before he moves into the guest cabin. There's a guest cabin? I blurted. Derek frowned and I quickly made amends. Sorry for interrupting, sir. Would you like to spank me? I turned about and put my hands on my knees, thrusting my bottom out at him while peering at him over my shoulder. Derek's face turned several shades as he grew flustered. No, not right. Put on some pants, he said. And don't act all... Look, just act normal. I don't have any pants, I reminded him, and Derek winced. Shit. All right. Go up to my bedroom and get a pair of sweats or something. Our visitor is going to inspect the house. Inspect the house? I arched an eyebrow even as I turned to leave. Who is it, the health department? Are there regulations for the care and maintenance of your slave girl I don't know about? Derek grumbled something and shook his head. It won't take long, he promised. Please, go put on something. I headed up the steps to the second floor and into what I assumed was his bedroom. It was the larger of the two impeccably furnished and neat rooms I found on that floor. I slid open a mahogany chest of drawers and discovered a pair of black sweatpants which were way too big. I tightened the drawstring as best I could, chuckling at the way they bunched up around my waist. When I returned to the main floor... 
I saw our visitor for the first time. A rotund, weasel-faced man, who nonetheless managed to give me a shudder. It wasn't that he seemed unkind. Far from it. He smiled huge when he saw me, and not in a creepy way. It was just that I could tell that he was capable of doing very, very impolite things in spite of his demeanor. Hello there, he waved. Don't talk to my woman, Derek snapped. You're here to do a job. Get it done already. The man moved away from us, pursing his lips and seeming none too pleased. When he started by opening the turntable cabinet doors and peering intently inside, I wondered if he was a hostile presence in the home. I leaned in next to Derek and whispered, Who is that, sir? And what's he doing? Jimmy the Bull, Derek answered in a low tone. And he's looking for drugs, which he isn't going to find because I don't have any... anymore. My dad sent him here to make sure I don't fall off the wagon. Why'd you leave before? I blurted suddenly. What? You left me, remember? No, not that. This evening. Right before sunset, you left. I want to know why. I was just trying to clear my head. That's all. He snapped. Why are you asking me so many questions? What do you care, anyway? I was taken aback by his query. What did I care, indeed? I cared, because even though our relationship ended years ago, those feelings had bubbled right back up to the surface as soon as I laid eyes on him. I was about to snap at him, and probably earn another punishment, when I was interrupted by the chiming of the great-grandfather clock on the main floor. Twelve gongs. I was off the hook. I straightened up and glared at Derek. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to bother you with my prattle again for the rest of the night, I said stiffly. Derek flinched, and then his expression softened. Ella, wait. It's after midnight. This coach has turned back into a pumpkin. I half ran up the stairs, fleeing him in his mercurial mood. Once I entered my guest room, I plopped face down on the bed and had a good, silent cry. At some point, I must have drifted off to sleep, because the next thing I knew, there was knocking at my door, and cheery sunlight spilled in the window, warming my back. I rubbed my eyes and looked about in confusion for several moments until I remembered where I was. Ella? Derek's voice came again. He didn't seem angry, but the knock came a bit harder. Are you awake? It's time to attend me again. Attend him. Of course. I slipped out of bed, stifling a yawn. The bathroom beckoned, but I didn't want to put him off by not obeying immediately. I paused in front of the door, looking down at myself. He probably had certain expectations, I thought mischievously. I stripped out of the bathrobe and sweats quickly as the knock came again, and then I knelt on the carpet. On a whim, I spread my legs wide, and then spoke. Come in, sir, I said sweetly. He pushed the door open, his eyes widening when they fell on me. Derek stood there half in the room and half out staring at me for a long time. I'm ready to serve you, sir, I said, batting my eyelashes at him. After our sour parting the prior evening, I was trying to make amends of sorts. Not like that, he said, sweat standing out on his brow as he stared pointedly between my legs. Not now. We're going out for brunch. He pushed the door open fully, and only then did I realize he had a white dress with a peplum skirt on a hanger. The delicate, subtle floral pattern didn't diminish the garment's elegance in the least. My eyes narrowed with suspicion, because I recognized that dress. It was one I'd put in an online shopping cart six months ago, and never could afford to purchase. 
Maybe it was coincidence, but I doubted it. That's a lovely dress, I said. Where did it come from? Versace, Derek drawled. Get up and put it on. I rose to my feet with a mirthless chuckle. That's not what I meant. How do you know it's even my size? Did you buy it off the rack? No. I had it overnight expressed here. You did want it, didn't you? I did, but how did you know that? Did you hack my phone? Didn't need to hack it. Derek drew my phone with its cracked screen out of his pocket. He tossed it on the bed. Next time, don't set your password as password. I had a lot on my mind, I sneered. So what gives you the right to just go through my phone? I guess my overnight bag made it here after all. Eric moved in close to me, his hand closing around my throat. In spite of his anger, I felt a throb between my legs as he squeezed. What gives me the right? I own you, understand? Yes, sir, I rasped out. He released my throat and indicated that I should get dressed by snapping his fingers. I took the dress out of his other hand, arching a brow. Did it come with underwear? Derek chuckled. That package won't arrive until later this evening. I think you'll be all right going commando for a while. Besides, I like the idea of you being vulnerable to me. He flicked up the skirt, exposing my nakedness behind it, and I purpled a bit from the shame. I also felt a strong pang of desire run through my body as I slipped into the dress. It featured beige straps, the same hue as the floral pattern in lieu of sleeves, and was just a wee bit tight in the bodice, but overall, it fit me well. It was a fun, bright, sexy spring dress, one that I had put in a cart but never really intended to purchase. I wanted to be mad at Derek for going through my phone, but he'd done the wrong thing for a good reason. How do I look, sir? I asked, doing a pirouette in a beam of warm sunshine. Derek's eyes hungrily moved all over me, and when he spoke, his voice carried a note of wonder. Ravishing. But I don't have any shoes. Derek bent over, picked up a longish box, and tossed it on the bed. I looked at him with a slight grin playing at my lips. Might these be a pair of Dior high block strappy heels? They might be, he replied. If that was what was in your cart, too. I opened the box and grinned at the shoes inside. After slipping them on, they fit even better than the dress. I put my hands behind my back and smiled sweetly. Do I pass muster, sir? Derek's mouth fell open and he nodded wordlessly. He stepped to the door and indicated I should head out in front of him. Remembering my place, I clasped my hands behind my back before sauntering out ahead of him. I could feel his gaze boring into me as I walked down the steps and across the living room floor. As I approached the front door, I gathered up the skirt material in my hands until I was nearly as exposed as I had been in the sleazy bathrobe. Naughty girl, he said. I gasped when he slapped his hand across my bare bottom. Brunch first, and then, then we'll see about dessert. You're going to have me prepare dessert? I asked, though I knew exactly what he had meant. No. He took me in his arms and crushed his lips on top of mine. A wash in his presence as much as his arms tightly holding me, I gave myself over to the moment. Derek set me back on my feet, and we headed out into the bright early afternoon sun. For the first time in what seemed like forever, nothing grim was hanging over my head. It was a fantastic feeling, and I felt as if I was in a fairy tale. 
Unfortunately, it was not going to last. Chapter 11. Derek. Jimmy the Bull insisted upon taking over as our limo driver, unseating the hapless Vic and forcing him to awkwardly stand around outside the cottage until our return. As Ella and I rode in the back, she turned toward me, eyebrows arched with a query. What's the deal with that guy anyway? Why does he act like you're up to no good? I chuckled and slipped my arm around her soft shoulders. Because up until very recently, I had a few bad habits that caused my family some consternation. Drugs? I pursed my lips, considering how much to tell her. Did Ella really need to know how far I'd fallen into despair and addiction? Yes, I said at length, because it didn't feel right to lie to her, not after our recent shared experiences. You're not a skinny waif, so it wasn't heroin, Ella murmured with a thoughtful frown marring her lovely face. And you don't bounce off the walls and make a lot of noise, so it wasn't coke either. <sighs> Kremlin swamp gas, an opium stream with some not-so-nice things mixed in, I said with a sigh. I'm not proud of it, but I've been clean for, well, for a few days. Opium's not as addictive, of course, so it's not as hard to kick as the harder drugs. I think you're lying to yourself. Everything can be an addiction, even good things, Ella countered. So, are you anxious about getting high? No. I said, surprised at the ring of truth in my words. I'm not. I suppose I've been distracted. I reached my hand over her clavicle and groped her breast through the dress. Ella bit her lower lip, eyes half-lidded as she submitted to my lustful grip. I felt her nipple harden through the thin fabric under my ministrations. Our lips met, and we settled into a lengthy and thorough make-out session, which lasted most of the way into the city. As we rolled into the Upper East Side, Jimmy unrolled the privacy screen, interrupting our amorous activities. Ella hastily tugged her skirt down as I wiped her lipstick from my cheek. Hey, kid, where are we going again? The Shaven Duck, I said. Yeah, but where is it? Don't you have GPS up there? Why are you asking me? Oh, GPS, good idea. The privacy screen went back up. Ella and I exchanged glances and then laughed. <laughs> He's an interesting sort, Ella muttered. I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley, though. Your instincts are dead on, I replied. I once saw Jimmy take down a 300-pound MMA fighter with a bent paper clip. Bullshit. Ella laughed. No, it's not. Jimmy stuck the point right into the guy's eye. Fight over in about half a second. Jeez, Ella said. Remind me not to fuck with him. Jimmy the Bull found our stop at last, dropping us off in front of the shaven duck. It was a mix between hipster and classy, with farm-to-table variants on classic dishes. If ever in the city... I recommend the Ducks Street Tacos. Somehow, I'm not sure who instigated it, Ella and I wound up holding hands on the way up the sidewalk. I glanced over and found she was blushing. What's the matter? I asked. I was just thinking about how sweet you're being right now, she answered. And how sweet you could be when we were dating as teens, but... But what? But to be honest, all I can think about is the next time we visit your playroom. Ella's face was red as a beet. We entered the restaurant then, a doorman holding the entry open for us. The hostess smiled from ear to ear as I approached the counter. Welcome back, Mr. Main, she said. Unfortunately, your favorite table is not available, but I can see about clearing it. Don't worry yourself, Janine, I said with a smile. I don't have reservations, so any table will be fine. As you wish. Please follow me. Ella and I were seated near the plate glass window looking out on the Big Apple's busy streets. She unfolded her napkin and placed it across her lap, shooting me a coy smile. I guess the Mayhem brothers don't need reservations, she said. 
Does your family own this restaurant or something? I pursed my lips and furrowed my brow. I don't know. Probably. She laughed. The sound cut off midway when she realized I wasn't joking. This is just surreal, she said. I mean, for a while, Dad was doing pretty good for himself, but we never could have just walked into a five-star trendy restaurant and been seated immediately. There are downsides to having such power, I said bitterly. Ella frowned, leaning forward on her elbows to peer intently at me. Like what? Having to look over your shoulder constantly? Yes, I said. But that's not even the worst. So, what is the worst? I unfolded my napkin and laid it across my lap, chewing over my response. I didn't want to start a fight. I really didn't. But at the same time, I felt the need to vent about something that had bothered me for years. The worst, I snapped my gaze to lock with hers, is that some people judge you just by your family and abandon you. Shun you. Ella stiffened and straightened her posture. I see. I was wondering when this was going to come up. When what was going to come up? I demanded angrily, flipping open the menu and looking at it, but not even reading the words. When you were going to take it out on me for leaving you when we were still practically kids? She said bitterly. Damn it, Derek. What do you want from me? It was years ago and I was in a bad headspace, okay? I couldn't deal with your family's situation. You didn't even try to deal with it, I snapped. You just left and wouldn't return my calls, wouldn't see me, wouldn't even look at me. I couldn't stand to see you. She shook her head. Oh, so I disgusted you that much? I blurted. No, I couldn't. <sighs> Ella sniffled, tears glistening in the corners of her eyes. It would have hurt too much to see you, knowing we could never be together, okay? It hurt because I cared about you so damn much. So go ahead, punish me for leaving you. Nothing you can do to me could compare to how much it hurt to leave you. I settled back, the venom draining from my fangs. I reached out and clasped her hand with my own, squeezing it gently. I'm not going to do that. What happened, happened. What matters now is the present. She sniffled, extricating her hand from under mine, but she did nod. The waitress came over and we made our orders. I did the ordering for Ella, which she didn't protest. I knew she was just going to love the Monte Cristo sandwich. It was right up her alley. How about some mimosas? I asked. Ella glanced up, blinking away tears and nodded. Make mine with orange juice, please, she said. Then a smile crept up onto her face. If that's okay with sir, of course. It's okay, I said, suddenly abashed at our private dichotomy spoken aloud in public. Our drinks arrived, shortly followed by the food. As I prepared to dig into my spaghetti, she picked up a ceramic dish filled with a purple gelatinous ooze and frowned. What's this? Grape jam for your sandwich. Grape jam with meat? She asked, arching a brow. Just try it. If you don't like it, we'll order something else. What is this exactly? It's deep fried lunch meat. You'll love it. Ella dipped a corner of her triangle half sandwich into the jelly and then brought it up to her mouth. Her teeth crunched through the crispy outer layer, a bit of grease running down her chin. Ella's eyes widened, and she quickly re-anointed her sandwich with more jelly and took another bite. How's the sandwich? I teased sweetly. Shut up, she said, devouring the food with gusto. I frowned, noticing for the first time how the veins and tendons in her hand stood out in stark relief. Have you been getting enough to eat lately? She glared at me, chewing a dollop of sandwich and swallowing before she spoke. I can take care of myself, Derek. What? That's not what I meant at all. Yes, it is. She glared across the table at me. That's exactly what you meant. 
It's like when we were dating the first time around, and you were always second-guessing everything I did. Just because I spent the first 12 years of my life poor and the last few years the same, doesn't mean I'm an idiot. You're putting words in my mouth. I tried to soothe her. Calm down. I never said you couldn't take care of yourself. But you're thinking it, right? Poor Ella, she has to work three jobs and she still can't feed herself? Well, I've been taking care of myself and four invalids for almost as long as we've been apart. I'm a grown-ass woman and I don't need your fucking condescending attitude. Condescending? I gasped. Come on, calm down. You're causing a scene. She seethed, taking a long drink of water before speaking in a lower, more civilized tone. Are you giving me an order, sir? She snapped icily. No, not here. Not in public. Come on, Ella, why are you so pissed at me all of a sudden? Why? I don't know. She shook her head, eyes narrowed to slits. I really don't know, but it probably has something to do with you. Me? What did I do? Nothing. And that's the point. While I slaved away for the last few years struggling to make ends meet, you were getting high and partying it up, sleeping till noon and screwing every floozy you came across. You didn't win me back. You bought me. Your money and privilege come so naturally to you, you just assume everyone is going to be so grateful for your help. Ella inhaled deeply, her nostrils flaring, and then sighed. I didn't need you to come sweep into my life and make it better, Derek. I was doing fine on my own. Oh? Then how did you end up at the Jolly Roger, auctioning yourself off to the highest bidder? Fuck you, she sputtered. That's not fair. What are we supposed to do, us little people, without trust funds? Would you have preferred I leave my dad on the street or at the mercy of my bitch of a stepmother? Hell no. Don't you dare judge me. You can't buy my love, Derek. You never could. And maybe that's as much why I left as your family's connections. I laid my knife and fork down carefully and dabbed at my mouth, trying to give no clue as to the seething rage I felt in my belly. Well, fine. I don't have to buy your love. I already own your body. I think it's time you were reminded of that. Ella's expression seemed inscrutable, but I thought I detected a bit of regret in her blue eyes. Not that I was mad, but that she'd said so many hurtful things, even if there was a ring of truth to them. Whatever sir wants, she rasped snidely. That's right, I said, throwing three hundred dollar bills on the table and grabbing her by the wrist. Whatever I want. I dragged her out of the restaurant seething with pent-up rage. If she wanted to play this game... She would find that I played to win. Chapter 12 Ella Derek's grip on my wrist was painfully tight as he led me half stumbling out of the restaurant to the waiting limo. He yanked the door open and then roughly shoved me inside, climbing in after. I rubbed my wrist and glared at him in fury. I had grown tired of his condescending attitude and the way he thought his money and privilege solved everything. His response was to behave like a petulant 12-year-old and get all huffy. Jimmy, take us to Viking Age, Derek barked toward our driver. Viking Age? Is that the tattoo parlor? The same. Goosebumps rose on my skin at the mention of the phrase tattoo parlor. He wouldn't seriously force me to get a tattoo, would he? A myriad of feelings welled in me. I was afraid it would hurt, first and foremost, yet I'd always dreamed of having a tattoo. I was also afraid of what design he might choose. What if he did something purely humiliating and ugly? Like that viral photo of the poor woman whose jilted, friend-zoned tattooist inked a pile of shit on her back. I kept hoping that maybe, just maybe, he wanted a tattoo for himself. 
but I knew I was wrong. We rolled along, growing faster to my fate. I squirmed in my seat, butterflies swarming in my belly. Derek remained stony and silent, looking out the window and trying to pretend I didn't exist. I soon began to calm a bit. Derek couldn't help it if his first recourse was to throw money at a problem. And he was probably just concerned for my well-being. Plus, I really hadn't been eating very well. The bitter irony of working at a restaurant is that sooner or later, nothing there smells or tastes the least bit appetizing. Plus, my manager only gave me a 30% discount on meals. So maybe I was a bit underweight, though hardly a starving waif. Still, Derek didn't have to be such an ass. I decided I was still miffed, though willing to give him another chance. That was, until we stopped in front of the aforementioned Viking Age Studios. The plate glass window out front was adorned with a busty, chainmail, bikini-clad woman with a horned helmet riding a dinosaur. Real subtle. As we exited the limo, Derek's hand gripping my wrist tightly again, I noted the neighborhood was in the process of decline. For a long, long time. If I were alone, I wouldn't dare walk down this particular street. Derek ushered me inside, and a young man with multiple lip piercings and inked designs looked up with a cheerful smile. Hey, it's the demon! He came out from behind the counter to fist bump Derek. He turned toward me for a moment, his face contorted in confusion. Who's this? She's a little, uh, vanilla for your tastes, isn't she? I scowled. Vanilla, am I? Is that how it is? Nice to see you, Sykes, Derek said, deliberately and pointedly not answering the man's query. You available for some work this afternoon? For you, always. Sykes rubbed his hands in glee. You always come up with the most challenging things for me to try. Go ahead in the back and have a seat so we can discuss what you want. I'm not the client. Derek shoved me forward roughly. She is. Is that so? Sykes said, his eyes filled with anxious worry. Ah, uh, have you ever had a tattoo before? No, I said. But apparently I'm going to get one today. Sykes glanced from me over to Derek and frowned. Uh, is this cool? Don't worry. I'm not as vanilla as you might think, I snapped, moving past him into the back room. The walls were covered in photos of colorful ink work, some of it more intricate and detailed than a Da Vinci illustration. Several of the images were quite beautiful, but what would Derek choose to etch permanently upon my skin? I was angry about it, but I couldn't help but admit, even if only to myself, that the idea of him compelling me to get a tattoo was pretty hot. In practice, I wasn't so sure. What are we going to do for you today? Sykes opened up a binder filled with sketches. For your first tat... I would recommend something simple and small. Never mind that crap. Derek dug through his pocket until he found his phone and brought up an image on the screen. This is what I want you to ink on her. I peered at the image on his screen, my nose wrinkling with disgust. It was a pair of artfully rendered glass slippers, the image managing to appear ethereal and translucent. Elegant, even. Someone with a lot of skill had rendered the design, but it wasn't what I would have picked for myself. Man. Sykes shook his head. I can do it, but there's a lot of white in this design. You know white hurts the most. She can take it, Derek snapped. She's not fragile. 
Derek looked me dead in the eye when he said the words. While Sykes sheepishly went off to prepare his equipment, Derek leaned over the armrest to whisper in my ear, Say the word. Admit that you're afraid, and we'll walk out of here right now. I leaned back and eyed him coolly. Who said I'm afraid? Derek sputtered, his attempt to be gracious backfiring in his face. Fine, then. He stood up and perched upon a stool like an angry gargoyle. Sykes came back with his kit, slipping on a pair of disposable black gloves. Where do you want it? He asked as his laser printer churned out a larger version of the glass slipper image. Right above her ass, Derek said firmly. I glared at him. A tramp stamp? He was going to make me get a tramp stamp. Damned if I was going to give him the satisfaction of backing out or acting afraid. Sykes glanced at me, as if to confirm. I shrugged as if it didn't matter, and turned around to lie on my belly on the table. You heard the man, I said, flouncing up my skirt. Oh, I'm not wearing underwear. That's not a problem, is it? Derek fumed and Sykes seemed to pick up on the animosity between us, but he dutifully rolled up a towel and placed it over my naked rear before sterilizing the work area with a cotton swabbed with alcohol. At least let me spread it out over a few sessions. Sykes tried to help. It's not a large tat. She'll be fine. Won't you, Ella? Derek answered for me. Yes, sir. I said all chipper-like. I'll be just fine. I can take whatever you can dish out. Sykes frowned, but bent to work. I'm going to do the outline first. Because it's an image of glass, I'll have to do it in white. It's going to burn, honestly. I'll be fine, I said. When the tattoo needle jabbed into my skin with a buzzing akin to angry hornets, I regretted my stoicism, but I gritted my teeth and endured. I could see Sykes' work in the reflection of a chrome lampshade. The amount of blood he kept wiping away disturbed me, but neither he nor Derek seemed alarmed. I suppose it was par for the course. It took over three hours for Sykes to finish my tattoo, with only one short break in the middle while he smoked a cigarette. Did it hurt? Absolutely. You try getting a needle shoved into your skin over and over again at a machine gun pace. But it wasn't as painful as I thought it would be, and when Sykes finished and applied a smear of coconut and emu oil, it felt more like I had a bad sunburn than anything else. Derek peered down at the small of my back, nodding in satisfaction. But when he met my gaze, I detected guilty regret lurking in his eyes. He had been bluffing, but I'd called it. And now we would both have to live with the results. Here, Sykes said, holding up a photo snapped with his cell phone so I could see it. What do you think? I think you have a lot of talent, I said honestly. It's lovely. Sykes gave me my instructions. No direct sunlight for at least a week. Keep it covered. Apply the emu oil liberally to prevent scabbing and help the healing process. I listened, but with only half an ear. I figured Derek, with all of his ink, knew the best way to take care of a healing tattoo. Sykes put saran wrap over my burning lower back, and then I hiked my skirt back down. He favored me with a worried frown as we left. Well, I was a big girl and I'd made a big girl decision. Or maybe an immature decision. If I hadn't been so intent on calling Derek's bluff, I could have walked out of here three hours ago without a drop of blood spilt. Derek didn't drag me out of the parlor as he had the restaurant. In fact, he almost seemed afraid to touch me. As soon as we piled into the back of the limo, I turned my rear to him and hiked up my skirt. Does it please you, sir? I asked without much emotion. Of course it does, 
he said sullenly. Put your skirt down. The privacy screen isn't up yet. She's got nothing I ain't seen before, kid. Jimmy called from the front seat. Shut up, Jimmy. Derek growled and rolled up the screen. We rode back to his woodland retreat in silence. The sandwich I'd eaten earlier felt like a lead weight in my stomach. How had we gone from such a lovely time to being at each other's throats? I guess there were a lot of pent-up feelings on both sides. Once we reached the cottage, a very flustered limo driver regained his keys from Jimmy the Bull. While they bantered, Derek led me inside the manor. I'm going for a swim, he said, doffing his shirt and showing off his chiseled pecs. But you can't go in the water because of your new ink. You are still expected to attend me, however. Whatever sir wants, I said with exaggerated obsequiousness. Watch your smart-ass tone, Derek snarled. Whatever do you mean, sir? I asked sweetly. Isn't this what sir wants? Someone docile and compliant? Derek's face darkened by several shades. He took my wrist again, dragging me into the kitchen. He began throwing open drawers, cursing under his breath. Where is it? He grumbled. Should have put it away where it belonged. Aha. Uh -huh. Derek pulled a red rubber ball gag out of one of the kitchen drawers, shaking a washcloth loose from the shiny chrome buckle. He approached me with it held in two hands, raising it to my face level. I opened my mouth without being told, locking gazes with him. Derek shoved it in my mouth and buckled it tightly. I grunted as the leather dug into my skin, the ball sinking tightly between my teeth. There. Now your smart-ass mouth can't bother me. Derek slapped my cheek twice firmly before taking a step back and spreading his arms out wide. Take off my pants. I did so, sinking to my knees and unbuckling his belt. Once his underwear was off, he suddenly grabbed the back of my head and shoved my gagged face into his crotch. Obviously, I couldn't take his member in my mouth, but I responded with worship. I rubbed my face all over his rock-hard cock, rolling my eyes up to meet his gaze. The tat burned like fire, but not as much as what I felt between my legs. That's enough of that, Derek snapped and pulled me by the hair away from his body. Follow me. He headed out to the pool and dove right in. I wasn't sure what attending him would entail, so I just sort of stood there feeling dumb with a ball gag in my mouth. I had expected it to be far less comfortable than it turned out to be. The idea of Derek preventing me from speaking turned me on, or at least it would have if he hadn't been so angry. I stood there by the pool until Derek swam over and demanded I towel him off. As I did so, paying a lot of extra attention to drying his privates, his phone rang. Irritated, he snatched it up off the poolside table and put it to his ear. Who are you and how did you get this no- What? Ella Ashmore? Suddenly, I was wrapped with attention, pausing with the bunched up towel encompassing his balls. Who was trying to contact me? Yes, I know her. Not at the moment. She can't talk right now. He grinned at me. What? What about her father? Quickly, I leaped to my feet and yanked the phone out of his hand. I put it to my face, and then I remembered I was wearing the ball gag. I grunted in frustration while Derek removed it. What about my father? I asked. Is this Shady Pines assisted living? No, came the feminine, icy reply. It's your mother. My stepmother... Somehow, she had found me. Chapter 13 Derek
Ella's face contorted into an angry mask as the woman on the other end of the call spoke. The fading afternoon sun cast dappled light onto her fine features as she glared in fury, her gaze distant and seeming to look right through me. You're not my... No. No, I've taken care of everything. Yes, the bill is paid. Ella stomped her foot in frustration. For as long as it takes, that's how long. None of your business how I paid for it. The other woman spoke for some time while I could tell Ella was biting back some nasty retorts. When she was finally permitted to speak again, her tone was dripping with venom. I moved out. That's why I haven't been home. The house is rented under your name, not mine. Remember? I'm under no obligation to pay your rent. What? What does that have to do with anything? Ella looked at me in misery, tears welling in her eyes. Yes, I moved in with... I moved in with an old boyfriend. Why does it matter what his name is? Ella's eyes widened with shock, and when she next spoke, her voice was barely above a whisper. How did you find that out? Oh, bullshit. Bullshit. I'm taking care of my dad. He's my family. You're just the cunt who married him when he had money. Yes, I said cunt. Go fuck yourself. You're not getting a dime out of me. Ella smiled fiercely, even as tears dribbled down her cheeks. I felt so helpless. I wanted to help, but I had no idea how, or even if I should assist. Oh, and for the last time, you're not my mother. Ella smashed her finger furiously on the red end call icon, and then thrust the phone back into my hands. She rushed off, leaving me dripping wet, naked, and wondering what in the hell was going on. I draped the towel around my midsection and checked the call origin. Not a number I recognized, obviously, but it had a Manhattan area code. I worried about Ella. I started walking after her, even as I began a new call. Hello? Gentleman Starkey said in a tired voice. He had probably been napping, as was his wont in the afternoon. Derek? It's me, Starkey, I said. Listen... Can you do me a favor? I always used good manners with Starkey, even though he was technically on the family payroll. Not that I feared him or anything like that. He was just very polite, and he made you want to be the same because it made you feel good and civilized. I will give it the old college try. Excellent. I need you to track down the owner of a particular phone number. I'll text you in a minute after we finish the call. Of course, young sir, Starkey replied smoothly. Do you want a full workup on them? No. Wait. Yes. Yes, I do. Is this person an enemy, a rival, or a potential lover? Definitely an enemy. I recalled how upset Ella had been. Get me the dirt, Starkey. I'll throw in a bonus for you if you can get it done today. I'll do my best, sir, Starkey replied. That was something I liked about the genial old man. He never promised you something he didn't know he could deliver. Starkey was steady as a rock. Thank you. I'll text that number in a sec. I ended the call and then headed up to the second floor looking for Ella. I wondered where she could have gone. The house was expansive, but finite. Surely, sooner or later, if I kept moving around, I would come across her presence. I failed to locate her in either of our sleeping chambers. Growing worried, I headed to the main floor and checked there as well. Eventually, I worked my way back outside, looping around the property from poolside to the sidewalk, which connected the main house with the guest house. Still, Ella was nowhere to be found. I went inside the living area and sat down, wondering if she'd fled through the woods. Or maybe she caught a ride with the limo when it rolled back to town. I grew angry. How could she just leave me without saying anything, no matter how upset she might have been? That's when I heard it. A tiny whisper, a muffled sob. Standing, I peered intently about the first floor area until I spotted a wedge of light bleeding from below a coat closet door. I, slowly, so as not to startle her, opened the door, 
and found her in a huddled mass on the floor. Ella's face was between her drawn-up knees, her shoulders shaking with muffled sobs. Hey, I dropped into a crouch beside her. What's wrong? Does the tattoo hurt? She looked up at me with a mix of misery and fury, her blue eyes fierce despite being flooded with tears. It's not the fucking tat, okay? She snapped. Stop acting all weird about the tattoo. I made the choice not to stop things, so quit treating me with kid gloves. All right, fair enough. I held up my hand. I gingerly laid my hand on her shoulder and she didn't shrug it off. That was something. So who was that on the phone? Why did she upset you so much and do you want me to have her fitted for concrete shoes? I had intended it to be a joke, but Ella sneered. If anyone is going to kill that bitch, it's going to be me, she sputtered. The fucking nerve, the sheer fucking hubris. How dare she refer to herself as my mother? My mother died, but in her brief time as my parent, she did ten times as much as that harpy. Ella sputtered, unable to form coherent speech. I let her rant on once she regained the faculty of speech. I mean, I worked my ass off at three different jobs just so she and my stepsisters could lounge around pretending to be disabled. I slaved and slaved, sweat and bled, cleaned up god-awful surgery rooms and always paid the bills on time, even though I was hardly ever home. And now she wants to try and guilt trip me into paying more? Fuck her. This gravy train has gone off the rails. I take it that was your stepmother? I asked when she seemed to wind down. You take it correctly, Ella sneered. I don't know what my father ever saw in her. Scratch that. She had big boobs, was ten years his junior, and he was still grieving my mother. The exploitative, opportunistic bitch. She sounds like an awful person. I began drawing plans in my head. I wasn't going to off some lady just because she made my woman cry, but I was sorely tempted. What I was willing to do involved a visit from a certain musclehead named Navajo Joe. Joe would straighten that nasty creature out with one fucking visit and not harm a hair on her head. He'd sure put the fear of God into her, though. But I was distracted again as Ella began sobbing. Her face screwed up into a miserable frown, reddening like the setting sun as she gave vent to her misery. Why did my dad have to get sick? It should have been her. My dad doesn't deserve to suffer. Why do bad things always happen to people who don't deserve it, while nasty cunts like her just thrive? If I could answer that, I'd go to church more often, I said. All I know is you deserved better. Ella sniffled, raising her gaze to meet my own. I wasn't sure why, but that was the right thing to say. I decided to continue along a similar path. You deserved to have a loving family, not some gold-digging, lazy cretins, I continued. You deserved to have someone take care of you, not the other way around. You deserved to be happy, even if it wasn't with me. Ella wiped her tears away, and I handed her a hanky. She gratefully accepted, blowing her nose wetly. I guess I'm doing a bad job of attending you while you swim, huh? Don't worry about that right now, I assured her. Right now, you're the woman I... The woman I care about more than any other, and I want you to feel better. I offered her my hand. Shyly, she took it and allowed me to draw her to her feet. We exited the closet hand in hand. I paused, drawing her in close to me. My hand was at the small of her back, touching the border of the plastic protective sheath over her new glass slippers tattoo. I still couldn't believe she went through with it and called my bluff. You don't have to be around those awful people any longer, I whispered, cupping her cheek in my hand. A tear slid its way down her face, and I moved in to kiss it softly away. I know, she said, burying her face in my bare chest. I know, but it's like... Do you remember when we read Paradise Lost in school? I remember. I grinned. 
I caused quite a ruckus with my presentation of stating that Satan was in fact the epic hero of that work. And I was the first to applaud, she chuckled. But do you remember when Satan escaped from hell finally, but the memory of it was so bad it was like he never left? Which way I fly is hell, I said. I myself am hell. Yeah, the memory of it all is so bad. It's like I'm still stuck there. They were just awful, mocking me, making fun of me for working so hard, even while they reaped the benefits. How can people be like that? She started crying again, and I held her close. Derek, I'm so sorry. I rejected you because I thought your family was evil, but I was wrong. My family was evil the whole time. Mine. Stop. I squeezed her tightly. The fact of the matter is, we don't wear white hats, Ella. We're not the cowboy who rides in at the end of the reel to save the day. We're more like the guys who tie the woman to the train tracks. Ella chuckled, wiping away her tears as she looked up into my eyes. For what it's worth, I think my family is a lot worse. My step-family, anyway. We kissed again, this time with greater passion. I could feel her heart hammering against me like a caged bird. Ella, I whispered, brushing her neck with my lips. Let's go up to the bedroom. No, she said, standing on tiptoes to whisper in my ear. Let's go to the playroom. I started and then noticed her grin. My own lips stretched wide to mirror it, and then I led her by the hand toward the stairs. Chapter 14 Ella Every step down into the basement seemed to create distance between me and my familial problems. Even the burn of my new tattoo faded into the background noise of my blushing delight as I considered what things Derek would do to me in the playroom. I entered a pace ahead of him, hands still clasped at my lower back. Derek swept in behind me and closed the door, locking it with a metallic snick. His footsteps came closer until I could feel his hot breath across the back of my neck. I shivered as his hands swept up over my forearms, gliding lightly and stirring a heady, blossoming rush, which spread through my nerves like wildfire. My lips parted to allow heavy pants to heave their way out. I could hear my own heartbeat thudding in my ears, its rapid tempo lending a more surreal quality to the environs. The wall of implements no longer seemed something to fear or dread, but rather to be explored in intimate detail with my dark-haired lover. Derek's hands caressed my shoulders as he hemmed me in with his body. My fingers brushed against his growing bulge, and I had to resist the urge to stroke it. Derek seemed keenly aware of my predicament, rubbing his trouser-clad member all over my hands, which I desperately tried to keep in a neutral position despite all his teasing. My heart rate quickened when Derek took the thin straps of my dress and tugged them toward the convex edges of my shoulders. When they fell free, the bodice of my dress loosened, a herald to the exposure yet to come. Derek slowly pulled the straps downward, peeling the dress away from my breasts. The sudden cool air of the playroom stiffened my nipples into nigh instant erect attention, practically begging for Derek's touch. His chin propped against my shoulder, Derek peered down at my now exposed chest and moved his palms in to lightly caress my nipples. I gasped, struggling to remain still while he moved his hands in tiny circles using the softest part of his palms to tease my nubs. Do you like that, Ella? He breathed into my ear. Yes, sir. I replied with a ragged gasp as he pinched my nips just hard enough to hurt. Good. Then we're going to play a little game. 
I'm going to tug on your nipples until you reach your perceived limit. Then we'll see how far you're able to push yourself. Yes, sir, I said, biting my lower lip. I didn't dread the imminent pain so much as I viewed it as a jog up a steep incline. I knew it was going to be tough and agonizing, but the rush of endorphins, that elated feeling of accomplishing something difficult, waited at the top to reward me. Remember your safe word, he whispered in my ear. At first, I didn't feel anything different, but then I realized he was increasing the pressure on my nipples incrementally. I'm not a mathematician, but I'd say he was putting on about a gram more pressure every second. It doesn't sound like much, but it adds up quickly. My lips peeled back from my clenched teeth. I sucked in air wetly through them as the pain increased, but I could take it. So I did. You're a very brave girl, little Cinderella. I hate it when you call me that, sir. I gasped. Why? I looked down at my nipples, crushed between his thumbs and forefingers. Their tips spilled out like muffin tops, growing more scarlet by the second under my gaze. It's humiliating, I groaned. Then when we're playing... That's going to be your name, Cinderella. My Cinderella. I made something between a groan of frustrated anger and a groan of unmitigated lust. The way he took command and decreed I would suffer the humiliating subname set off a deep throbbing between my legs. Under my skirt, I knew I was glistening wet and opening wider by the moment. Thank me for your new name, Cinderella, Derek commanded. Ah, uh, thank you, sir, I gasped as he tugged my already tortured nipples outward, distending my breasts. My nipples looked like well-chewed taffy stretched out to playful and ludicrous lengths. But I didn't use the safe word. I could take it. I could take it for him. I didn't want Derek to treat me with kid gloves, like I was made of glass. I wanted to prove to him that he could unleash the full potential fury of his unconventional desires upon me. Not only that, but I was eager for him to do so. Do you want me to show you mercy? Derek asked, a bit anxiously, like he'd expected me to capitulate long before that moment. No, I said fiercely through gritted teeth. I want you to do whatever you want to me. I want to endure for you, sir. Derek released my nipples and I yelped as the blood rushed back into my tormented flesh. He then seized them again, massaging the agonized skin to restore circulation. The pain was exquisitely blended with pleasure from his ministrations. Turn around, Derek commanded. I spun in a circle hands still behind my back, dress tugged down to my waist and sliding ever closer to complete nudity. He looked at my red, sore nipples and pursed his lips. I bet your nipples hurt now, don't they? Yes, sir, I said, biting my lower lip and looking up at him with adoration. Did I do good, sir? You did very well, Derek praised me. I'm impressed but you must not overextend yourself just to prove a point to me. I expect you to let me know immediately if anything becomes too much to bear. Yes, sir. Would you like me to make your nipples feel better, Cinderella? He asked softly. I cringed a bit at that awful, degrading name. I got plenty of that in middle school, thank you very much. But it was different somehow coming from Derek. Yes, sir, I said. Derek cupped my breasts gently and then bowed his head. I moaned as he brushed his lips across my reddened nub and then took it inside his wet mouth. The warmth of his mouth temporarily exacerbated the agony. Then I felt the tip of his tongue flick and lash over my swollen nipple, soothing and exciting the skin all at once. I couldn't help myself. 
I reached up and clutched his head to my breasts, my fingers stroking his luxurious black hair. It felt so good, so sublime to have his mouth on my body. Derek abruptly released my nipple and took my hands by the wrists. Did I say you were allowed to touch me, Cinderella? He asked. No, sir, I replied with a goofy smile. A giddy warmth spilled over me as I looked into his eyes. They were stern, but not filled with spite or disgust. I only saw exquisite affection. What do you think is an appropriate punishment for touching your master without permission? He asked with an arched eyebrow. A spanking, sir? I asked sweetly with an innocent smile stretching my lips. What an excellent suggestion. Derek turned away from me and reached for the leather-padded three-legged stool. When I turn back around, you'd better be naked, Cinderella. I scrambled to tug the dress down past my hips, over my thighs, and down to my ankles. But it was an impossible task. By the time I stepped out of the dress and stood fully nude to his gaze, Derek had already planted the stool in the center of the floor and seated himself upon it. Too slow, he said with a grin. Guess that's an extra five swats. Yes, sir, I murmured. Derek patted his lap and then motioned toward me. Come over here and take your medicine, Cinderella, he growled. You're mine until the stroke of midnight, and I'm going to put your dirty, nasty pussy to good use until then. I almost stumbled on my way to the stool, gasping as a heavy throb racked my body with my mons being the epicenter. When I was within arm's reach of Derek, his hand darted out and grabbed my wrist. He pulled me over his lap and then knotted up his hand in my hair as I adjusted my position for stability. I was then draped over his thighs, head held up by his grip on my hair and my hands brushing the floor while my bare feet did so on the other side of the stool. How many swats do you think you deserve for touching your master without permission? However many, sir, thinks, I replied. Hmm, an excellent answer. I'll go with ten for your disobedience, and five for being a lazy, slow slave, Cinderella. Yes, sir, I chuckled. Oh, so you think this is funny? Derek questioned while laughing as well. His palm cracked down across my ass cheeks and I squealed. Is it still funny now? I don't know, I said. I need another sample to be sure. But it is kind of funny for a 22-year-old woman to get spanked. Don't you agree? Maybe, Derek said. That was one. You have 14 left. Every time I spank you, I'm going to dial up the intensity. If it gets to be too much before we hit 15, all you have to do is say glass slipper. Ask for mercy, and you will have it. I understand, sir, I replied, allowing a bit of the sardonically arrogant edge to creep into my tone. I'm serious, Ella. Don't underestimate the power of the palm. He licked his hand and then slapped it across my right cheek exclusively. The impact had decidedly more sting, both from his wet saliva and because he'd swung faster and harder. He cracked me again in the same spot, a little bit harder. I squealed and laughed even harder, even though it definitely hurt. Oh God, I'm in so much trouble, I said between giggles. It was exactly the same feeling I'd had as a child, going up the steep, high first hill of a roller coaster. Scared, but thrilled and excited. You don't know the half of it yet. Derek laid into me with multiple swats, adding a bit more sting on each one. I abandoned laughter in favor of guttural grunts as he warmed up my skin with his strikes. The warmth seemed dominant over the pain, the intense vibrations of his blows reverberating into my love tunnel as well. 
not to mention my crotch rubbed and leaked all over his thighs. What number were we on? He asked with exaggerated inquisitiveness. I knew I was being set up and smiled as I answered. Thirteen, sir, I replied. Thirteen? No, I'm pretty sure we were on ten. Yes, sir, I said with a chuckle. You're not going to argue? I know better, sir. You're a fast learner, Cinderella. Derek's hand cracked over my bottom five more times. I wound up screaming during the last two, my throat growing as raw as my reddened bottom, but I never broke, and I never used the safe word. Your bottom is so red, Cinderella, he said, running his fingers across my blazing skin. I moaned when he clawed my cheeks apart and slid his index finger through my crack, down across my dark star to the pink mushiness of my quivering love tunnel. I moaned as those fingers wormed their way inside of me. Derek switched his grip from my hair to my throat, squeezing not across my trachea, but compressing the big arteries in my neck. I grew lightheaded, somewhat from his chokehold, but even more so from the way he worked a third finger inside of my wet and dirty hole. You're such a dirty girl, Cinderella. Getting all hot and wet from a spanking. Shame on you. I am a dirty girl, sir, I gasped, biting my lower lip as a fourth finger joined the others. He was stretching me wide, but I exulted in the sensation. Since when? He asked, seemingly struck with wonder at my wantonness. Since forever, I gasped. I always wanted to show you this side of me. Ah, oh, sir, but I never felt safe enough to do so. Oh. Did you just come without asking permission first? Menace tinged his tone. Fireworks danced behind my eyelids and a deep shudder ran through my body. His lap was soaking wet with my juices. Did he really have to ask? Yes, sir, I said. I'm sorry, sir. You'll have to be punished. He stared at me for a long time, fingers playing with the edges of the plastic cocoon protecting my new tattoo. Your tramp stamp is so hot, Cinderella. So hot. Thank you, sir. My belly twisted with conflicting emotion. I was still resentful of him, even though I could have called it off at any time. Yet, I liked having the emblem of my submission to Derek inked permanently upon my skin. Conflicted? I definitely was at that point. But I had no desire whatsoever to leave his lap. I can't resist sticking my cock in you much longer, Derek admitted. I hissed as he adjusted his fingers inside my body. Please, sir, I said between clenched teeth. May I come? Yes. Derek gave me permission and I screamed, thrashing about on his lap, held in place with a hand around my throat. I squirted all over his hand and onto the floor, which amused him greatly. You come so pretty for your master. But now, I'm going to show you what true helplessness feels like. I shuddered, not with fear, but with anticipation. I knew that no matter how far he chose to go, I would still be safe. That made my answer roll off my tongue like a gentle summer breeze. Yes, sir. Chapter 15. Derek. Get on your feet, Cinderella, I said, manhandling her out of my lap to a standing position. Do you see that coil of blue silk rope on the shelf next to the rack? She followed my pointing finger and nodded. Yes, sir. I drank in the sight of her, naked bottom blazing pink from my administered spanking, lips parted, chest heaving with heavy pants. Her eyes were glazed over with the heat of lust, 
half-lidded and buried in the throes of subspace. Go retrieve it, I ordered, and Ella moved across the room on unsteady legs, a legacy of the multiple climaxes I'd induced with my fingers. I brought those fingers to my nose and inhaled deeply of a rich, musky scent. To my disbelief, I learned I could grow even more erect than I was already. Ella lifted the coil of blue silk rope from the shelf and started back toward me. Stop, I said firmly. Ella paused mid-stride, looking at me expectantly. Put the rope in your mouth and bring it to me on your hands and knees. Like a dog. Ella gasped, swaying a bit before she lowered herself to her knees. She placed the bundle of rope between her teeth and then crawled toward me. I locked gazes with her, basking in the sight of her humiliated yet excited blue eyes. I took the rope from her teeth and patted her on the head. Good girl. Thank you, sir, she said in a soft, husky voice. Her eyes were dewy as the early morning and yet smoldered with heat. Stand up, I said. She did so rising until her magnificent breasts were at eye level with me as I perched upon the stool. Turn around. Ella spun in a tight circle, flashing me a sultry smile as she did so. I took her arms and pulled them at right angles behind her back. She moaned softly as I encircled her wrists with the silken azure cord. Like a spider trapping its latest meal in a cocoon, I wound the cord about her torso, being careful to avoid her new ink. Using the blue silk, I immobilized her arms behind her, gluing them to her back with an intricately woven pattern. The rope diverged and crossed between and under her breasts, lifting and squeezing them in a pleasing way. I gently turned her about to face me and added more layers. Go get another bundle, I said patting her bottom to nudge her toward the wall. Yes, sir, Ella said. She padded across the floor, her movements awkward because of the rope cage stiffening her torso and pinning her arms behind her. She turned to the side, fingers straining as she tried to reach another bundle of rope, but her restraints made it impossible. I can't reach it, sir. You're not being creative enough, I said. Use your imagination. Ella arched an eyebrow incredulously at me, but then turned back to her assigned task. I saw realization dawn in her azure eyes, and she opened her mouth, delicately taking the rope bundle between her teeth. Then she turned about and walked toward me, but I jabbed my finger at the floor. Knees, I said. Ella paused making an amused sort of groan giggle at her predicament, and then carefully settled onto her knees and inched her way across the floor to me. Her grunts of effort echoed off the walls of the playroom, and I admired her determination. Good girl, I said, taking the rope from her mouth. Stand up. I assisted her to her feet by taking hold of the horizontal bars of rope above and below her breasts, and pinching them together as a handhold. Ella yelped as the ropes pinched her breasts while she struggled to her feet. <sighs> Aren't I helpless enough yet, sir? Ella asked as I added another layer to her bondage. I don't think so, but this isn't necessarily to restrain you. It's to spread out your weight more evenly. Sir? She asked. I'm going to suspend you from the ceiling. I said. Haven't you wondered what those pulleys are for? Oh, yes, sir. Ella bit her lower lip. I've been dying with curiosity. You'll soon find out. I finished securing the harness about her body and then maneuvered her below one of the pulleys. With a crank attached to the wall, I lowered the slack end of a brown hemp cord until it slopped onto the floor. Ella sighed as I tied her harness off to the pulley, tilting her head back and trying to press herself against me. You're such a distracting tease, I said, as she grabbed at my crotch with her bound hands. 
Oops, I touched you without permission again, she said with a light chuckle. I'm such a naughty girl. Yes, you are, Cinderella, I murmured. You just can't keep yourself away from my cock. Ella gasped, eyes squeezing shut as a moan shuddered out of her mouth. Her face flushed red, but her moist lips didn't deny my claim. I looped more rope around her upper thigh, tying it off to her chest harness. Ella moaned as I yanked on the cord, drawing her foot up off the floor. She bent her knee until her weight was supported only by one leg. Then I took that away from her too, suspending her below the pulley with her legs spread wide. I stared unabashedly between her thighs, letting my gaze linger on her swollen, glistening labia before sweeping it up to her quivering pink clitoris. I slipped out of my trousers, yanking my black silk briefs down at the same time. Ella's azure eyes stared intently at my swollen, painfully erect member. Her breath came in rapid gasps as new sweat shone on her contorted body. Breathing okay? I asked, checking the knots around her chest to make sure they weren't too tight. Ella nodded, eyes fluttering closed as she relaxed in her bonds. She dangled like forbidden fruit hanging from a tree, ripe, and sweet and ready to be plucked. For a moment, I walked about her gently swinging form, basking in the glow of having Ella at my mercy. How many times did I fantasize about this exact moment since our breakup? Hell, even when we were together in prep school. I brushed my fingers across her cheek. Ella moved her face to follow, trying to suck on my digits. I allowed her to do so, and her gaze met my own as she suckled intently. It looks like you need to do something with your mouth, I said. Uh-huh, Ella said, nodding around my saliva-slickened fingers. Is that how Cinderella is supposed to respond to her master? I asked. No, sir, she said, her voice muffled by my fingers stuffed into her mouth. That's more like it, I growled. I pulled my fingers from her lips and moved over to a rolling metal cabinet. Ella appeared intently as I unlocked the doors and swung them wide. I removed a paraffin candle in cherry red and a sparking lighter wand. Open, I said, shoving the blunt end of the candle toward her mouth. Ella opened her lips and accepted the candlestick and then some. She began pumping her mouth on it as if it were my rod, moaning softly and trying to tease me. You're such a dirty girl, Cinderella. Oh, yes, sir, she said around the candlestick. That's enough of that for now. I don't want you to wear yourself out before you get the real thing in there. I pushed the candle a bit deeper into her mouth. She gurgled a bit, but accepted it. Now don't let it fall. I moved behind her and pulled her blonde hair into a tight ponytail at the back of her head. She grunted around her candle gag as I pinned her hair back, restraining it as well as the rest of her body. Looping thinner twine around the base of her ponytail and anchoring it to her chest harness, I was able to pull Ella's head back until the candle was held at roughly a 70 degree angle. Her eyes glowed with amusement as I used the sparker to light the candle. Ella chuckled, slobber dribbling down her chin and turning the rope harness dark where it touched. Don't drop it, I warned. She squealed around the candle as the first dollop of hot wax spattered across her bare breast. Otherwise, I'll have to stick another one in your mouth and you can have two candles dripping hot wax all over you. I moved back to the wall and took a black wireless Hitachi wand, unplugging it from an outlet. Ella made a sound somewhere between a chuckle and a whimper of dread. You know your safe word, I said, flicking the wand on. It buzzed so hard I nearly dropped it. I moved it in toward her wide open, dripping snatch as the hot wax continued to spatter on her vulnerable body, spurring a yelp 
groan or sigh from Ella's plugged up mouth every time. I pressed the soft rubber tip of the vibe against her wide open petal blossom. Ella hollered, nearly dropping the candle and slinging a line of sizzling wax across herself. She laughed at her own blunder, but it turned into a determined, strained groan as I plied the wand about in tight, slow circles. Are you ready to come again so soon? I asked. Ella nodded emphatically, which ironically caused her to spatter more wax all over herself. Her white skin was now dotted and streaked with red, drying pools of cooling wax. Then you know what to do. Ask for permission. Ella groaned in frustration, eyeing me in fury. Her azure gaze begged the question of how she was going to ask anything with the candle in her mouth. Figure it out, but don't drop the candle, I said. Come on, Cinderella. You're a smart girl. Ella grunted out a garbled, muffled variation of, Please may I come, sir, that had me grinning. But it was close enough. Come for me, little cunny, I said. Ella cried out, dropping the candle to spiral down and crack in two on the floor, one half still lit. I kept the vibe firmly against her pussy until she finished her thrashing about. Ella panted moaning softly as I removed the wand at last. She watched through glazed, half-lidded eyes as I went over to the wall crank and adjusted her altitude, lowering her by about a foot and a half. Her eyes dawned with the light of realization as I walked back around in front of her. See this, I said, gripping my veined, throbbing shaft. Beg me to fuck you with this cock. Ella groaned, straining against the rope that held her ponytail prisoner. Then she looked at me with a smoldering gaze. Please, sir, she said in a husky, desperate, and guttural voice. Fuck me with your hard cock. Good girl, I said, shoving my crown between her swollen, quivering labia. Ella's mouth flew open her eyes going wide as I glided in, balls deep. Our bodies slapped together and I grabbed the triangle of rope holding her legs suspended in the air, using it as a handhold to control her body as I thrust in. Oh God, Ella gasped, her eyes squeezing tightly shut as I drilled her with long, steady strokes. Oh God, I, I can't, it feels so good. Ella gritted her teeth so tightly, muscles stood out in stark relief on her neck and throat. She managed to gasp out a request through her clenched jaw. Please, may I come? Not yet, I growled, slapping my body into her own even harder. Ella let out a long, undulating wail as she struggled to hold back the tidal forces of her own libidinous desires. Her body strained as if to escape the relentless pounding, but to no avail. Please, she screamed. Please. Come, Cinderella, I said, eyes rolling back in my head as I released a powerful jet of seed inside of her. Ella thrashed about in her suspension rig, crying out with a piercing scream that made my ears ring. I yanked myself out of her. A spurt of pearl jam spattering onto her belly and breasts as I did so. I leaned over her bound body and took her lips, kissing her deeply while she dangled. Slowly, I released her from the bondage layer by layer, rubbing my fingers across the deep indentations left by the rope. Once she was free, we wound up curled on the leather upholstered love seat with the heart-shaped back, not speaking and just enjoying the feel of each other's presence. I felt something stirring in me, the remembrance of old emotion mingling with something new, something primal. I drifted on a pink cloud of ecstasy as I considered the fact that I was falling in love with Ella all over again, more deeply and passionately than I had imagined possible. Chapter 16 Ella 
I lost track of time, cuddling with Derek on the love seat. It's garish design, failing to diminish the sweet moment. We remain like that until the sweat cooled upon our bodies and Derek shifted position. My legs are falling asleep. I chuckled obligingly, kissed him on the cheek, and extricated myself from his lap. Derek rose and stretched like a cat, muscle and sinew playing in defined detail under his smooth skin. We dressed while exchanging knowing smiles, our scents mingled and intertwined in both the air and on our bodies. I was learning to love the way he looked at me, his piercing gray gaze intent with a laser focus. I fascinated him, just as he fascinated me. It's a little different than when we dated in prep school, said as he tied his shoelaces. Just a little, I agreed. But in some ways, it's a lot better. He smiled, but it faded into a sad, wistful expression. What's wrong? I asked, going to him and putting my hands on his chest. It's just, I really wanted to be the one to take your cherry. I patted his chest before stepping back to look him squarely in the eye. I know. Believe it or not, I wanted to give it to you. Really? His eyes widened, an incredulous grin gracing his face. Yes, really. I had it all planned out. I was going to rent a hotel room the night after the homecoming dance. I spent a long time trying to get you the exact dress you wanted, Derek said in a low voice. I stared into his eyes and sighed. I know, I said. I know you did. Look, Derek, we can't change the past. All we can do is... Derek's phone rang with a tone similar to an alarm klaxon. He stiffened as if slapped and hastily dug the device out of his pocket. I'm sorry. I have to take this. Who is it? I inquired. My father, he said in a cold tone. Derek put the phone up to his ear and turned away. Yes, I have. I am. We're at the cottage as we speak. Yes, Jimmy is here, but he's staying in the guest house. That's insulting. I'm not... I haven't even been... No. I promise you, I'm not on the stuff anymore. Well, ask the bull. He poked around every nook and... Derek's anger faded, his face relaxing into placidity. Okay, he replied. Yes, I know the place. Are we expecting trouble? I'll bring Jimmy with me. No, I don't need Will to back me up. Yes, I know he was in the army and is a total badass killing machine, but he's as subtle as a hand grenade. Derek sighed. All right, I'll bring him along too. I... Uh, I love you too, Dad. Derek's face purpled, and I giggled at his expense. Hey... He narrowed his eyes at me. Oh, stop. It's cute that you love your father. I have to love him, Derek said. He's my dad. But sometimes he makes it really, really hard. I'm not like him. I don't have this, this drive to constantly make money and be on top of things. I nodded, slipping my arms around his waist and laying my cheek on his chest. You were always sensitive, morose, self-absorbed. Gee, thanks. There's nothing ostensibly wrong with any of those things, you know. But I'm glad I could make you smile sometimes. He held me close, and I felt warmth spread through my body. But he broke the contact all too soon for my liking. I have to go, he said. Business, you know? I nodded, chewing my lower lip nervously. Be careful, I said. Come back to me in one piece. I will, he said. We kissed, and then he was off, 
rushing up the stairs and dialing the bull as he went. I wound up being alone in the cottage as the sun drifted below the horizon and night fell on the woodland retreat. The night insects chirruped and buzzed as an owl hooted in the distance. I detected the faraway musk of a skunk, which is oddly pleasant when it's not in your immediate vicinity. Restless and bored, I gave the television another shot and figured out the remote layout. As it turned out, one was to turn on the monitor, another was for the streaming device plugged into the USB slot, and a third controlled a sound bar mounted beneath the screen. But even though I got it working, I barely paid attention to what occurred on the screen. My life had been turned upside down in recent days, and if I needed a reminder, the burning healing tattoo on my lower back provided it. I just couldn't get into any of the shows or movies I skimmed through. Sighing, I turned it off again and trudged up to my room for sleep. After an hour of tossing and turning, I went to Derek's room and stole one of his pillows. Then I laid my face on it, basking in his scent, and finally fell off to slumber. When I awakened, my phone told me it was after one in the morning. My free time so to speak. I could hear someone, I assumed it was Derek, playing piano down on the main floor. Been wondering if he still played. At one time, he'd been pretty decent at tickling the ivories. I was under no obligation to attend him. The contract stipulated such, but I felt myself compelled, drawn to him like the proverbial moth to a flame. I put my bare feet on the floor, vaulted out of bed, and dressed in the black satin robe I'd worn before. As I descended the staircase, I looked upon Derek seated at the piano. He was tapping out a melancholy tune I wasn't immediately familiar with, his face drawn and somber. Derek didn't even notice me until I came up in front of him. His eyes darted over to me, and the music ceased but for a fading chord which hummed in the air like a memory fading into ignominy. Derek arched an eyebrow as he regarded me. It's after midnight. Yes, I know. So, you don't have to attend me. Or obey me. You sound disappointed. I leaned over on the piano's highly glossed surface. You come down here in that robe, shaking what you've got. And you wonder why I'm disappointed? Derek chuckled. Sorry if I woke you. No, it's fine, I replied. I always loved hearing you play. You were good. I've gotten a bit rusty, he said, doing a glissando up the scale. I wouldn't know it, I said gently. Do you remember when we used to play together? His face was crossed by a warm smile. Of course I do. You are pretty decent yourself. I don't have your long-ass fingers, I chuckled. But I got by. Derek stared at me for a long, intense moment, his eyes lovely in the low, elegant light. He scooted over on the padded piano bench and patted the surface beside him. I smiled, settling upon the bench next to him. His eyes darted to the expanse of naked thigh thrusting out of the robe, but I didn't mind. I even pointedly crossed my legs and uncrossed them to give him a show. That's not fair, he said with a chuckle. Life seldom is. So, what should we play? Derek pursed his lips, lost in thought for a moment. Then a fierce and joyful grin sprouted on his face as he started pounding out a jaunty tune. I recognized it instantly and laughed before joining in at the appropriate measure. Anything you can do, I can do better, I chirped out, mostly in key. I can do anything better than you. Derek ripped into the next line and we bantered the song batting it back and forth between us like playful kittens with a ball of string. My voice was a bit rusty, but Derek didn't seem to mind. 
By the time we got to the end of the piece, we were laughing more than singing. Oh, God. It's been so long since I sang that hard, I said, holding my throat. I think some puke came up into my neck. Gross. Derek handed me a bottle of somewhat chilled water, which I gratefully accepted. The plastic crinkled with a vacuum as I drained most of it in one go. I hadn't realized I was so thirsty. He seemed to grow thoughtful, tilting his head to the side and staring at me. His eyes brimmed with inquiry, but his lips remained silent. What is it? I asked at length. Why are you looking at me like that? Derek's lips twitched, and I could see he struggled to decide whether to share what was on his mind or not. Ella, he said softly, turning a bit on the bench to face me more fully. After we broke up, did you? His voice trailed off, and his eyes swam with anxiety. Go ahead, Derek, I said, taking his hand in mine. You can ask me. Did you? He licked his lips and struggled again. Did you ever think of me? Even if it was only once. I heaved a heavy sigh, casting my gaze at the ivory and black keys before us. I brushed my finger through a swath of dust, turning the key shiny black again. Yes, Derek. I turned to him and smiled sadly. Yes, I thought about you. A lot. He seemed simultaneously relieved and saddened by my response. Derek cleared his throat before speaking again. And what would you have done if I'd called you? I frowned, shaking my head. I don't know, Derek, I said sadly. I just don't know. Can't you even guess? Not really, I said with a sigh. Why not? He asked his voice growing with petulance. Because I'm not in the same headspace as I was a week ago, okay? I snapped. I don't know. I can't answer that question because honestly, I don't know. Is that, is that okay? Derek nodded. It's okay. I arched an eyebrow at him. So, turnabout is fair play. Did you ever think of me in the last few years? Even once? Derek sighed, unable to meet my gaze. Ella, I never stopped thinking about you. I never stopped missing you. He lifted his gaze to mine, and it was filled with such pain I felt as if an icicle had stabbed me in the gut. I never stopped loving you. My heart pounded in my chest as I swooned with conflicting feelings. Part of me adored that he never stopped loving me, but I was afraid as well. For some reason, anger burbled to the surface and spilled out of my mouth like foam-flecked poison. Love, I sputtered. You want to talk about love? What's the point? The point is how we both feel, he said, trying to take my hand, but I slapped his away. No, it's not. I said, standing up quickly and glaring down at him. No, it's not. Not at all. If love had a damn thing to do with our arrangement, we wouldn't have that fucking contract. Would we? You never even tried to call me, Derek. I was afraid you'd send me away again. Maybe I would have. Love is a risk. Being vulnerable is a risk. You weren't willing to take that risk for years, and I tried to move on. Maybe you didn't, but I tried. You never called me. I thought you'd moved on for certain, but I didn't, he said. I couldn't move on. I wanted you and only you. Well, now you have me, I snapped, livid to the point of sounding hoarse because you bought me like a prize thoroughbred horse at auction. You want to talk about love? Buying someone isn't an act of love. It's an act of possession. 
I didn't even know you were going to be there. I believe you, but it doesn't change anything, I added. You never tried to win me back, and that hurts. I turned and fled up the stairs. Derek called after me several times, coming to the bottom of the staircase. Ella, get back here. You can't boss me around until sunup, I shouted, bitter tears rolling down my cheeks as I fled the man I used to love, and perhaps still did. Chapter 17 Derek I watched with impotent morose helplessness as Ella fled up the stairs and out of sight. I flinched with the sound of her bedroom door slamming shut. Bowing my head, I stood there with one foot on the bottom step, hand on the polished rail for what seemed a long time. Ella had been so angry, so bitter, but I couldn't bring myself to be angry with her in return. After all, she was right. I never had tried to win her back. I had just wallowed in my misery and used her rejection as an excuse to not have to try and feel anything at all any longer. My father, my brothers, and my cousins were all right about me. I'd sunk into a selfish, self-pitying state where I was practically useless on just about every level. No wonder I'd gotten caught up in Kremlin swamp gas and sleeping with women whose faces and names I could not even remember in the light of day. But I'd been content to wallow in misery. I hadn't done anything proactive to bring her back into my life. My God, I could have done a lot more than I did. I could have left my family. Damn near impossible, but I could have gotten it done. I think my father would have backed off eventually and respected my wishes. Not because he agreed with them, but because I was his youngest. Allegedly the spawn of him and his most beloved mistress. Perhaps I was his favorite child. I'd been accused of such often enough by my cousins and brothers. All I knew was I hadn't done everything, absolutely everything I could have to win Ella back. I'd been bitter, angry, and resentful of her perceived abandonment. Did I like being miserable? No. But did I take the easy way out and remain miserable instead of risking my birthright for true love? Yes. Yes, I did. Now Ella was back in my life, but I'd mucked it up again somehow. That contract. That damn contract. When I'd bid upon Ella in the auction, it had seemed something out of a dream. I knew there was no chance of her rejecting me if she was bought and paid for. Lock, stock, and barrel, she belonged to me. But it wasn't enough. I didn't just want her body, no matter what I'd told her the other day. I wanted her heart and soul. I wanted her to love me as much as I loved her, even if I couldn't have put my feelings so succinctly or in those exact words at the time. I wanted her to choose to be with me, rather than being compelled to do so. I grew angry with her, sulking on the steps below. What right did she have to throw that sort of thing up in my face? After all, she never tried to contact me again. Of course, she was the dumper. I was the dumped. The onus was on me to seek her out and try to make amends, but I lacked the confidence to do so when I was a teenager. I almost turned away, intent upon stalking off into the woods with a rifle in search of some hapless woodland creature to vent my frustration upon, but I stopped. I pictured Ella's face in my mind, remembered the exquisite feel of her soft, curved form curled up next to mine. I relished the image of her on her knees, vigorously using her mouth to please me. I couldn't let her go. Not again. If there was a way out of this mess, I was going to find it or die trying. Instead of giving up again, I willed my foot to lift up and plant itself on the next step. It took considerable effort. Most of my life, I'd fled from emotional danger even while not taking physical danger seriously enough. When the going got tough, I got going. But no longer. 
I lifted my opposite foot and planted it on the next step. Every stair I took grew easier until I was moving in a normal pace up the steps. I did not know what was waiting for me at the top. Perhaps Ella would be cruel and wound me with her barbed words and invectives. Maybe she would laugh in my face when I tried to express my true feelings. But not going up the steps, not facing those fears, and never knowing what her love felt like again was scarier by far. I'd been down that road once. I was not eager to repeat the experience. I paced down the hallway several times, moving back and forth, while I worked up the nerve to go to her door. Perhaps I should just back off and give her some space, I thought. But then I recalled how that had worked out the last time. No, there would be no backing off. There would be no giving her space unless she emphatically and in no uncertain terms demanded it. I had to try. I had to make myself vulnerable. I needed to show my throat to my slave girl. I headed over to her door and lifted my hand to knock. My fist wavered in the air, drooping to my waist several times, but I stubbornly raised it again on each and every occasion. I took a deep breath, tried to will my heart rate to slow without much success, and rapped on her door. Go away, Ella said, her voice muffled by something, perhaps a pillow she lay face down upon. Ella, can we talk? I asked softly. It's after midnight. The sun's not up. You can go fuck yourself. Ella, I sighed and put my back against her door. I deserve that. I'm not sure why I ever thought that owning your body would be enough. Because you're an arrogant, pompous ass, she replied, though her voice wavered a little. The bed springs creaked, and tiny footsteps padded over to the door, though it remained closed. Her voice came again, a bit louder now with proximity. And you think money solves everything? I used to. I lowered my gaze to the floor. But not anymore. Money may have bought your body, but it can never bring me your heart. I understand that now. I'm sorry I made you feel like a piece of property. Silence. And then, do you really mean that? Or are you just trying to get me to stop being mad at you? I really mean it. Even I was surprised at the conviction in my tone. Ella, the truth is, well, my voice grew tight and it was hard to breathe. I squeezed my eyes shut and struggled with my own twisted mind. It was hard, so hard, to open up to anyone, even Ella. But I had to do this. I had to, or I was going to lose her in every way that really mattered, contract or no contract. I'm listening, Derek, Ella said softly. There was no rancor in her voice, no note of impatience or accusation, but overtones of hope. She wanted me to tell her what I felt. I... I don't know if I can live without you, I said, sliding down the door to my bottom. It was as if the weight of the entire world were pressing me down, grinding me under its heel like a modern-day atlas. I know that sounds crazy, like emotional blackmail, but it's true. You lived just fine without me for years, Ella said stiffly through the door. I survived, but I didn't live. Can't you understand? My voice rose an octave with my roiling emotion. I didn't live. I need you to live like green things need the sun. Otherwise, I'll wither up into a husk again. She was silent for a time, and then... I don't know how to take that, Derek. I really don't. You're putting a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. No, I said. I'm not trying to burden you with a sense of obligation or guilt you into pretending you care. I just, I know my family manipulated things, all right? The man who contacted you sounded an awful lot like a guy who works for the firm named Gentleman Starkey. And the auction took place at the Jolly Roger, which is owned by my cousin Peter's girl, Belle. There were an awful lot of coincidences, she said, with a trace of mirth seasoning her bitterness. Yes, quite a lot. But you know what? I can't bring myself to be mad. 
Because however fucked up the methods were, however much of a mess I've made of things since you came back into my life, I just... I wish you wanted to be with me as much as I've wanted to be with you. I heard the doorknob rustle as it turned in her hand. Moving away and struggling to my feet, I turned to face Ella in her silk bathrobe, a plaintive, longing look in her eyes. I went to her, and we embraced tightly. Wordlessly, we moved to the bed and lay down together, I on my back and she on her side, head nestled against my shoulder. I stroked her soft, silken hair, just basking in the glow of our shared presence. I should have called you, I said at length. Yes, she said, but I should have called you too. She sighed softly and snuggled up against me. You're useless without me. I don't entirely buy that. You're a smart, tough guy, Derek, but I'm glad to hear you never stopped caring about me. I never stopped caring about you either. Yes, but... My voice broke as I struggled to ask the next question. But do you still love me? Ella shifted at my side, swallowing hard before she spoke again. I, d I don't want to answer that right now, she said. I'm sorry. Please understand. Okay, I said, unable to keep the disappointment out of my tone. Please ask me again later, she said. Don't be mad. I'm not mad, I said, pulling her in tightly against me. We dozed off like that, clothed but more intimate than we'd been perhaps ever. My last thoughts as I drifted to sleep were that this must be what heaven felt like. I already knew what hell felt like. Hell was the absence of Ella. I would do whatever it took to keep her lovingly at my side. Whatever it took. Chapter 18 Ella The warm sun basted my left cheek in its cheery but annoying glow as I nestled next to Derek. I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to keep sleeping, awash in his warmth and scent. But the asshole sun wouldn't relent. In fact, it scrawled its light farther across my face into my eye. I had to surrender and rise from the bed, casting a bemused smile at the slumbering Derek who had flung an arm over his own eyes and now snored softly. I went into the bathroom and answered the call of nature before brushing my teeth. On a whim, I turned about and looked at my glass slippers tattoo. It seemed garishly bright beneath the plastic wrap. Gingerly, I peeled the plastic away, feeling the sudden cool air on my recently perforated skin. Hissing, I rubbed some of the more thick, viscous, and faintly chicken-smelling emu oil on the design and then covered it with fresh wrap. As I returned to the bedroom proper, Derek continued his slumber. I sat on the edge of the bed and just watched him for a while. I recalled our conversation through the door last night, when he'd finally opened up to me. Derek had shown me his softer, more vulnerable side, and that made me feel very special indeed, because I knew he was closed off with everyone else, even his family. No, especially his family, who were often cast in the role of antagonist in his dealings with them and their minions. I had told the truth when I said I wasn't ready to answer his question, because I was afraid to deeply examine it myself. It was like a floater in my eye. I feared that to try and pin down my feelings and scrutinize them would only cause them to retreat out of sight despite my frantic efforts. So, at that point, I wasn't ready to even consider whether or not I loved Derek, but I knew I was falling for him all the same. Falling for him even harder and faster than the first time. Falling even more completely because now we were both adults and could express our feelings in adult ways. I looked down at his groin, grinning from ear to ear at his morning wood. Speaking of adult ways to show my affection, 
I paused with my hands near his zipper. Technically, the sun was up, and I wasn't supposed to touch him without permission. However, I just couldn't resist. Besides, I looked forward to what he would come up with to punish me for my actions. With care, I undid the brass button on his gray trousers and unzipped the fly. I checked his face, but he was still out, soft snores emanating from his slightly parted lips. Eagerly, with a devious grin on my lips, I returned to my submissive mischief. His cock was warm and stiff with a big jagged vein squirming across its engorged length. I put the crown in my mouth and raised my gaze toward his face. Derek didn't stir immediately, so I began lapping my tongue with slow, sensual strokes around his swollen head. His arm moved away from his face. Bleary eyes opened and then focused on me. A smile spread across his lips, and he stretched his arms out over his head, luxuriating in my attentions. I think that's the best wake-up call I've ever had, he murmured in a loving voice still thick with sleep. In response, I looked him dead in the eye as I deep-throated him, gagging as his rod slammed into the back of my throat. I maintain control of myself, however, if not my composure. I so enjoyed being dirty. Slowly, I pumped my head up and down on his cock, making plenty of coos and moans to let him know how much fun I was having. Derek groaned, his hand going to the back of my head. I exulted in his touch, spurred on to more eager slurping of his throbbing rod. I wanted to please him so very much. I wanted him to feel as good physically as his opening up had made me feel emotionally the prior evening. I felt his rod stiffen to rock hardness and then shiver and throb as it exploded in a font of salty seed into my mouth. I gurgled a bit, but didn't pull my mouth off of him. I drank down his cum with gusto and then carefully licked his member clean of every last drop. My tongue bath kept him from softening over much, and he had returned to rigidity by the time he recovered enough to speak. I approve of your choice to waken me in such a manner, Derek said. So much so that you will not be punished for touching me without permission. Ah, I said petulantly, pouting my sticky lips. You're taking all the fun out of it. He chuckled and then stroked a lock of my hair out of my eyes gently. Maybe I can change my mind then. I shrugged and batted my eyelashes. You're the master. Whatever you decide to do, I'll just have to accept it. Won't I? Derek licked his lips and bent at the waist, rising into a sitting position. He took my wrists and forced them together. I fought him a little because I thought it was fun, chuckling as he firmly overcame me with brute strength. He grabbed a necktie off the nightstand, the one he'd worn to the auction. I purred as he used it to lash my wrists together in front of me. He gave the silken knot a firm tug and then used it like a leash to drag me to my feet. Come with me, he said tugging me along by the impromptu leash. Giggling, I half ran in his wake as he set a quick pace. He kept throwing a happy grin over his shoulder as he challenged me to keep up. I thought he was taking me back to the playroom, which I had been hoping for on many levels after my sublime experience dangling in suspension the day before, but he veered into his bedroom instead. Derek pulled me over to his bed and shoved me down on my back. My heart thudded against my ribcage like a hummingbird as he tied the slack from the tie to his chrome headboard. He patted my cheek gently and then suddenly slapped me with a stinging impact. I gasped, my pussy throbbing from his easy, almost casual domination. He moved off the bed 
yanking down the curtain cords and dropping the drapes to block most of the early morning sunlight. Derek then moved to the foot of the bed and took one ankle in his grasp. Laughing, I fought him as he tried to draw my foot over to the left bottom bedpost, though I knew it was a futile gesture. Derek had trouble getting me under control, mostly because he couldn't stop laughing either. Eventually, he lay down on top of my leg, pinning it beneath his body and used one of the cords to lash my ankle to the bed. You're asking for it, he said playfully, wagging a finger at me. Oh, I'm begging for it, I purred. Are you going to give it to me? I blinked my eyes and smiled sweetly. His response was to grin and then grab my other ankle. I didn't fight him this time as he spread my legs wide apart and tied me down like a deer across a truck grill. Oh, I said as he lay down between my splayed thighs and caressed my quivering mons. Oh, that feels nice. If this is your idea of punishment, I think you're doing it wrong. Derek glanced up at me, a light in his eyes that seemed to say, Oh, is that so? Grinning, he carefully kissed my outer labia, his breath hot and heavy over my shivering flesh, before squirming out from between my legs and getting to his feet. He disappeared into his closet, and I heard a ring of metal on metal. Derek returned to my sight, pulling a sweater off of a hanger and approaching me. For a moment, in spite of my trust in him, I feared he was going to whip me with the wire hanger, which did not sound pleasant or sexy at all. But then he held the horizontal straight bar over my breasts, and I noted it had built-in clamps for keeping garments fixed in place. Mean-looking metal clamps, but I thought I could handle it. He noticed my trepidation and pulled the hanger away for a moment. You know what to say if you reach your limit? Dream on, I grinned. I told you I'm not fragile. Yes, but these are mean, he said, springing open the clamps menacingly. You might change your tune after you feel their bite. Can't be worse than you tugging on my nipples yesterday. I pursed my lips thoughtfully. Or should I say, can't be any better? Derek arched an eyebrow and then took my left nipple between his thumb and forefinger. He flattened my pink, swollen areola out in his grasp, eliciting a hiss from behind my clenched teeth. Derek sprang the attached clamp open and then settled it slowly about my tender flesh, trapping it in an inexorable steel embrace. He let go, allowing the full pressure to clamp down. I made a long, high-pitched groan as I struggled to endure the pain. It hurt, a lot more than his pinching fingers had. But after a few moments, I came to the conclusion that I could, in fact, endure it. I could endure it for him. Here comes the next, he teased. Are you sure you don't have something to tell me? Yes, I do have something to tell you, I said, smiling even though the smarting nipple brought tears to the corners of my eyes. Bring it on. Derek arched an eyebrow and then took my other nipple prisoner in his fingers. He was far less gentle than he had been clipping the first one. I moaned softly as he hooked a finger in the curved top of the hanger and applied tension. My nipples stretched, the clamps bit down tighter, and I let out a yelp of agony. Oh, fuck, that hurts. You know what to say. Yes, more, sir. Tug on it some more. Derek lifted the hanger upward, and I hissed as the clamps tightened even more. Starbursts of pain throbbed out from my tortured nubs. Derek kept up the pressure even as he climbed between my thighs once more. He gave me one last inquisitive glance before he buried his face in my crotch. 
Oh, fuck, I moaned as his tongue slipped into my gash and lapped at the quivering pink walls within. He encompassed my entire clitoris, hood and all, within his soft lips and massaged it insistently, but not painfully. My eyes rolled back in my head as he sucked on my clit, lifting its spongy mass up and away, distending the connecting pink tissue. Derek slurped wetly, making num-num sounds as if he dined on a sweet, decadent birthday cake. Even as he teased my nether region, he tormented my tender nipples, areolas and all. Derek jerked upward on the hanger from time to time, causing the pain to increase. He often timed this to a particularly enthusiastic suckling of my clitoris. The juxtaposition of pain and pleasure made the line between them blur, fading into a muddy morass where up was down and left was right. Derek played my body with the same precise aplomb he had the piano the previous night. He created a symphony of soft, ecstatic cries and sharp screams of agony, low coos of suffering, and high shrieks of pleasure. I thrashed around in my bonds, barely able to form articulate speech as I pleaded for release. Please, sir, can I come? Derek mumbled something into my pussy, but I couldn't accept it as permission unless I was sure. Oh, God. Please? Please let me come. Derek spoke into my clitoris, not removing his lips from my body fully. Yes, come for me. I screamed, wriggling and writhing and arching my back as he tugged harder than ever on the hanger. The clamps bit deeply, ferociously, Pain seasoning my ecstasy as I endured a cluster of orgasms under Derek's adroit oral manipulations. When I settled back down, panting and sweating and shivering with the aftershocks, Derek moved up to remove the clamps from my nipples. I whimpered, knowing they'd hurt worst of all in those eternal few seconds after removal. Be a brave girl for me, Cinderella, Derek said his face glistening with my juices. Yes, sir, I gasped. He removed the clamps and I clamped my jaw shut on a scream. I settled for groaning as the blood rushed back into my tortured nubs. Good girl. I thought he would free my hands, but instead he bent my legs, folding them at the knee and tied the slack off around my thigh. My legs were now pinned as if I were in a kneeling position. What are you going to do to me next? I purred. Whatever I want, he said in a low, sexy growl. I nearly came just from the sound of his voice. I had never felt freer to be me while tied hand and foot on his bed at Derek's mercy. Chapter 19 Derek. Where are you going? Ella asked, a touch of alarm in her voice as I walked toward the door. Nowhere, I replied, closing it tightly and latching it. Jimmy knew better than to go in the playroom or even on the bottom level, but I wouldn't put it past him to do some snooping on the upper floors just to make sure I was staying clean. I hadn't thought for a moment about falling off the wagon ever since I bought Ella in the auction. He really shouldn't worry, but locking the door ensured our privacy. Of course, Ella made a lot of noise, and if Bull heard us, well, he was no blushing virgin. I returned to the bed, staring down at Ella, her legs folded and bound into a frog tie. She grinned up at me her skin still flush from her recent climaxes. What are you going to do to me now? You'll find out soon enough. I grabbed her legs. Ella's sharp intake of breath accompanied my flipping her onto her belly, the anchoring necktie twisting between her wrists and the bed frame. 
She now lay vulnerable and exposed, her pink slit glistening with moisture below the dark star of her forbidden passage. I reached under my bed, hoping to find a particular box. My lips spread in a grin as I dragged it out. The shoebox was from a shop which had sadly closed down several years ago. Gentrification. What can you do? But what I removed from the box was not a shoe. What is that? Ella's voice rose an octave in alarm as she beheld the lightweight metal ball-capped hook in my hand. And more importantly, where are you planning on sticking it? Are you scared, Cinderella? I asked gently. A little, yes, she answered honestly. I just want to know what it does. It's an anal hook, I said, tapping the chrome sphere affixed to the end. Does that answer your question? Oh, God, Ella moaned, biting her own shoulder and gyrating her hips rhythmically into the sheets. That ball is so big. Actually, this is the smallest of the three attachments, I said. Ella's eyes widened as she beheld the device. No doubt her imagination swam with estimations of just how big the spheres got. Are you going to use it on me now? She asked, a bit of a tremble in her voice. I'm considering it, I nodded. But I need to explore you thoroughly before I make my decision. Explore? In response, I dove between her splayed thighs, hands gripping the cusp of the tight binding cord and plump, bubbled flesh. My face went right in her crack. She moaned as I stroked my tongue across her dark star. I grinned as it puckered up and then relaxed as if inviting me back for seconds. Oh, sir, Ella said, her voice strained as I spread her cheeks widely. I've never had anyone do that to me before. Then you've been deprived, I said frankly. You have a cute ass and it deserves to be eaten. Oh, fuck, Ella gasped. You're so dirty, Derek. Hey, I said sternly. She cried out as I spanked her firmly on the left cheek, making it dance and flush pink. What do you call me when we're playing? Sorry, you're so dirty, sir. That's better. I buried myself in my task, figuratively and literally. My adoration for Ella was such that I wanted to devour, explore, and conquer every inch of her. Even this taboo place would be mine. She would have no secrets from me, and I would have none from her. That feels so nice, Ella said with a blissful sigh. I never thought... Oh, dear, sir, I love the things you do to me. I pried her mons open with my free hand and my fingers splaying her moist hole wide. She moaned when my fingers slipped inside her pink center. As I plied my digits about in slow, sensual swirls, I could feel them occasionally pressing against my invading tongue through the thin membrane of flesh separating them. Please, sir, may I come? She wailed. I lifted my mouth from between her sweet cheeks long enough to blurt, Come. Ella shoved her face in the pillow and screamed several times, her body heaving as it sucked in great gusts of air. A spurt of juice splashed between my fingers and onto the mattress. Taking the hook in my hand, I applied a generous amount of lube to the sphere before pressing it against her well-licked dark star. Ella hissed as the sphere stretched her wider than my fingers or tongue had yet. It's so big, she gasped. Are you okay, Cinderella? I asked. More lube, sir? Of course. I applied more, working it about with my finger. Ella shuddered as I resumed the insertion process. You take such good care of me, sir. Ella pushed through gritted teeth. She gasped and sighed as the sphere made it in past her ring of muscle at last. I inserted the hook fully and then left it laying flush against her lower back as I went to the headboard. Ah, 
Ella said with disappointment as I untied the necktie from the headboard. Don't speak too soon. I pulled the necktie back over her head. This forced Ella to put her bound wrists behind her head, and I made sure they remained there by tying the necktie off to the convenient ring in the end of the anal hook buried in her ass. This is diabolically clever, Ella murmured. Oh my god, sir, oh my god, I can't believe you've done this to me. I feel like a, a violated pretzel. We both laughed, and I slapped her firmly on the bottom, which, of course, caused the hook to move around inside of her. Ella moaned, and I caressed her reddening flesh. It gets better. Up on your knees. Oh, come on, Ella said with a helpless laugh. How am I supposed to do that? I don't know, but it's going to be fun watching you try, I said, grabbing my stiffening rod. I'm going to jerk off while you struggle. If you can't make it to your knees before I come, you'll be punished. <laughs> Sir is an asshole, Ella said with a boisterous laugh. <sighs> she rocked back and forth on the mattress until she wound up on her side. Ella checked my progress, noticing that I was at full mast with anchors away. Mm, she said, licking her lips. Sir has an excellent cock. I'm getting pretty close. You better hurry, I said in a strained voice. You're being counterproductive. Am I? Who says I don't want to be punished? Ella muttered, thrusting out her tongue. She arched her back forward, bringing her knees to her chest. Then she rolled over onto her legs and straightened up into a perfect kneel. The hook made that so much harder. That was the point. I climbed up onto the bed with her, lying down on my back adjacent to where she knelt. I put my hands behind my head, my erect member pointing up like a sundial. Arrogantly, I gestured at my rod. Get up on my cock, Cinderella, I said. Midnight's a long way off, and do you belong to me? Ella's eyes narrowed, glazed over with lust. The hook was working its magic, stimulating the nerves in her G-spot, which had her wide open and eager to encompass me within her warm embrace. But I had not made it easy on her. Then she half sneered, half grinned, and started inching her way toward me on her knees. She yelped as the hook dug more snugly into her body, but persevered until she managed to straddle me. You're most of the way there. I stared up past her magnificent breasts to her sweating, straining face. Ella struggled to get to one knee, falling down several times. On the fourth try, she remained in the precariously balanced position, her wide-open pussy hovering right over my glistening crown. I took pity on her and grabbed my shaft, helping to guide it inside. Ella slid down on top of me, her eyes fluttering closed and her jaw dropping open. Good girl, I said, stroking her recently tormented nipples. Now that you've made it, I want you to swivel those hips like a dirty, sleazy stripper slut. Give me a decent hump. Ella leered down at me biting her lower lip and chuckling low and sultry in her throat. Oh, sir, she said. I'm going to do so much more than just give you a decent hump. I'm going to fuck your brains out. With that, she shot her hips out with piston-like power, working within the confines of her many restraints, but still controlling her core with aplomb. My eyes widened, mouth flying open to allow a surprised and lusty grunt to escape. Do you like that, sir? She asked between pants, staring down at me with a kind of fierce, lusty determination. I couldn't answer. I tried, my mouth opened, but all that came out was a strangled, inarticulate grunt. Ella had been holding out on me before. She had done some training down there for certain. She tightened herself around my rod with surprising strength, rocking and swiveling her hips in sync to milk me like a dairy cow. My hands flew up to her breasts, crushing them in my grip. I 
thought if I distracted her, she might show me mercy, but no. It only seemed to spur her to greater vigor, riding me like I were a winged stallion and she a fierce Valkyrie. The tighter I dug my fingers into her tender tit flesh, the harder she rode me. Though she was tied hand and foot with a metal hook buried in her ass, I was very much her prisoner in that moment. I lost track of how many times I spurted off inside of her talented love tunnel. Her tight grip on my shaft kept the blood from running out, an organic virtual conquering. She asked for permission to come at least ten times, and I was starting to wonder if I'd created a monster when she finally began to slow down. She still rode me for several more minutes, but eventually, she collapsed on top of me, panting and cooing and kissing me all over my face and neck. Was that decent, sir? She asked, licking me behind my ear. All I could do was laugh in utter, complete, blissful helplessness. She knew well what the answer was, just as she knew that was all I could muster at the moment. I'm not a religious man, but in that moment, I did believe in heaven on earth. Chapter 20 Ella it took some convincing, but Derek agreed that we needed more to eat than just military rations. A 90-minute round trip for food seemed excessive, and ate into the time we shared together. After the first few days, the midnight roll vanished like water on a hot griddle. I slept in his room, when we slept at all, that is. Jimmy the Bull had by and large given up on trying to catch Derek in the act with drugs, and self-isolated in the guest house. That freed Derek and me up to, ahem, explore. After a few days, I couldn't go to a single place in that woodland palace that didn't make me blush with the memory of our sensual adventures. I learned I was a lot more flexible than I thought, both physically and mentally. It wasn't like it was when we were chased teens. It was so much better. Now we could share everything, and boy, did we ever. My tattoo was healing nicely, thanks to the application of emu and other exotic oils, and Derek's top care regimen. I was starting to warm up to the tat. The design was undeniably beautiful, and since he'd named me his Cinderella, well, it seemed appropriate. When I was a kid, I hated that nickname. Hated it with a passion. I'd even bloodied a nose or two in the girls' locker room, if you catch my meaning. But when Derek said that name, it was with such a mix of tenderness and lust that I couldn't help but love the endearment. I loved being his Cinderella. I loved being his. Period. Derek and I explored more and more of the devices and implements in the playroom, some I liked better than others, but despite Derek pushing me to my limits, I never used my safe word. On a cloudy morning while I whisked up a batch of waffle mix, Derek looked over at me and dropped a bombshell. So, I'm having a get-together tonight. Get-together? I asked. It's like a thing. Derek gestured in the air as he tried to compose his thoughts. Can you be vaguer? Derek chuckled, spitting out a blast of orange juice from his nose. Laughing, I handed him a napkin as he eyed me ruefully. You can spank me for it later, I said, turning my bottom toward him and wiggling enticingly. I should point out that I wore an apron and nothing else at that point, and he didn't even have that much on either. Consider it a promise he said firmly, steepling his hands. So, this thing tonight is my dad's way of trying to get me to reconnect to the family. Blood and otherwise. I've sort of withdrawn for a few years. I didn't feel guilty exactly at the knowledge I was responsible for that withdrawal. But regretful. 
Regret that I denied us both this glorious thing we had going between us. I understand, I said. You need to impress them, yes? Derek nodded. I've already got the best caterer in New York handling the food. Hired servants, valets, a hostess. How rich are you? I blurted. How rich are we, you mean? He asked with a shrug. I've got seven accounts. And most of the time, I can't spend them fast enough to deplete the interest earned alone. Crime pays plenty, like you said. I sighed and shook my head. It's not something I'm entirely comfortable with, I said slowly. The family business, I mean. But I'm getting there. Is that okay? Of course it's okay, Derek said. It's a lot to take. I'm sorry I got so mad at you for breaking up with me. I should have tried to see it from your point of view. I looked at him suddenly as I closed up the waffle maker and flipped it over. A smile stretched my lips as I took in the sight of him. What? Derek said, arching an eyebrow at both my long scrutiny and silence. You're sitting straighter, I said. Your posture has improved and you look... Well... You look happy. I am happy, he said, his gaze growing intense. Ella, I've been thinking, and maybe I got so hung up on you because we were meant for each other. I mean, our lives fell apart when we were separated, right? I frowned, turning back to fiddle with the waffle maker even though it was on a timer and didn't need any fussing. You were living in a condo partying it up while I was working three jobs. My life didn't fall apart, thank you very much. I didn't mean... I held up a hand, pursing my lips. I'm sorry, I said with a sigh. I know you didn't mean it that way, but remember, I'm not fragile and never have been. No, you're not, he said with a sigh of contented wonder. A thought occurred to me and I turned sharply toward him. Uh, is this going to be a formal get-together? You could say that. Not tuxes or black tie only, but traditionally people dress to the nines. Well, I said looking at his cell phone, I'm not sure what time this shindig is supposed to start, but we'd better move quickly if we're going to get me a dress. A dress? He echoed. Yes, a dress. I can hardly attend this affair in a leather harness, or a schoolgirl uniform, or whatever that ensemble I had on last night was. Slave princess of Jabba the Hutt, Derek said. And you raise an excellent point. I'll have a car brought over straight away. I slid into skinny jeans and a simple knit top and sensible heels. Shopping meant a lot of walking whether Derek realized it or not. If I was going to be allowed to purchase a dress and money was no object, I was going to push it to the limit. We went to roughly seven shops. I lost exact count after four. Looking for the right dress, I settled on a floor-length aqua blue sequined affair with a slit up to my waist. There would be no wearing underwear of any kind in that dress. I knew I would have to step carefully, lest I give someone a peep at a body part that belonged to Derek. But it fit me well, and Derek's jaw dropped the first time he saw me in it. So I figured it was money well spent. With my dress in a paper garment bag with the store's logo emblazoned upon its broad surface, we drove back to the Woodland Retreat. We had to wait for a landscaping crew to move out of our way. They were tidying up the weeds and laying fresh gravel in preparation for the guests due to arrive later. Derek and I soon discovered that it was a full-time job managing the caterers, DJ. Derek actually hired a DJ for a get-together. Bartenders, valets, and waitstaff. They were consummate professionals, but they had to be shown where to set up, where to get supplies, and so on. By the time we got everything squared away, the first guests arrived. 
a blade thin but wiry young man with an impish grin and a blonde with pouty lips clinging to his arm like he was an oppositely charged magnet. Ella, Derek said, gesturing toward them. Allow me to introduce my cousin, Peter, and his fiancée, Belle. Nice to meet you, Peter, I greeted. Belle and I have already met. She hugged me, and I felt the warmth emanating from her slender body. I'm glad you've settled in, Ella, she said. So, Ella, Peter said. What have you been up to since prep school? Oh, this and that, I answered. Working myself to death at three jobs while my bitch stepmother spent my father's assisted living money on shit she ordered from Amazon. The usual. Peter winced. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I shook my head. I don't know where that came from. Excuse me. I left them and went to the bar. After a stiff shot of whiskey, I regained some of my composure. A lot of mobsters would be at the party tonight. I had to accept this, and I tried my best to deal with my new reality. Over time, more guests arrived. Derek's cousin Will, a broody and muscular young man, seemed to intimidate everyone except the feisty red-headed Scarlet, his bride-to-be. There was the well-dressed, venerable but imposing Joe, an Indian man who Derek claimed taught him how to fight. A goofy but massive button man, as Derek referred to him, named of all things Kermit, proved to be one of the more approachable of the bunch. That was, until he casually mentioned how unrealistic cinema depictions of sniping were, in far more detail than any layperson could have ever explained. The party wore on, and I grew more anxious. This was the criminal element I had sought to avoid. But no one was carrying a body bag or whipping out Tommy guns to do a hit. In a lot of ways, they seemed like people. Not ordinary people, to be sure, but still human beings and not scary monsters. As Derek's, what, girlfriend? Slave girl? It was my job to function as a secondary hostess. I was used to this from my time in the restaurant industry, but it grew exhausting quickly. I met so many new people, I couldn't possibly keep track of them all. The tennis court was turned into extra parking, and the nets removed as more and more guests arrived. Quiet woodland retreat? Not tonight it wasn't. Eventually, I had to get away. I headed up to the rooftop deck and sighed in the moonlight. My head swam with names and faces that I struggled to recall in any form of detail. Things had been so much simpler, so much easier, when just me and Derek were in the house. Or perhaps, I should say, when Cinderella and Sir were alone. There you are. Derek strode to my side, the cedars creaking under his weight. There you are, I countered. It's such a cliché thing to say. Like, where else would I be? He chuckled and stood next to me by the rail, looking down at the party below, which had spilled into the garden and poolside area. I missed you at the party, so I went searching for you. I guess I was saying it to myself. Oh, there you are. Right? Fair enough, I replied. My brow furrowed and he leaned over to look at my face intently. What's wrong? It was just a bit much, that's all. Too many new people, too much booze. I don't know. I sighed. Would you think I was a terrible person if I said I can't wait for this to end? Are you kidding? He laughed and shook his head. You took the words right out of my mouth. I can't wait till everyone goes home. I leaned against him, and he put his arm around my shoulders. A gentle night breeze stirred my hair as we watched the guests revel. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Derek? I asked softly. That the valets have been on break for an awful long time? He grumbled. No, you jerk, 
I said, slapping him on the ribs hard enough he yelped. Never mind now. Derek rubbed his side, and then his eyes grew intensely somber. He took me by my arms and pulled me in close to him. Ella, I love you, he said in a trembling voice. I never stopped loving you. But I love you even more now than I thought possible. It hit me like a slap. It was all too sudden, too real. The mobster party, hitmen casually talking shop, and now? This. Derek's newest declaration of love couldn't have come at a worse time for me. Tears sprang into my eyes. I shoved away from him and fled down the steps, choosing to go down the set in front of the retreat to avoid people. Derek called my name several times, but the shock of my departure anchored him in place. Or perhaps it was the sting of perceived rejection. I don't know what happened to me next because no sooner did I set foot down on the front porch than I sensed something was wrong. The valet station had been set up beside the short flight of steps leading to the circle drive, but no one was in evidence. That was when a hand clamped over my mouth and stout arms encircled my waist. A muffled scream barely reached my own ears as something soft, folded, and white fell over my face. The sound of the party faded into a dull roar, and then I knew nothing but blackness. Chapter 21 Derek I remained frozen in place for what seemed an eternity after Ella fled from my declaration of love, but I was utterly discombobulated by her reaction. It hadn't been planned, not in the least. I just looked into her eyes, so beautiful in the moonlight, and those fateful words came burbling up to the surface, issuing from my mouth like a geyser. Had I scalded Ella with my font of passion? Why would she break into tears? Did she not love me back? I decided that had to be the cause of her crying, but I didn't want her to flee into the woods and be injured. I'll give chase, I thought. I would chase her down and keep her safe and tell her it was okay if she didn't love me back. I ran to the edge of the roof, hoping to catch a glimpse of where she might have gone, and got far more than I had bargained for or even imagined. A pair of robust, shaven-headed men wearing ill-fitting tuxes manhandled a limp and lifeless Ella into the back of a nondescript, gray, four-wheel drive extended cab pickup. I screamed her name and rushed for the steps. Even as I turned the first bend, I knew I would be too late. It was bad manners for the host of a soiree like the one I held that night to go about armed. I don't know what I thought I was going to do when I reached the ground if they happened to have guns, which they likely did. As I turned on the second landing, one of the men rolled down the window and sneered right at my face. He held something out, small and shimmering in the moonlight. A glass slipper. My gut bottomed out, a feeling of palpable dread darkening my thoughts. They knew about her new tattoo, and perhaps much more. This was not a random act, I realized. He tossed the slipper onto the steps leading up to the manor. It shattered into a hundred pieces, each one catching and refracting the silvery moonlight. They crunched under my foot as I dashed into the lane after the truck as it roared away. Where in the hell were the guards? I chased the truck until I could no longer see the taillights, screaming at them to come back, to give her back because she was mine. I stumbled over a clump of grass neglected by the groundskeepers and sprawled onto my belly in the gravel lane. I slammed my fists into the ground in a fit like an angry toddler. Continuing to spew threats and invectives, I dug my fingernails through the gravel, disregarding any pain and clawing at the earth itself as if I would make it pay for their sins. Derek! Hey, Derek! Peter jogged up next to me. Get up, man. Don't let anybody see you losing your shit like this. You're a main. She's gone, I said in a guttural voice. My throat felt thickened with rage. 
So much that I could barely speak. She's gone. We'll get her back, Peter assured me. Come on, get up, get up. He helped me to my feet just as Will joined us. Will may have been the biggest and strongest, but he was also the slowest, though not in the head. Is he hurt? Will asked Peter, apparently believing I was too hysterical to reason with. Perhaps I was. I don't think so. Peter turned to me. Are you hurt, Derek? I'm fine. I told them both, having recovered some of my composure. My initial terror and panic had turned to cold anger. I would find the men who dared steal the love of my life and punish them, and not in a good way like in the playroom. I would punish them as Lucifer punished sinners in hell. I would get Ella back, and they would all be dead. We have to go after them. Where in the fuck are the guys watching the gate? Peter looked about. Will shook his head, lips a thin, tight line. Beyond caring how pissed off you are, Will said flatly. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a crumpled paper. Found this in one of their mouths. I snatched it out of his hand. Standard ransom note bullshit. Thirty million dollars by midnight tomorrow or she dies, instructions to follow. Not one iota of evidence to tie it to any single person or organization. Do you think it's the Olafs? Peter asked. No, Will said. The crocodile wouldn't risk doing something this overt because he knows it would start a war. Then who? I asked. My gut now a hollow pit of despair. Someone either too stupid or too angry to know or care that they just signed their own death warrant, Will murmured. I say we call Lucy. He'll figure out who's behind this. Lucian is kind of pissed at me right now. Peter scratched the back of his head. I'd rather not be around when you talk to him. What the fuck did you do now? Will sighed, rolling his eyes. I gave the Jolly Roger back to Belle. You fucking idiot. Look who's talking. At least I didn't take on 30 Russians with a pop gun. It was only a dozen, and it was a nine mil. More than enough in my hands. Hey, I interrupted the brothers bickering. Quit comparing dicks. My girl's gone. She's gone, guys. My voice quivered, bordering on hysterics again, and Peter put his arm around my shoulder. Hold it together, Derek, he said. Let's go back to the house. You call the old man. Will and I'll disperse the party guests. They'll understand. Don't let Joe leave, I said suddenly, anxious for the Native American's brand of justice. Wouldn't dream of it. He wouldn't leave if I told him to anyway. Only Lucian could keep him from indulging his sadistic thirst for violence and mayhem. Will, do you want in on this? I asked my cousin. Will shook his head. Sorry, Derek, but they might be targeting all the main women. I want to stay with Scarlet. How about this? Peter said. Me and Belle will take her to the New Jersey safe house, hit the mattresses. Just one gun? Will said. Belle's a hell of a shot, man. Every bit as capable in a fight as me, Peter said. And we'll take Jimmy the Bull along, too. Does that put your mind at ease? I guess so, Will said. All right, Derek, I'm your man. Go make the call while I head back to my place and pick up the tools of the trade. You've been keeping up your target practice? Not so much, I said ashamedly. No big deal. Lucian always said you inherited the eye. The eye is a bunch of bullshit, Peter countered. Don't talk shit about the eye, Pete, Will warned. You've got it too. If you start acting flip, it can be taken away in a heartbeat. I left them in the dust as I jogged back to the manor. I didn't care about who was more of a shooting prodigy than whom. All I wanted was Ella back in my arms. I feared for her greatly. Kidnapping victims had a 50-50 shot at getting out alive, even when the ransom was paid. I knew this because we ran more than a few such operations ourselves. Shit, that's how Will met his lady Scarlet. And if that didn't fuck with your head, what would? I headed up the front steps to the roof and then down to the third floor so as to avoid having to talk to anyone. 
I dial Lucien's number rather than texting first, which is the protocol. It's our way of alerting to an emergency without also alerting the FBI agents or rivals or whoever could be listening in. Someone had to be watching in order to send that chilling message with the glass slipper. I ran my mind over our enemies list, but couldn't think of any of them who would use kidnapping as their modus operandi. Especially not against a woman who wasn't even officially part of the main firm yet. Lucian picked up on the fourth ring. What is it, Derek? He said, a lilt in his voice belying the somberness of the situation. You do know it's well after midnight, yes? Ella was kidnapped, Dad. I didn't beat around the bush. Silence. I heard the squeak of his bed springs. He really had been asleep. Drawers banged open in the background as he spoke again. I'll look into it. I'll call you back soon. Be strong, Derek. They want you flustered so you'll make a mistake. Easy for you to say, I sputtered. Be strong. You're a main. And more importantly, you're my son. He ended the call and I sank to the bed and held my head in my hands. The sheets still smelled like Ella. What if in the morning, this smell was all I had to remember her by? How could the universe be so cruel, so diabolically sadistic, as to reunite us after so long, only to have it end in tragedy? I was alternately seized by despondent depression and manic, violent vigor. I paced back and forth, punching at phantoms in the air and foaming at the mouth as I sputtered threats and epithets at those who dared take my love away. Then crashing to the floor in a sobbing fit crying for my lost love. When my phone rang, I panicked because in my raging depressive fit, I'd lost track of it. I found it far under the bed, scraping my back on the bed rail in a mad scramble to reach it. Hello, I said with a trembling voice. Derek, I've discovered who took Ella. I wanted to feel relief at the knowledge, but the note of icy dread in Lucian's tone kept me in suspense. Who? I asked. A Black Ops mercenary unit who call themselves the Coachman. The Coachman? Wait a minute. Weren't they subject to a congressional investigation at one point? At several points. Their involvement in the Gulf was highly controversial, if I recall. I've used their services only twice, and on both occasions, their lack of professionalism and needless bloodshed disappointed me greatly. Their leader still holds a grudge against us, I fear, for cutting them out of the business. If you know these guys so well, surely you know where they can be found, I pointed out. Well, they have a public headquarters and training center, several in fact, around the globe. But she wouldn't be at any of those. She'd be in an off-the-book safe house, probably somewhere close. I stood up suddenly, my voice tight when I spoke. You know where they have her, I breathed. Tell me. Tell me now. I'm sorry, Derek, Lucien said. But I'm afraid I can't do that. Tell me now! I bellowed, spattering the phone with my spittle. Derek, if I tell you, you're going to go off after them and get yourself killed. Damn it, son, I love you, but you're not Will. You're not a soldier. No, but I've got the eye, right? I countered. I've hardly ever missed, even as a kid. The eye is an urban legend, a story people in our line of work tell each other to alleviate boredom. Nothing more. Derek, you're going to run the firm someday. You're too important to risk. What do you want me to do? Just sit around while she's in danger? I can't do that, Dad. You're going to have to learn to think like a leader, son. The president doesn't pull the trigger. He makes a phone call and someone else launches the drone. You feel me? I have to find her, Dad. I told him. I have to. If these guys are mad at us, like you said, then paying the ransom will be like a death sentence to Ella. Lucian sighed. If I tell you, you have to promise not to go alone. I promise. I swear. 
Take Will for real. Is Joe there? Yes. Perfect. With that Native American killing machine backing you up, I'm starting to feel a lot better. The coachmen use an abandoned logging mill about six miles from the family cottage. Son of a bitch, I know where it is. I was already moving for the hallway. Thanks, Dad. Don't get yourself killed, Derek. I hope she's worth all this. She's worth it, Dad. Believe me, she's worth it. I ended the call and ran downstairs, hollering for Navajo Joe. Will had better hurry back with the weapons. Tonight's lover's moon had just become a hunter's moon. And this hunter would destroy his prey. Chapter 22 Ella My eyes snapped open, focusing on a black carapaced, knobby cricket inches from my face. Instead of being startled, relief flooded through me. Where I was... It was safe enough that a little insect felt confident about being in the open. Hey, little guy, I said in a thick, groggy voice. Where are we? Wouldn't it be a trip if he answered back? I started and turned about to face a red-haired man with a handlebar mustache seated in a rustic wooden chair. The chair lacked a back, so he leaned against the edge of a splintered gray table. The man smiled, and despite my circumstances, I relaxed a bit. It wasn't the smile of a psychopath, but one seemed designed to put me at ease. You know, he said in a slight southern accent, all Jiminy Cricket-like. When I didn't respond, he frowned. I took a moment to take in the rest of my surroundings. I lay on a simple but clean-smelling gym mat. A man's denim jacket laid over my body. Besides the red-haired man and the cricket, it seemed deserted. High vaulted ceilings and the preeminent smell of sawdust convinced me I was in an old mill. Even before I saw the big, ten-foot circular saw designed for splitting trees in half. Sorry, he said. I reckon you're probably pretty darn groggy right now. It's the chloroform. It's not the pleasant ride they make it seem in the movies. He reached up to the table, took down a bottle of water, and rolled it across the ten feet of floor separating us. I caught it, shooting him a look of gratitude. After unscrewing the stubborn cap, I gulped down all the tepid contents in one go. Sorry it's not cold. We can't run the mini-fridge because it keeps shorting out the generator. Thank you. You're very accommodating for a kidnapper. He shrugged. Everyone on our team has their unique skill set. Mine happens to be conversation. And explosives. Well, demo disposal, mostly. I used to set up bombs for Uncle Sam. But now I don't do it for anyone anymore. Boss Wade knows that. Boss Wade? I asked. Yeah. His face scrunched up. Not the kindest fella. But he pays me well and doesn't try to make me blow stuff up. I usually get saddled with babysitting duty, and I'd much rather be congenial and polite than tie you down and try to terrify you. Know what I mean? This whole experience is bad enough as it is, am I right? You're right, I said. But honestly, you're making it easier. My name's Ella. I don't suppose you can tell me yours. Sure, he said. Call me Heath. It's not my real name, of course, but it's what the other fellas call me on account I look like the Joker guy. The, uh, Joker guy who wasn't all weird and strung out dancing on the stairs. I get you. I laughed despite my anxiety. Thanks for your kindness. You know that as soon as you go out to pee, I'm going to try to escape, right? Well, he said, half laughing but eyeing me warily, thanks for your honesty. It didn't feel right to lie, I shrugged. 
So this boss of yours, Wade, do you think he'll let me go once the ransom is paid? I mean, that is what this is about, isn't it? Yeah, that and, well, Boss Wade's got a major grudge against the main family. Feels like they cut us out of a lot of potential work by blackballing us. Maybe he's right. But quite frankly, I don't much approve of mixing vengeance with business. You don't sound happy at all about this. That's because I'm not, he said matter-of-factly. But I got outvoted, you know? These guys are my brothers. I don't want to just walk away. It sounds like maybe you need a change of leadership. Hey, Keith jabbed a finger at me. You don't understand. Boss Wade saved my ass. Saved all our asses more times than I can count. He's Rambo mixed with the Terminator, okay? He's almost 50, but he moves like a gazelle and hits like a bucking bronco. And he makes you think you can do shit you've never been able to do otherwise. He's a man's man. But his temper... He hung his head, rubbing the bridge of his nose and sighing. I decided then and there this wasn't a bad man. Just a man in a bad situation. Just like me. Heath, I said, we don't have to get into this if it bothers you. But tell me how you did end up in this line of work. He brightened up a bit. Well, I reckon I got into it because I figured I got a girl pregnant. Enlisted when I was 17. Lied about being 18. Didn't have many other prospects. I arched an eyebrow and pulled up my knees. A rat came out and ate the cricket. But I didn't even flinch. I guess I was a bit over being startled at that point. Figured? I questioned. You figured you got a girl pregnant? How does that work out? I wasn't aware pregnancy was a hypothetical condition. Heath chuckled, apparently not noticing the rat as it sort of meandered behind me without a trace of fear. I remember my neighbor had a pet rat she trained to do tricks. It was cute. This one was big and gray and had the most innocent black eyes as it devoured the remains of the cricket, leaving behind only a pile of legs. Turns out she was preggers, all right. Just wasn't mine. Ouch, I winced. Yeah, but it was too late. Then I sort of... I was never a kid who did well sitting in a classroom. You feel me? But out in the open, getting plenty of sun and fresh air? I don't know. I liked soldiering. At least up until the point I had to kill people. Not like I had the money for college. Your parents weren't able to help? I asked, a leading question to open him up. I felt bad, because while I did want to like Heath, my main objective was to get his sympathy enough so he would let me go. Nah, my mom was dead before I was out of junior high. I was in and out of foster homes after that. He shrugged. Lots of folks had it worse. There are a lot of shit foster families. I wound up with a good one. I was damn lucky. He glanced over at me and frowned. Look, no offense, but I've read your dossier, and you got a damn raw deal in life. His voice broke, and he wiped at his eyes. Damn raw deal. Keith, what's bothering you so much? Wade's really mad. He mumbled into his hands, shielding his face from view. Wade's so mad. I'm sorry, Ella, he's just so mad. Calm down, I said. Whatever bad thing you're dreading, it hasn't happened yet. You can still stop it. I can't, he said, moving his hands away from his face and staring right at me with dark green eyes. I can't betray my brothers. I'm so sorry. Hey, what the hell happened to the cricket? Did you squish it? No, I think the rat ate it, I said. Rat? Heath paled by several shades, moving his legs in close under the chair and staring around. I don't see a rat. Where's a rat? As if on cue, 
the cute, docile creature crawled into my lap. It looked up at me, wriggling its nose. I noticed a tattoo on its foot. A barcode. An escaped lab rat? Could explain why it's so relaxed around humans. This rat, I said. You know, they're actually not the vicious creatures people think they are. Don't touch it, he hissed. Diseases. Rabies. Little black soulless eyes. I hate rats. My eyes narrowed and I gathered my legs under me, lifting the rat carefully in both palms. What are you doing? Keith asked, straining back in his seat as I approached him with the rat. This rat? He's so cute. I think I'll name him Gus. I held him out toward Heath, and his eyes rolled back into his head. Heath slumped over in his seat, passed out cold. I'm real sorry I had to do that, Heath. I only half meant the apology. Here's your coat back, okay? I felt like a total heel as I stripped his boots off. They were too big, but I layered on a few socks I found in his pack to make up for it. No way could I hike around in the woods in heels. The dress was sexy and upscale, but it was also impractical. I wound up tucking the skirt up between my legs and tying it off into an almost genie pants configuration. Well, genie shorts. I looked at the holstered pistol at Heath's side, but decided not to take it. I didn't want to risk waking him. I did steal a backpack stuffing it with jerky and bottles of water, a flashlight, and for some reason, a hammer. I was beginning to panic, worried that the others might return at any moment. When I went to zip the pack shut, I discovered a stowaway. All right, Gus, I said. What's Cinderella without a friendly rat or two? I ventured outside into the dark woods. In the distance, above the treetops, I could see a glow of lights that was probably the woodland retreat. But it looked a good distance away, with several foothills between me and it. I was a city kid, so my woodcraft wasn't exactly Bear Grylls level. But I knew moss generally grew on the north side of tree trunks from some movie. And anyway, I would be safer in the woods than with some mercenaries who seemed dubious about letting me survive my kidnapping. Even the nice one. Gus began chirruping madly and drove deeper into the pack. I paused, eyes intent on the dark. And then I heard a snuffling groan. A bear. Damn. The snapping of twigs and branches seemed to indicate it was approaching me. I broke into a run, choosing a narrow game trail that wound its way up the side of a foothill. Legs made strong by working 18 hours in a row propelled me up the incline while the bear chose a more direct path by breaking through the underbrush. My heart hammered in my chest. It seemed too surreal that I would escape from the mercenaries only to be eaten by a bear. My last thought was that no one would ever find my body. Right before I spied a potential salvation. On the top of the ridge was a narrow stream more of a trickle that ran out between a thin fissure in the cliff face. I believed I could wedge myself in between the fissure while the bear might not be able to follow. It was difficult to judge, but I could hear the thing growing closer behind me. I raced up the last 12 feet and shot toward the fissure. Shoving my way inside, I splashed through the shallow water into musty dankness. The sunlight faded into a mere slender blade which was snuffed out entirely when the shadow of the shaggy bear blocked the entrance. It lashed in with a paw, but I was a good ten feet away. The bear shoved its head and forequarters into the fissure, and I screamed. This seemed to startle it, and it loped a few feet away, staring back at me. A pair of fuzzy, impossibly cute cubs hobbled up next to the big bear. I felt my blood run cold. A hungry brown bear would sometimes give up on a meal if it was too challenging, but not one that had cubs to feed. I saw that in a movie, too. I shivered in the fissure and wondered how anyone would ever find me. 
before the bear dug me out. Chapter 23 Derek The last of the party guests had departed, and the catering staff were finishing the cleanup. Navajo Joe stood in the kitchen, all six feet ten inches of him, munching on leftover duck. The glass he drank vodka from was smeared with grease from his fingers. Are you sure it's a good idea to, you know, down a vodka martini right before a firefight? I asked a bit petulantly. Joe arched his eyebrow at me and grinned. Actually, boy, it's downright essential. Joe called everyone but Lucian boy or girl. It was his thing, and I'd learned not to take offense at it. Make no mistake, if I told Joe to go and kill someone, that's just what he'd do. But he'd be condescending and mean the entire time he did it. Besides, I taught you everything you know about fighting. Not everything. Will showed me how to handle big firearms. Shit, who needs a gun that can spit out a hundred bullets a second when you can do the job with just two? One to do the job, one to make sure. He put his finger to his head and made a pop-pop sound with his lips. I laughed, and he turned a baleful eye my way. What's so funny? I'm just thinking of the day my dad sent me to train with you, I answered. Oh, yeah? That's one way to put it. The way I remember it, me and Lucy were getting drunk and you came up crying because you stubbed your toe. Lucy looked at me and said, go make him a man. He's 12. Yeah, and he sure as fuck tried, I said bitterly. I knew I needed his help getting Ella back, so I dialed back my accusatory tone a notch or two. I remember kissing the mud like a hundred times that day. You kept yelling at me to stop being a pussy and to get up and be a man. Yeah, I did, he said. I didn't kid glove you, Derek, because I couldn't. Look at your life. Look at what you're about to do. Normal people don't have to gear up with military contraband to go out and rescue their girlfriends from mercenaries. Your life is dangerous. You couldn't afford to be weak. So yeah... I slapped you down again and again until your lips were bloody and you didn't know which way was up. But you know what, Derek? You kept getting back up. Remember that? I thought back to that day. The rain pounding down on both of us, turning Joe's t-shirt translucent and plastering my hair to my scalp. Despite the torrential downpour, I had been covered with mud. Come on, you whiny little shit. Joe had shouted. Take me off my feet. I had come at him again, grabbing him around the waist and trying to bowl him over with brute strength. Joe laughed, hardly having to splay his feet to prevent being unbalanced. The same thing for the hundredth time? Sure. Why not? He'd used his toes to hook behind my ankle and break my balance, sending me tumbling back into the mud again. Come on, kid. You know that's not the way. Joe wasn't the most fashion-forward of people. At that point, he still had a faded pair of denim bell-bottoms with more holes than Swiss cheese. I looked at those muddy bell-bottoms, wiped the mud and blood off my face, and crawled through the muck to grab under the hem. <laughs> the fuck are you doing? Joe had said with a sputtering laugh. Is that doggy-style kung fu? You look like an ass. Get up before I kick the last of your baby teeth out of your mouth. I grabbed the hems tightly and stood up with a lunge, hollering at the top of my lungs. Joe's eyes went wide as he tumbled over backward into the mud. He laughed, slapping the mud and sending up puddles. You did it, boy, he would said. See, it ain't about how many times you get knocked the fuck down. It's about how many times you get the fuck back up. Hey, boy, Joe said, snapping his fingers and bringing me back to the kitchen and out of memory. Wake up. Did you hear what I said? No. I shook my head. Sorry. I said, did your daddy mention how many there would be opposing us? Our current intel puts their number at seven. 
All of them multi-tour veterans and more than willing to break international law if it means getting the job done. You sound like you admire them, Joe murmured. Not at all. I don't admire a goddamn thing about the people who stole my Ella, I snapped. They're already dead to me. The sound of the front door opening heralded Will's arrival. He came back into the kitchen through the living area, carrying two heavy black duffel bags. He dropped them solidly onto the floor and then turned back for the still open front door. Will paused, looking over his muscled shoulder. You guys gonna help unload this shit or just watch? We moved to help, moving pack after pack out of the bed of his black El Camino into the house. I plied him with queries as we went. Is everyone else in the family okay? Yeah, looks like you're the lucky one, Derek. No one else has been targeted. Yes, but why? I think the answer likely lies with the person who hired them, Will said. Someone who wants money. Joe poured himself another shot. Simple as that. I thought back to the phone call Ella had received, and my lips twitched into a snarl. Her stepmother, Agatha. It couldn't be. But then again, it absolutely could. We'll worry about who hired the coachman later. I shook my head. Right now, finding and rescuing Ella is the priority. Will unzipped a duffel bag and withdrew a black Kevlar vest. He threw it at me and I struggled to catch the heavy weight. Put it on, he ordered. No arguments. Lucian's orders. I slipped the vest on and then noticed that Will had brought one for himself and Joe as well. Joe struggled into the ill-fitting garment, grumbling the whole time. Try shoveling less duck into your gullet next time, I joked. He sneered at me and then we proceeded to arm ourselves from Will's potent armory. I selected a semi-automatic pistol, a tactical shotgun, and a semi-automatic hunting rifle. Will tossed me a survival knife in his sheath. Here, just in case it gets up close and personal. I strapped the sheath to my thigh and arched an eyebrow as Will took out a clunky-looking pair of goggles. Night vision. Then he handed one to me and one to Joe. Jesus Christ, boy, Joe said. Where did you get all this stuff? Around, Will shrugged. Don't use it until we get out in the woods. You don't want to be in bright illumination when it powers up. Will took the lead with Joe and me coming behind. We crept through the dense woods for roughly an hour, moving with stealth along a faded game trail. Joe paused for a moment, his nose wrinkling. Bear spore. A lot of it. There's a couple of them here vying for territory, or maybe a mother and cubs. Is it going to be a problem? I asked the old Native American. Maybe. Keep your eyes and ears peeled. Will came back to see what the holdup was. He shrugged when we mentioned the bears. If we see one, we'll see how it likes AK-47 puppy chow. Let's move. We continued on, up, and down rises in the land. The night insects created a cacophony that drowned out the occasional snap of a twig or scuffle of boot on rock. At length, Will told Joe and me to remain where we were in the shadow of a gnarled oak tree. He went off to scout ahead and returned shortly after. Okay, he said, drawing in the dirt, which our goggles allowed us to see in monochrome. Here's the mill. Will drew a box in the dirt. There's good cover on three sides. I say we triangulate our fire by taking up positions here, here, and here. He indicated the spots by drawing circles in the dust. I'll take out their generator first, which will give us the advantage since we have the goggles. With any luck, they'll move out to engage. What if they hole up where they're at? I asked. It would be a terrible strategy. They've pulled a George Washington and put themselves in a Fort Necessity situation. We have plenty of cover and they have none. My hope is we'll drive them out in fear for their lives. Will, Ella might be in there. I was nervous for my girl and how she'd come out of this. That's why I'm going to take out the generator first. We should be able to make her out among the mercenaries. 
Just pick your shots carefully, move every so often so they can't pin down your position, and I'll rig up a Three Stooges. Three Stooges? I asked. Joe grinned. He means he will load three separate guns at different positions and rush between them, creating the illusion our numbers are greater than they are. Just don't shoot her. All right? I felt nauseated at the idea of her being hurt. Man, you got it bad for her, don't you? Will teased. Like he's talking, Mr. Fall in Love with the Woman You Kidnapped. Isn't that supposed to be Abductor Class 101? Not falling in love with your targets? Will shot me a withering look, but Joe laughed too hard for him to be able to say anything. Shut up or you'll alert the enemy, Will snarled. All right, Derek, you're here. Joe, you're here, and I'll take the middle. We moved into position like wraiths in the night. I gripped the hunting rifle, fearing what would happen if one of the massive shells were to demolish Ella's slight form. I didn't even worry about bears, though I noticed signs of one's passing. It looked like it had crashed up a hill recently. I hoped it had found something to eat and would leave us unmolested. When we were in place, Will took out the generator with a single, well-placed sniper round. There was a sharp bang, and the lights inside the mill went dark. I waited. A man came to the door wielding a rifle. He was the only person I saw. No Ella, no other mercs. My finger curled around the trigger, but instead of vengeance, I wanted answers. I changed my crosshairs from his head to his shoulder. He'd probably need reconstructive surgery, but he'd be in shape to answer my questions. I squeezed the trigger, but Will fired first. His shot cracked, and the man's head jerked to the side before he fell backward. My own bullet ripped into the doorframe, and I shuddered to think about its continued trajectory finding Ella's soft body. We waited for a long time, but no one else came out of the mill. Will crept his way down to the mill on his belly, wriggling like a snake from cover to cover. He peered in the windows and then through the open door. He came back out and waved us to come over. I stood up and moved carefully through the brush, knowing others might be about. Our gunfire had surely attracted attention. We came up into the mill and found the man surprisingly alive and not badly hurt. Will's shot had dislodged a chunk of heavy wooden doorframe and knocked the man silly. Where's the girl? I sputtered, sitting on his chest and slapping him back to consciousness. Where is she? Answer me. I don't know, he said, blinking in confusion. I didn't see her leave. Lying sack of shit, I said, drawing my hand back to strike him again. But Will grabbed my forearm. She's not here. Joe thinks she made tracks up the eastern ridge. Let's go while we can still catch up to her. What about him? I asked. A shot rang out, and we all ducked for cover. The mercs were back. Go find your girl, Will said, knocking the man out again with the butt of his rifle. Joe and I will keep them distracted and then get our asses out of here. I nodded and crouch walked toward the rear exit. Thanks, Will. Don't be a hero. I won't. Go find your woman, he ordered. I headed outside, running away from a hail of gunfire, determined to do just that. Chapter 24 Ella I screamed as the bear shouldered more of its bulk inside the narrow fissure. All that remained of it beyond the enclosing rock walls were its hindquarters. So close. So close to being able to get me. Gus sat up on my shoulder, wriggling his little nose and squeaking. He didn't seem nearly as concerned as he should be. If you're the same rat that trained those ninja turtles, now would be a nice time to use the turtle signal and bring them here. I laughed, nearly hysterical. I grabbed a clump of dirt and threw it at the bear's face. It impacted near the black glistening nose, and it retreated for a moment before coming back. Mauled to death by a bear. Never saw this one coming. Then I paused, 
straining my ears. Was that gunfire? The bear didn't seem to notice or care, intent on digging me out to feed her cubs. But then I heard something else, which did make the bear take notice. Pella! Derek shouted from what sounded like quite nearby. Pella! Derek, I'm here! I shouted back. The bear dragged itself out of the fissure and loped out of my sight. I screamed a warning to Derek right before I heard the loud retort of a big gun. The sound was followed by a metallic clacking and then another booming shot. The bear's growls grew shriller and then a final shot silenced it forever. Derek appeared in the mouth of the fissure, panting and out of breath. I squirmed my way out to him and threw my arms around his waist, burying my face in his chest. I'm so sorry I ran away, I said. I just don't know what was going through my head. We don't have time to talk about this right now, Derek said, running his hand through my hair while he stared with adoring eyes. Are you hurt? No, just a couple of scrapes and cuts, I said. I heard gunfire. Derek nodded. Will and Joe were keeping them busy. But we need to get out of here. It won't take them long to pick up our trail thanks to the damn bear. He took my hand and led us fleeing up over the top of the ridge. Derek glanced back, looking down at my feet. I approve of your footwear, he said. Thanks. They're a little big, but nothing three layers of socks couldn't fix. My toes swam in a sea of sweat, but at least I could run and had protection from the upthrust roots and knobby rocks in our path. We reached the top of the ridge, and Derek called for a halt. He peered down intently toward the mill, using a pair of goggles, which apparently let him see further and in the dark. Will and Joe have fled into the woods. The mercs rushed their position. We don't have much time before they come after us. He turned to me and unstrapped a belted holster from his shoulder. Derek held the holstered gun out to me, and I awkwardly took it. He helped strap it in place on my body and then handed me a box of shells. I thrust them into my billowed dress shorts as best I could. Do you know how to use a gun? He asked. I fired my dad's a few times. Out in the country when we visited Grandpa, I said. But it was a little twenty-two, not this monster. Just don't jerk the trigger, Derek instructed. Squeeze. Now come on, we have to go. He tugged me along, but I realized we weren't going toward the lights of his manor. Derek, we're going the wrong way, I said. Your home is back there. The manor will be the first place they check for us, I said. And unfortunately, the only backup there is Jimmy the Bull. We're going to try for the highway and flag down a passing motorist. Will they give us a ride? I asked. They will, he said, hefting his gun. I frowned, and he sighed. This isn't a game, Ella. We're not going to hurt anyone. But if we're going to get out of this alive, we're going to have to bend those inflexible morals of yours a little. I know, but do I have to be happy about it? I blurted. All right, lead on. Ella, I said, lead on. I snapped. He turned and took my hand, plunging us down the steep slope of the opposite edge of the ridge. The interstate is about two miles west, he said as we moved along a game trail. Speed is our best option now. They'll be moving cautiously to avoid ambushes from the other two. Do you think Will and Joe will be all right? I asked. Probably. You're the one they really want. I felt a chill run down my spine at that. Being hunted was not exactly a comforting feeling. Derek led the way as we sprinted up the inclines, ducked under branches, and splashed through chill, shallow streams. The landscape was ironically beautiful in the moonlight which did nothing but make me long for safety, to be able to enjoy its aesthetics. 
Derek glanced over his shoulder and cursed. They're on the same trail as us, he said. His head swiveled about, and then he pointed to our left. There's another trail just over that stream. We'll use that one. Derek had me step carefully over the stream so the splashing wouldn't alert the coachman to our presence. Then we fast walked with as much stealth as possible up the incline to the alternate trail. For a time, we raced in relative quiet in the darkness, not speaking. Our heavy breathing, my thudding heartbeat, and the patter of our boots on the hard-packed dirt trail were the only sounds joining the relentless insect cacophony. We paused to catch our breath on the top of a ridge, looking back down below us. Flashlights swished about, their cones of radiance piercing the gloom. Derek cursed and spat. They're doubling back. They must have realized we gave them the slip back at the stream, he said. How long do we have? I stood bent over with my hands on my knees, panting like a landed fish. Not long. Here, drink, he said, trying to hand me a canteen. I shook my head and reached into my pack to get a plastic bottle of water. Gus peeked his head out, twitching his nose. Ugh, hold still. Let me kill it. Derek said. I turned away from him, an adrenal burst providing me with instant stamina. You leave Gus alone, I said. He helped me escape. Well, sort of. Fine. You can bring the rat, Derek agreed. But if he bites me, I'll break his little neck. Don't be mean. Are you jealous of a rat? I don't know. Let me tell it I love it and see if it runs away. Fuck you. I blurted as we crashed through the underbrush. That wasn't fair, Derek. It was a low blow. Sorry, he murmured, and I believed he was sincere. I'm sorry. I'm scared and hurt, and I'm digging it out on the wrong person. I'm the idiot who just blurted it out. I never said you did anything wrong, I said. Did I say you did something wrong? But you ran away, Derek countered. Yes, I ran away. But that doesn't... That doesn't mean I wasn't... Damn it, Derek. I'm too out of breath to do this now. Fair enough, he said leading the way down into a ravine. He paused, sweat glistening on his face. Hear that? My face split into a wide grin. Cars. We're close to the highway. Close to freedom. Let's go. He dragged me along, setting a brutal pace I was barely able to sustain. I feared that if I failed to continue swishing my legs and getting my feet out in front of me... I would surely tumble into the dirt and be dragged along in his wake, bouncing off the terrain before he even noticed. We broke through a dense copse into a clearing. Towering, strangely bare tree trunks stood in neatly concentric rows before us. Confused, we slowed to a stop, glancing about. I could hear cars on the highway, but I couldn't see them. Then... I noticed the bare trees weren't trees at all. They were concrete support pillars for the highway, which rushed over us 60 feet above. Oh no, I said. Is there some way up there? A maintenance ladder or something? No, Derek said grimly. He turned to face the way we had come, pushing me behind him as a man broke out of the tree line. Derek pointed his rifle at him and the man dove to his belly in the dirt. The sounds of shouting and crashing alerted us to the presence of others. Got one tango armed and eyes on the HVT, snapped the man who had dove into cover. One tango? Is it the Indian or the muscle guy? Neither. It's... Son of a bitch. I think it's Lucian Maine's kid. Which one? The whiny little goth one. Oh, shit, then. A man broke out of the tree line, carrying a rifle, but not bothering to aim it. 
He looked at Derek with bemusement on his craggy face as my lover pointed his weapon. If you shoot me, boy, you condemn both of you to death, he said in an English accent. You must be the leader of these morons, Derek said with a sneer. Wade. Wade bowed his head in mock politeness and gestured toward me. Give me the girl, or give me my money. Even if I had the money, I wouldn't trust you to let us go, Derek said. She goes with you over my dead body. Poor choice of words, Wade informed him. I'll shoot you where you stand if your men don't disarm now, Derek said, cocking his shotgun with a metallic click. Go ahead. I'm wearing a vest, so I'll probably make it, Wade said. Then you'll both be dead. Then I'll shoot you in the head, Derek said, adjusting his aim. Wade cackled. <laughs> you'll still be dead. Face it, kid. You care about the skirt too much to let it end like that. Just hand her over, and you'll get her back safe and sound once we're paid. Liar, I accused. They have no intention of letting me live. They want vengeance as much as money. One of them told me as much. God damn it, Heath, Wade spat in the grass. All right, you got me. But you're still going to turn her over to me because then there's still a slim hope she'll make it out alive. No, I said suddenly. You're thinking too small, Wade. Excuse the fuck out of my French, but who asked you, little orphan Annie? Your analogy is wrong as shit. And this is Derek Maine, Lucian's most beloved son. You can get away with more money than you ever dreamed of just off this one ransom. Isn't a life of luxury worth letting go of your petty revenge? Ella, what are you doing? Derek said under his breath. Saving both our lives, I hope. I muttered back. So what about it? You take him and leave me here to take your demands back to Lucian. I hope you know what you're doing, Ella. Derek said as they disarmed him. Wade waved them off of me. Let her keep it. What's one little girl going to do with a tiny little pistol? Go tell Lucian we want our back pay. Five hundred mil of it. He's got until midnight tomorrow. I'll tell him, I assured Wade. Derek, I love you. Derek flinched. And then, a look of fierce, determined devotion came over his face. I now knew he would fight to remain alive to the bitter end. Which was exactly why I'd told him. I love you too, he said as they shoved him down the trail. I watched them leave, my heart breaking as I saw him vanish behind the leaves. Chapter 25 Derek. As Ella vanished behind us under the overpass, the sounds of rushing cars fading into the background, I was shoved along by one of the mercenaries. The bald mountain of muscle was named Tiny with the most delicious of irony. I wondered where they were taking me. Surely not back to the mill. That would be dumb or arrogant beyond belief. We clearly already knew where it was. A chilling thought occurred to me. What if they had killed both Joe and Will? That might make them confident enough to risk taking me back to the same hideaway. It turned out I was close to being right. They eschewed the mill itself for a lumber barn a half mile away. Any idiot who came to check on the mill would follow our trail right to it. But my father did say the coachmen were conceited to the point of being sloppy. They shoved me into the barn and filed in after me, closing the door tightly. Wade looked to two of his men, one dark-haired and angry-looking, the other the mountain of muscle known as Tiny. Tiny, Justin, 
Go out and set up a perimeter watch. I don't want to get snuck up on again. Do you hear me? No problem, boss. Tiny adjusted the goggles he'd stolen from me on his face and smiled smugly in my direction. Who knows, maybe that sweet little thing will show up and I'll pop her tiny head off. Don't touch her. I snarled and he laughed. I made for him, but two of the others grabbed me and held me back. Tiny blew me a kiss as he filed out the door. You're full of spirit, Wade commented. All piss and vinegar. Maybe I misjudged you. Are you a whiny goth kid, or some kind of secret badass? Tell your goons to let me go and find out, I sputtered. Hmm, didn't your generation grow up playing video games? You have to work your way up to the boss fight. Wade looked over at one of his men. Hey, gee, you up for a little knuckle dusting? Ready and willing, boss, the apparent G said. He was taller than tiny, but slimmer in build. That didn't mean I relished the idea of fighting him. Not one bit. He moved like liquid as he shrugged himself off the wall and came to stand before me. He sloughed off his bulletproof vest as he gestured at me. Go ahead. Let the kid go, he said. You ever trained to fight, son? Boxing? G put his fists through a few combos, coming within inches of hitting me, but I didn't so much as flinch. No? No boxing? How about some Taekwondo? G stood back into a martial artist's split-legged stance and jabbed a few quick kicks in the air, both right in front of my face and over my head. How do you like that? Are you going to show off all night or are you going to fight? I snarled. G's smile faded, and he spun around for one of those fancy roundhouse kicks. But Joe had taught me a long time ago that while kicks had their place, when you used one, you were turning yourself into a one-legged man. I snapped the steel toe of my boot into his knee while his weight was fully supported by one leg. He crumpled to the floor, screaming and holding his leg. Wade burst into laughter, as did the rest of his crew. Well, except for this one red-headed guy who went to help G. Damn, but if G hasn't had that coming for a while... Wade chuckled. I told you that chop sucky shit was going to be your downfall, G. Fuck you, man. G rolled around. Heath, keep him quiet or I'll shoot you both. Wade snapped. He turned his gaze on me and grinned. Okay, kid. I obviously underestimated you. Let's see how you do against a more capable opponent. Wade looked over to one of his men and arched his brows. Tava, go switch places with Tiny. Tell him he's needed in here. Ah, the apparent Tarver said with a frown. You mean I don't get to see little rich boy get his ass kicked? We'll give you the play-by-play -play after, Wade assured him. Go. Tiny soon returned, slipping out of his vest and then his shirt to show off considerable muscle mass, but he moved much slower than G. Heard what you did to my man G, he said. That was pretty cold. Not honorable to go for a man's knee. With that, he lashed out with his boot, forcing me to skim backward to avoid having a broken kneecap. Wade cackled with mirth as Tiny rushed me. I retreated back over a stack of rough-hewn logs, scrambling for purchase as he mounted the pile in pursuit. I climbed up to the chute, which had been used to sluice logs along in a shallow stream of water. It still contained fetid and brackish water in places. As Tiny climbed up onto the sluice, I kicked some of the nasty water right into his face. Tiny sputtered, scrambling up onto the sluice despite his momentary blindness. I laid into him with my steel-toed boots, but he protected himself well, and I mostly caught him on the shoulders and thick back. Tiny grabbed my ankle and shoved me back. I hit the sluice hard, splashing into more of the gross water, and barely made it back to my feet as he swung a massive overhand right. I ducked underneath, 
grabbing him around the waist in an attempt to knock him prone, but he splayed his legs wide and fought off the effort. His hands beat a rapid tattoo on my back as he sought to ensnare my neck with his heavily muscled arm. I knew if he got me into that position, it would be the end of me. I slammed my fist right between his legs. Tiny cried out as I did so again and again. His grip loosened enough that I was able to scramble back. You dirty motherfucker, he said, holding his crotch. With a sudden surge, he launched his foot forward. I couldn't dodge out of the way of that frozen turkey-sized boot and took it flush on my chest. I flew backward on the sluice, slamming down hard on my back and then bouncing over the side. I hit the pile of logs and then tumbled off, rolling with the momentum to eat up some of the impact. Tiny clambered down after me as I struggled back to my knees and then my feet, making swirling patterns in the sawdust. You want to take a minute and catch your breath? He asked nicely. I flipped him twin birds and he cackled. I pretended to stumble, my hand snatching up dual grips of the sawdust. Then I sprang up and tossed it right into his eyes. Tiny coughed and cursed, stumbling backward while frantically wiping his face with his hands. I launched myself on him, smothering him with blows. Each and every shot was a dirty one. Kidneys, testicles, eyes, throat. It didn't matter so long as it hurt. A lot. Tiny crumpled over into the fetal position, and I gave up kicking him when I realized the fight was over, and I was just wasting my energy. I felt a hand on my shoulder, spinning me around hard and off balance. I caught Wade's bare knuckles right across my cheek, sending me into a further spiral down to the hard, sawdust-covered floor. He moved in for the kill, lashing out with his boots for my head. I scrambled back, taking stinging blows on my forearms and hands, but managing to avoid the worst of the blows. Wade backed me against the wall, and as I struggled to use its surface to regain my feet, he barreled into me, using his greater mass to pin me. <laughs> Let's see you dance all pretty now, he said, his fetid breath blowing across my face. I spat blood in his eyes, drove my knee into his crotch, and somersaulted under his armpit to regain my feet behind him. This time, it was my turn for a sucker punch. As Wade turned around, I clipped him on the temple. He spun in a tight circle and fell face first to the ground. I jumped on his back, seating myself near the curve, and wrapped my hands around his face. My fingers sought his eye sockets, and I clawed and squeezed while a guttural growl escaped from between my clenched teeth. This bastard took Ella from me. Suddenly men were pulling me off him and dragging me away. I lashed out with my feet, even as my arms were held, connecting a few hard blows to his back as they dragged me off. Son of a bitch! Wade threw off help and squirmed to his feet under his own power. He clapped a hand over one half of his bleeding face, glaring at me with his one remaining eye. Let me see, boss, Heath said, pulling his arm away. Heath winced. Boss, you need a hospital like right now if we're going to save your sight. Get off me, you bleeding heart fuck, Wade said, shoving him violently away. He gestured with an open hand toward one of the others. Give me a goddamn gun. Wade turned to glare on him and sputtered again. Gun, now. A loaded semi-automatic pistol was placed in his hand, and he levered it my way. Now, you punk-ass little son of a bitch, he sputtered. I'm going to shoot you right in your fucking eye and leave you where your daddy can find you. I looked him in his remaining eye, knowing he was dead serious. This was the end. I had figured I didn't have much of a chance to get out of it alive as soon as we surrendered to Wade. All right, I said. Fine. You've got beef with my father, so I'm a dead man. Fine, just can you please give a message to Ella from me? Heath looked at him with a frown. It's a last request, boss. We should honor it. Fuck you, Heath. Wade snarled. No. 
I'm not going to tell her a damn thing. Now look at me, you little turd. I want you to see your death coming. Why? You didn't see yours? Came a shrill, feminine voice from the shadows. Wade turned his head just enough to take a bullet right between the eyes. He slid to the floor in a heap, and all hell broke loose. Chapter 26 Ella Derek! I screamed over the din of gunfire, crouching near a sagging, glassless window. Over here! He scrambled on his hands and knees behind a stack of logs for cover, and then worked his way toward me. The coachman had exploded into action, adopting covered positions and scrambling to avoid the fire from Will's heavy machine gun. It tore bits of wood off the wall and rained it down in splinters and sawdust onto the already filthy floor. Joe popped into view at the high aperture where logs used to flow through the sluice, aiming a semi-automatic rifle, which coughed and spat death down at the surprised mercenaries. It gave Derek just enough time to rush to the open window and vault out. I took his hand and helped him to the ground below, which was a bit of a drop. We scrambled back behind the heavy gray trunk of a gnarled forest giant as answering fire came back at Will and Joe. Didn't you go back to my dad? Derek asked. Will called him, but we sort of went off the reservation. I grinned. My hand gripped the pistol with a trembling grasp. I realized I had just shot someone, just killed a man stone cold. What's the matter? Derek asked, but his voice seemed to come from a long way off. I just stared at the gun in my hand, realizing I had just used it to commit murder. Maybe not murder, exactly, but a man was dead, and I was the direct cause. I dreaded this exact thing when I broke up with Derek back in prep school. Being drawn into the dark web of his crime syndicate and changing from the person I was into a cold-blooded killer. I had crossed that line with nary a blink, not even hesitating in the slightest. Derek's life had been in danger. I loved him, so I squeezed the trigger. Simple as that. But now that it was over, and he was no longer under the imminent threat of death, I found I was on the verge of a major breakdown. Derek took the gun from my shaking hand and kissed me on the forehead. I'm sorry, Ella. He said in a sad voice, you should never have had to go through this. Never. The sound of renewed gunfire startled both of us. Derek looked back at the log barn, worry creasing his face. Go, I said. Go help them. But what about you? He blurted. I can't just leave you here. Yes, you can, I said. Besides, I'm not alone. I have Gus. Derek laughed and checked the pistol, loading a fresh magazine with a metallic click. We're not keeping that thing. I arched an eyebrow and put my arms akimbo. Excuse me, it's well after midnight and hours before dawn. You can't tell me what to do, and I'm keeping my rat. Fair enough. Derek paused and then turned back to kiss me intensely upon the mouth. We held each other tightly until Derek broke the contact. He crept to the edge of the trunk, keeping his body flush against it. Derek squeezed off a few shots and then charged to plant himself against the underside of the window. A merc stuck his head out of the window and looked out, causing me to dive to the mossy turf with a frightened yelp. Derek lifted his aim and shot the man through the chin up out of the top of his head. I flinched my belly twisting into knots. Derek had just killed someone right in front of me for the first time. I didn't know what to think. With a shock, I realized I wasn't nearly as put off as I thought I would be. Maybe it was because I had just killed a man myself. I don't know. But I just didn't feel as if what Derek had just done made him an evil man. The coachman had come after me, 
After us. They picked this fight. What were we supposed to do? Just accept it? Just let them shoot us dead? I felt anger boil up in my belly. How dare these bastards come into my life when it was finally starting to get good? How dare they interfere with my and Derek's happiness, which had been hard fought and harder won? Derek moved around the perimeter of the barn in a low, crouched walk, eyes glittering like black diamonds in the dark. I watched until he disappeared around the corner, and then my gaze seemed inexorably drawn to the ground beneath the window. The man Derek had just killed dropped his rifle onto the dirt below. I crawled over and picked it up, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew I probably shouldn't be doing what I was doing, but the thought of leaving Derek to face peril alone was too much to bear. Besides, I was tired of being pushed around. My stepmother, my horrid stepsisters, my boss at work, all of them, all throughout the years since prep school. What Derek and I did in the confines of our love life was different. I chose to submit to him. I didn't choose to submit to anyone else, and I decided I never would again. Derek was my master, and everyone else was going to be in for a hard lesson if they thought they could control Ella Ashmore. I slowed my breathing, trying to control my pounding heart. I knew there was likely a safety on the rifle. My fingers searched for it until I located it, and then I peered intently, moving the gun into a shaft of moonlight to check. The safety was off. I wasn't going to fall into that trap. But the gun was terribly heavy as I hefted it in my arms. I tried to remember the few things Derek had taught me about shooting. I knew the stock had to be flush against my shoulder, or the recoil could injure me, perhaps causing a dislocation or fracture of my limb. I also knew the rifle had a variable setting, but in the dark, with gunfire erupting all around, I couldn't find how to change it. I figured the burst setting the coachman had set it on would be sufficient. At that point, I still hoped I wouldn't have to shoot anyone else, but if I needed to in order to save Derek's life or the lives of his friends, that's what I was going to do. I followed Derek's path around the barn moving in a similar low crouch. I sighed at the sight of my torn, filthy, and disheveled dress. I wouldn't be wearing it ever again. I came around the second corner and spotted Derek kneeling behind a barrel glazed with rainwater. Ella, he hissed as I crept up behind him. What are you doing here? And where did you get that? What's the situation? I asked him with a grim stare. Derek stared back for a long moment before his face split in a wide grin. All right, fair enough. He pointed across the dirt expanse separating the barn from the tree line. Joe and Will are pinned down behind that copse. Coachmen are moving in to flank them from both sides. Then, let's give them something else to worry about. I peered intently into the gloom and I spotted shadowy figures creeping slowly toward the trees that sheltered Will and Navajo Joe. I set the barrel of the rifle on top of the wooden barrel. Barrel on barrel action, I thought with a nigh hysterical giddiness, and then took aim and squeezed the trigger. My first few shots were well aimed, ripping into the woods and eliciting screams of surprise and pain. But as the gun continued to cough and spit, it grew harder to control. I fought in vain to keep it from moving up into the air, raking a line of fire up the rough-hewn bark of a forest titan. Let go! Derek shouted above the din of battle. Let go of the trigger. I released the trigger and regained control of my rifle. Shivering, yet blinking sweat out of my eyes and drenched in the salty stuff, I peered into the woods. The shapes were no longer visible. Did I get them? I asked. I don't know. 
At least one of them took a few rounds. Derek said. Want to trade? I sighed and handed him the rifle while he returned my pistol. Don't go thinking you're fucking Rambo, Derek. I'll be careful. He braced himself on the barrel, took aim, and fired. His burst lasted longer than mine, sending more accurate shots downrange, but eventually he succumbed to the heavy recoil, his barrel moving inexorably upward. Let go of the trigger, I shouted. Derek did so, and then turned a sympathetic, sheepish grin at me. It's a lot harder to think of that in the heat of the moment, he said with a chuckle. See? Did you get them? I don't know, Derek replied. He peered out into the darkened copse where Joe and Will allegedly still hid. Will, you still alive? How about you, Joe? Don't give away your position, kid. Joe said, coming out of the trees with a rifle balanced over his shoulder. Blood flowed from a wound on his forearm. Did you take a round, Joe? Derek asked. Yeah, but it went clean through. Just another scar for my collection. Will eased out of the trees, shoving the red-haired Heath in front of him. That's all of them, Will said. Except this chicken shit who surrendered. Be nice to Heath, I said. He's all right. He was one of your kidnappers, Derek countered. And he gave me water, talked to me, and helped put me at ease. Stop busting his balls. Derek shrugged inside. He can live as long as he cooperates. You going soft on me, boy? Joe asked. Come over here and find out. Derek snapped. What were you idiots thinking bringing Ella along? She could have been killed. She did pretty good from where I'm standing, Joe said. She's got a higher kill count than you. Will laughed, shrugging Derek's way in apology when the latter gave him a black look. He's not wrong, Derek. Just one question. Derek turned to Heath. Who hired you? Agatha Ellis Ashmore. Heath said quickly. Boss, that is. My former boss normally doesn't work on commission. But he made an exception to get back at the mains. You see how well that worked out for him. Will's tone was grim. I do, I do. I promise. I'm not going to mess with y'all ever again. Joe stared hard at Heath and then moved over to him. I cringed fearing the big Indian would throttle or kill my former benefactor. But all he did was grab his chin and turn his face from the left to the right. Who is your mama, boy? Joe snapped. Uh, what business is that of... Joe squeezed harder, smushing Heath's cheeks. That is, I'm only too happy to tell you, Heath said in a garbled voice. Melinda Powers. Joe let go of him and turned a baleful eye on Will and Derek. You might want to shoot this asshat right now, he said. Save us all a heap of trouble later. Why is that? Derek asked, cocking his head to the side. Leave him alone, damn it, I growled, but no one seemed to listen. Take a good look at his face, Joe said, roughly turning Heath about. See the bridge of his nose? The folds at his eyelids? Son of a bitch, Will sputtered. What's going on? I asked, suddenly confused. Years ago, Lucian had an affair, one of many, with a little redhead named Missy Powers. Don't you get it? This guy is Derek's brother. Chapter 27 Derek. What do you mean he's my brother? I blurted, looking from Heath to Joe. It's true, Derek, Will said. I remember my ma talking about Missy. She and Uncle Lucy were pretty tight for a while. So what if he is my brother? Derek said. Doesn't mean I owe him anything, and Dad neither. The legal system might have some say in that, 
Will countered. We own the legal system, I snapped. It's not as cut and dry as all of that. Yeah, the firm has a ton of influence, but if Redhead here passes a genetic test, he might be able to sue for financial compensation. I'm not like that, Heath objected. Look, man, I don't know if I'm your brother and I don't care. I just want to walk away from this alive. That's it. That's all. I never had a fortune and I don't need one. Maybe we should kill him. I glowered, but Ella stepped protectively in front of Heath with her arms outstretched. Don't touch him, she growled. If he is your brother, isn't that all the more reason to keep him alive? Blood is thicker than water, right? I sighed, deflating as my anger fled from my bones. I had no real grudge against Heath, and there had been enough bloodshed that night. Besides, it wasn't my call. We'll call my father. I finally agreed. See what he wants to do with Heath. Let's get back to the cottage first where we can use Wi-Fi, Will said. My phone is struggling to find a signal. That's what you get for using a Steve Jobs product, Joe cackled. My droid is working just fine. You're really snobby about your phone for an Indian, Joe, Will said ruefully. Quit stereotyping. Didn't that LCD television monitor work out a lot better for you than that outdated plasma screen? Well, yes, it did, but you don't have to be so smug about it. Ella and I shared a laugh as we walked hand in hand behind the tiny entourage. Now that there was no longer a threat from the coachman, I was more alert for another bear. I saw no sight of any, though I smelled their spore everywhere. Besides, the noise generated by Joe and Will's argument was more than sufficient to keep any of the hairy beasts at bay, surely. When we got back to the cottage, we ran into Jimmy the Bull and, surprisingly, Lucian. I stiffened, my mouth gone suddenly dry when I met his gaze. He had that effect on everyone, including me. Even Joe seemed to diminish a little in his presence. But you know who didn't? My little Ella. She met Lucien's gaze spark for spark and didn't waver an inch. They remained in a gaze-locked stare-down for several long moments before Lucien smiled softly and gave her a subtle nod. He likes her, I thought incredulously. He's never liked any of my girlfriends. Derek, Lucien said, giving me the once-over as he rose to his feet and buttoned his blazer closed. Will, Joe, and you must be Ella. Nice to meet you. I'm Derek's father, Lucian. I've heard a lot about you. She took his proffered hand and shook it. Nice to finally meet you. Sorry it took so long. I was pretty busy when you guys were in school. Lucian gripped her hand in both of his own. But belated is better than never. Welcome to the family. You popped your cherry, didn't you? I gaped in astonishment and glared at my father. Dad, I said. What the hell? Calm down, Derek. I didn't mean what you obviously think, Lucian said, turning back to Ella. What I meant was little Ella has taken a life and not long ago. Am I right or am I right? Ella nodded, her face growing grim. Don't worry, he said, patting her hand. It gets easier with time. If it's them or you, you might as well make it them. Am I right, or am I right? You're right, Joe pursed his lips. What do you want to do with this individual? Joe shoved Heath forward a few stumbling steps, and the red-haired man licked his lips nervously. Uh, hi, he said, waving. Who is this? Lucian peered intently with a narrow-eyed gaze into Heath's face. It's not like you to take prisoners, Navajo Joe. Are you getting soft in your old age? Ha, huh, you wish. Besides, I don't get old. I get younger. His mother is Melinda Powers, Uncle Lucy. Will interjected. Lucian's gaze widened, and then he moved in very close to Heath. 
Like Joe, but more gently, he turned his face from side to side. Son of a bitch, he said softly. Hey, nobody's confirmed nothing, all right? He shrank back as much as the looming Joe would let him. I don't want no trouble. I don't want nothing at all except to walk out of here in one piece. You should kill him now, Lucian, Joe said flatly. It will only cause you trouble if you don't. I loved your mother, kid, Lucian said. But Joe is right. If I don't take care of you now, it could bite me in the ass later. Stop, Ella said, stepping between Lucian and Heath. Don't kill him, please. He was one of the crew who snatched you right off the doorstep, doll, Lucian said with an arched eyebrow. Why are you so keen on showing him mercy? Because he showed me mercy and humanity, Ella said. Without him, I might not have survived the kidnapping. Well, him and Gus. Who's Gus? A rat, Derek said. Father, Heath seems like an all-right sort. Not only that, but he has extensive military training and experience. Be ashamed to kill him and not take advantage of that skill set. Yeah, Heath said eagerly. I can work for you, work off my debt to you for kidnapping the girl. I'll work really hard and won't cause no trouble, I swear. Have some dignity in the face of death, Joe glared. You might have just found out, but you're a main. Act like it. I don't want to show dignity in the face of death. I want to live, Heath responded. Fuck being dignified. I'll drop to my knees and suck your cock if it will let me walk out of here alive. Lucian doubled over laughing, and when he recovered, his gaze bore a tender affection in its depths. You sound so much like your mother. Ella and I exchanged looks. What must the mother have been like? All right, we'll bring you on board, kid, Lucian said. What's your name? He called himself Heath, but that's not his real name, Ella said. Close enough. We'll work out the paper trail later, but as far as I'm concerned, your name is Heath Main. You look like that Joker guy. You know, the scar-faced one, not the liberal commie who danced on the steps. We burst into laughter, even Heath, though he did it nervously. I cleared my throat, drawing my father's attention. There's just one last bit of unfinished business, I said. The person who hired the coachman still needs to be dealt with. Lucian's eyes narrowed, and he nodded slowly. Everybody to the car, he said. I'll deal with this matter. Personally. Derek, you take your lady upstairs and get her something to wear that isn't in rags. Maybe run a comb through your hair? I don't know, you look like shit. Ella and I shared a chuckle as we headed up the steps toward the bedroom. Your father is awful genial for one of the most feared men in the New York area, she said. He likes you, so he's showing you his best. Believe me, you don't want to piss him off and get on his bad side. Ella slipped into a pair of jeans and a shirt after we cleaned up a bit. We stopped to share a long, lingering kiss, me holding her about the waist, pressed against my body. Then we headed back downstairs and out into the pre-dawn darkness. The tiniest golden glow had begun at the horizon. As we drove into the city proper, night turned into day and the sun peeked its cheery face into view. We drove to Ella's house, or rather the one she had rented with her stepmother and sisters. Lucian straightened his tie and then we all followed him up the sidewalk and onto the porch. Lucian knocked on the door and the wizened face of a sneering woman appeared. Don't you know how early it is? She snapped. Get off my property, you... Her eyes widened when she realized just who she was addressing. The woman swallowed hard and took a reflexive step back. Her eyes darted to Ella and widened to the size of dinner plates. Hello, Agatha, Lucian said cheerfully. May we come in, please? She didn't respond, and Lucian pushed his way in, followed by the rest of us. 
Ella sort of hid behind me, and I stood protectively between her and the nasty stepmother, Agatha. She would never hurt my Ella again, and Lucian was about to see to it. Lucian sat down on the sofa and patted the cushion next to him. Have a seat, Agatha. I'd rather stand, she said. Will and Joe loomed over her, and she quickly seated herself. Lucian turned toward her, crossing his legs and smiling genially. Now I recognize that financial despair is a hell of a motivation and can lead to a lot of stupid decisions. But what exactly possessed you to screw with my family? Lucian's voice rose in volume and intensity. Agatha's mouth flew open, but only a tiny whimper escaped from it. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't even sweat you, Lucian said. I'd snap my fingers and you'd be dealt with. Understand? Agatha nodded, trembling like a leaf in the wind. But I'm taking this personally. Very personally. Now this can end one of two ways. Number one, you apologize to me and I find it to be sincere. You promise not to ever fuck with me or my family again. In scenario number one, you get to grow old and gray. Well, older and grayer. Lucian held up two fingers. Do we really need to talk about scenario number two? Agatha shook her head rapidly. Now apologize to me, to Ella, and to everyone whose night you ruined. And the next time you even breathe in our direction. Joe cracked his knuckles and smiled, blowing her a little kiss. Hi there, sweetie, he said with cold menace. You're just my type. I didn't think we would be having any further problems from Ella's wicked stepmother. Chapter 28 Ella After all the commotion and tumult of the wild night, it should perhaps have been no surprise that Derek and I chose to clean up the messy cottage ourselves, rather than calling on a cleaning service. Even Jimmy the Bull departed with Lucian. There was no longer any concern about Derek falling off the wagon and doing the swamp gas again. Once we'd cleaned up the entire mess, we collapsed into the bed and slept for about 14 hours, only waking up on a few occasions to use the restroom. Exhaustion could be put off for a while, but sooner or later, it came to collect its due. We enjoyed a long, hot soak in the jacuzzi, enjoyed a meal of leftover five-star cuisine, and talked until late in the evening when we again collapsed into bed. On the morning of the second day post-party, we finally felt more like ourselves again. I awakened first, rising from Derek's bed to pad naked into the bathroom. I turned about and peered at my glass slippers tattoo. I hardly felt it any longer, and I had to admit it was beautiful. You don't have to keep that, you know. I turned about to find Derek leaning on the doorframe, blinking eyes still blurry with recent slumber. A smile stretched my lips as I went to him and slipped my arms around his narrow waist. I think it's grown on me. Yes, but... Derek's voice trailed off. I got on my tiptoes to kiss him on his stubbled cheek. It's fine. I like the design. Then I pursed my lips and shook my head. I don't like your stubble, though. He chuckled and moved over to the sink to obligingly lather up his face. Derek glanced over his shoulder as I went to the adjacent sink to rinse with mouthwash. You don't see it as a sign of ownership? Oh, no. I absolutely do see it as a sign of ownership. I chuckled. But I don't mind being owned by Sir. He arched an eyebrow a lascivious grin crossing his features as he flicked foam off the end of his razor. Derek wiped his face clean and then moved toward me. So, you're content to be my Cinderella? He asked in a low, sexy growl. Yes, sir. 
I said, with breathless anticipation. He took hold of my hair at the back of my head, fingers tightening near the roots, and drew my head sharply back. I gasped as he manhandled me, and then moaned when his soft lips brushed my neck. Derek trailed kisses upward, stirring my heart to beat faster. His tongue darted out from those soft lips, caressing me and teasing me with its sly probes. Derek moved his lips right next to mine, close enough I could smell the mint toothpaste on his breath. I ached to taste his lips and moved to do so. I barely brushed his mouth with mine when Derek jerked my head away. Did I say you were allowed to touch me? He teased. I laughed, despite the tears in my eyes caused by the hair pulling. No, sir, I said all innocently in a little girl voice. I just couldn't resist. You know your Cinderella is so hot for her, sir. Yes, but you'll still have to be punished, Derek said. He turned me about and force walked me out of the bedroom, hands still gnarled in my tresses. I was already wide open and dripping wet before we made it down the first flight of steps. We passed in front of a mirror on the way through the living space, and I caught a glimpse of us reflected in its surface. I hadn't realized I was smiling so much. Derek pushed me through the threshold of the playroom, and my heart rate kicked up a notch. So many toys, so many possibilities. What would he choose to do with his Cinderella next? He released my hair and then put his mouth next to my ear. I shivered as he ran his tongue up behind it and then bit the lobe firmly before whispering, Knees. I settled down onto my knees, kicking first one leg back and then the other. Then I leaned back on my haunches, spread my thighs wide, and placed my hands, palms up, on top of my legs. My gaze followed Derek as he paced back and forth in front of me, scrutinizing every aspect of my position. A tiny gasp escaped my lips when Derek turned to the wall and selected a leather-tipped wooden riding crop. He slapped it across his palm a few times as he came back to loom over me. Derek extended the crop down and tapped the inside of my thigh. I moved it out an inch farther, feeling the strain in my muscles and tendons, but it was nothing I couldn't handle. Nothing that would keep me from pleasing, sir. Next, he tapped the crop under my chin, prompting me to lift my head a little higher. He walked around behind me, stopping for a long moment. I panted, wondering what he was doing back there. Apparently satisfied, he walked back to stand before me. Derek extended the riding crop down to my bare breast, caressing it with the leather tip. I shivered as the goosebumps rose on my skin. Inexorably, it made its way over to my areola. Derek traced circles around my sensitive, bumped pink flesh, circling my nipple as a shark circled prey right before the catch. My mouth flew open in a sudden moan as he caressed my nipple at last. The nub swelled under his attentions, growing hard and erect. Derek continued pumping the nipple with well-timed, sensual strokes before moving the crop over to my opposite breast. You know you're going to have to pay for touching sir without permission, yes? He asked in a low growl. Yes, sir. I said, a smile spreading on my lips. Are you ready to receive your discipline? Yes, sir, I said. Your Cinderella has been a bad, bad girl, and she's ready for Sir to teach her how to be a good, obedient, sweet little slave. I batted my eyes at him, Derek's brow now shone with sweat, which he wiped away with the back of his forearm before licking his lips and devouring me with his eyes. Good. Put your hands behind your head. Yes, sir, I said, doing as I was told. He tapped my nipple with the crop, and I knew where the discipline would be administered. 
I braced myself for the impact. He lifted the crop away and then brought it down with a sharp slap. I cried out, more from the startling impact than actual pain. A swift heat spread through my nipple and areola, bleeding through the borders to my breast. He lifted the crop and snapped it down again. This time, I winced, gritting my teeth and letting a long, hot hiss out. Open your eyes, Cinderella, Derek said. My eyes fluttered open, fixed on his adoring gaze. Look at your nipple. He tapped the one in question, as yet unmolested by the taste of the crop. This is where the next one is coming. It's going to be harder than the rest. If you want mercy, you know what to say. Yes, sir, I said, biting my lower lip. If I want it, I know what to say. He arched an eyebrow and then lashed out with the crop. I gasped as my nipple blazed like fire and then let out a long, undulating laugh. Whew, sir wasn't kidding. Can you take more? He asked. A harder slap. Mm, I said, considering it. Yes, sir. Cinderella can take more for sir. Derek snapped the crop onto my breast, harder than ever. I gritted my teeth and bounced up and down on my knees, just barely able to maintain position. I think that's as hard as I can take, sir, I said. Good, Derek said. Now that we're done with the calibration of how hard you can be hit, we can move on with the actual punishment. Ten strokes to your nipples. Every one as hard as the last one. I winced and looked up at him with puppy dog eyes. That was really hard, sir, I said. Yes, it was. Do you want mercy? Have I asked for it? I countered with a saucy lilt in my voice. Derek stood back and slapped the crop into his palm. I've left you ungagged for a reason. Let me hear you sing, Cinderella. He snapped the crop down hard and I cried out. He did so again and tears sprang to my eyes. I took four more brutal swats before I could not take it any longer. Glass slipper. I said, panting hard. Derek crouched down next to me and stroked his fingers through my hair. He inspected my reddened flesh and tisked sympathetically. Sorry, sir, I said. No, never apologize for communicating your limits to me, Derek said. Besides, I'm thinking a girl as dirty and slutty as Cinderella needs a special kind of training. You've paid your penitence. Thank you, sir, I said. Derek went to the wall and came back with blue silk rope. He motioned for me to stand. Up, he said. I rose to my feet and then allowed him to bind my wrists to my thighs, putting my arms at my sides. Essentially, I was now cupping my own buttocks and it occurred to me that I would be able to grab and spread them on his command. Derek added a line of rope around my midsection, and then another above my breasts, mirroring what he had done the last time, but with a few variations. When he finished winding the rope around my breasts, they had begun to swell and darken into new levels of sensitivity. You're turning me all different colors today, sir. I said with a giddy laugh. Derek grinned and then took my hair again. I groaned, my pussy throbbing like a bass drum as he dragged me over to the padded table. He pushed me down belly first onto it, my bound breasts depressed under my weight, increasing their torment. Spread your legs, Derek said. I did so as best I could, but he wasn't satisfied using the crop to slap my inner thighs until they were much wider. Derek squirted something slippery between my cheeks and slathered it through my crack. Oh, sir is such a dirty boy, I said in a growl as I felt the head of his swollen cock pressing up against my well-lubed, 
dark star. Dirty is as dirty does, he said. That doesn't make any sense, I said as he worked the crown through my ring of muscle, and I gasped as it began stretching me wider. It doesn't have to, he said. His voice strained as he slowly worked his cock into my ass. I'm Sir. He made it past the secondary ring and slithered inside. I groaned, twisting in my bonds on the leather-topped table. He felt so good inside of me, better than the hook had. Derek's hand slapped on either side of my hips, and he drove himself in balls deep. They slapped against my swollen, wide-open labia, stirring the nerves into greater arousal. I was dripping wet, staining the floor with my lustful juices. Derek glided in and out, creating a cacophony of contractions spreading out through my body. I barely remembered to ask for permission halfway through my climax. Derek was rather distracted himself, so I don't think he noticed. Please, sir, can I come? Yes. He moaned between pants, the constant slap of his body into mine creating a tattoo akin to a percussion instrument. I came hard, multiple times as he spent himself violating my back door. Derek pulled himself out, leaving a sticky strand of seed connecting his member to my gaping hole. He stumbled back, panting and heaving, like he'd just run a marathon. Does Sir need a nap? I asked, wriggling my bottom around enticingly. Maybe Sir could plug his Cinderella up with a vibe while he sleeps. Sir is going to wash off this big, nasty cock, he growled. And then he's going to murder Cinderella's pussy with it. I came again, screaming and spurting out onto the floor. Yes. It was very, very pleasing to be owned by Sir. Chapter 29 Derek I tossed the antiseptic wipe into the wire waste basket and then used another to clean Ella's bottom, eliciting a chuckle from her lips. What's so amusing? I asked with a grin. I slapped her firmly across her bare ass. Huh? Answer me. You take such good care of your girl, sir, she said. Cleaning her up when she's all tied up and can't do it herself? I'm also the one who violated you in the first place, I said, squeezing and kneading her sweet, rounded bottom. She wriggled about, fingers gathering up her pliant flesh and spreading her cheeks wide for me. So, are you going to do it again, or what? She teased. Eventually. But I'm going to teach you a little bit about how thoroughly I own you. Oh, she said with a little shiver, which was quite pleasing to watch. Don't keep me in suspense, unless you're planning on using the pulleys again. Maybe later, I said, grabbing the rope harness between her shoulder blades and using it as a handle to lift her to a standing position. She had trouble keeping her feet, her legs wobbly from her recent climaxes. Having problems? I asked. Go ahead, be cocky, she said. You earned it, sir. I admit to being a bit trepidatious about having you stuff your cock in my ass, but now I'm an anal convert. I gaped in astonishment and she threw her head back and laughed. I got that feeling again, where even though I was the dom and she was the sub, somehow she was actually the one in control, and I was at her mercy rather than the other way around. You bought me, sir, she said. If you didn't bother to check how much of a dirty girl you were purchasing, that's your fault. I'm here now, and you have to deal with me. I laughed, caressing her cheek and kissing her softly on the lips. You're a wonder, I said. 
You know, it's not fair to tease me when I'm tied up and can't touch myself, she said, straining to get a finger on or in her pussy to no avail. I think you're talking too much, Cinderella, I said. She giggled and arched an eyebrow impishly. Oh, is that so? Well, what do you intend to do about it? I turned about, selected a red ball gag, and turned back around. She noisily blew a raspberry as I held it up to her lips. Oh, Pooh, I thought you were going to shove your cock in my mouth, she said with a pout. All in good time, I said. Open. She dutifully opened her mouth, accepting the soft rubber ball. I adjusted the straps and then buckled the one under her chin. Ella groaned as the ball sank deep between her teeth. I checked the fit to make sure it wasn't pinching anywhere and then patted her cheek gently. Now, what was that you were saying? Ella proceeded to try and give me a lecture of some kind, struggling with the device in her mouth, but all that came out was unintelligible nonsense and drool, lots of drool. I put a finger in the stringy secretion and then brought it over to stroke her engorged, purpled breast. Oh, are these nice and sensitive now? I asked sweetly, tracing lines around her areola. Ella's eyes fluttered closed, and she nodded enthusiastically. I started groping and caressing her swollen mounds, enjoying the little coos and gasps that escaped from behind her gagged mouth. I firmly clenched one in my grip, and then moved my other hand down between her legs. Ellen nodded and made noises I translated to, uh-huh, as I stroked her swollen, dripping wet labia. I wormed my fingers inside her pink walls, enjoying both her gurgling groans and the sound of my fingers squishing deeper inside. I pushed her back onto the padded table, my fingers still buried in her sweet cunny. She wriggled up farther, knowing what I had in mind. She remained clever and determined in spite of her many handicaps. You think you're about to get my hard cock in your pussy? I asked. Ella nodded, her eyes shining and eager. Not quite yet. She groaned in alarm and then laughed as I secured her ankles to the table, spreading them wide in stirrups. Then I held up the one implement a slave girl dreads more than any other, a solitary feather. Ella's eyes went wide and she shook her head no, though she did not use her safe word, which I could detect even through a gagged mouth, as it moved inexorably closer to her wide open pussy. You know where this is going, don't you? I teased. I ran the feather around the circumference of her clitoral hood, enjoying the way her little lady quivered and swelled. I ran two fingers, my index and middle, on opposite sides of her clitoral hood, and then squeezed them together. Ella let out a long, undulating moan, writhing about in her bonds on the leather tabletop. It's a good thing I tied you down so well or you might fall off, I said, moving the feather over her trapped and bubbled clitoris. Tell me how this feels. I stroked the feather tip up and down her clit in slow, sensual movements. Ella sucked in a great breath of air and then let it out in a nice, silent, squeaking gasp. Her chest heaved again, filling with air, but the second time she let out a piercing, slobber-laden scream of pure torment. It tickles, but it feels good. I said, moving it around in circles. She shivered, strained, and made gagged protests with no sign of her safe word, but could not escape the feather. Do you want me to stop tickling your clitty? I asked nicely. Uh-huh. Ella nodded, her eyes squeezed tightly shut, a glaze of sweat glistening on her soft skin. Okay, I said, moving it immediately from her clitoris to her nipple. Ella's sigh of relief became a squeal of protest. She laughed behind her gag as I tormented her nipples with the feather, alternating them so her nerves wouldn't grow numb. 
I still had her clitoris trapped in my fingers, so I stroked them up and down, kneading and massaging. Ella begged for permission to come from behind the gag, and I decided to show her mercy. For now. Come, Cinderella, I said. She cried out, writhing on the tabletop, hands and ankles jerking at their restraints. I kept the feather moving, returning it to her clit just as the orgasm subsided. Now super sensitive, she cried out in misery as I stroked and teased her trapped little pink lady. Do you want me to fuck you instead of tickling you with the feather, Cinderella? I asked sternly. She nodded her head, writhing about in futile struggles to escape the feather. Then beg me, I said. Ella struggled to form coherent speech around the ball gag, managing to burble out a garbled variant of please fuck me, sir that I only made her repeat a few times before I capitulated to the request. Very well, I said, tossing the feather onto her belly and shoving my cock immediately into the quivering pink walls of her love tunnel. Ella moaned, gyrating her body in tune with my own and trying to grind herself down all the more tightly on my rod. I slapped my hands firmly onto her swollen purple breasts digging my nails into their overfull water balloon surfaces. Ella gurgled, her eyes rolling back in her head as all the myriad competing and conflicting sensations became one ecstatic throb of pleasure. She belonged to me now. She'd given herself body and soul to me. I used that control, that submission, to take her to heights of ecstasy she could never hope to achieve on her own. In turn, her pleasure became my pleasure, and when she screamed out for permission to come, I only was able to grant it in halting, stilted speech because I was on the verge of exploding. Come, Cinder, Ella, I gasped. Ella thrashed around as I leaned into the thrusts harder than ever, sweat flinging from my body with each rhythmic slap. Ella let out a series of guttural groans, still climaxing with a cluster of powerful orgasms that had her clamping down on my rod tight as a vice. I spent my seed inside of her, slowing the thrusts until I sort of collapsed on top of her. I laid my head on her purpled breasts, using them as pillows, and caressed her gagged face. Ella tried to put her mouth on my fingers, making little cooing noises from behind the ball in her mouth. Once I'd recovered somewhat, I untied her, releasing her from the bondage bit by bit. We cuddled on the love seat together, our usual post-coital meeting place. She leaned her body against my own, head on my shoulder. I stroked my fingers through her silken blonde hair, staring down at her with adoration. Sir can do that to his Cinderella any time he wants, she said with a tired but happy sigh. We have the rest of our lives to explore your limits, I said. And mine. She snuggled up against me and sighed. I love you, Ella, I said. I love you too, Derek. She patted my chest. Hey, I said suddenly. I know we metaphorically burned the contract and all. We don't need the contract any longer, she said. It was an artificial construct, and while it provided a lot of fun, we've moved past the need for it. Besides, would you really want to not touch me from midnight until sunrise every night? Hell no, I said. But that wasn't what I was getting at. I have no regrets for burning that contract. I was wondering about a different kind of contract. A vow, really. I slipped down to my knee and reached under the love seat to extract a little jewelry box, which I'd purchased years before, right when the homecoming dance was about to happen. Right when she broke up with me. Oh, God, Ella said, her hand flying in front of her mouth as I opened the box and showed her the ring within. I hoped it wasn't too out of style. Ella Ashmore, I said. You're already my Cinderella. 
But would you do me the honor of being my wife as well? She smiled, tears welling in the corners of her eyes, and nodded. Yes, Derek, she said, holding out her hand. I slipped the ring onto it, feeling ecstatic. I'd given up on this dream for so long, but now it was finally coming true. All the money, all the power meant nothing. Nothing. My life is meaningless without you, I said, kissing her hand softly. You make me happy. I hope we can spend the rest of our lives together. Me too, Derek, she said, kissing me softly. But I do hope my position as wife doesn't negate my status as your Cinderella. Of course it doesn't, I said. I'll be your husband, but I'll also be your sir. I wouldn't have it any other way, Ella said. We embraced tightly, and I kissed her warmly and tenderly. My only problem now was, what would my new identity be now that I was no longer the whiny goth son? I decided it didn't matter. Only one person's opinion mattered to me, and she had agreed to be my wife. I had found my Cinderella, gave her a glass slipper, and lost her at the stroke of midnight. But then I got her back, and we lived happily ever after.